Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Good evening, this is Bill Foreman, speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of their own store name. They've done that because they recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. The new Andelafield reducing plan is a good example. This plan is one of our druggists' most popular sales items. It helps you lose quickly, easily, up to five pounds a week and where it shows. No wonder our customers like it. It's the work of famous health and beauty expert, Anne Delafield, who has successfully reduced more overweight people than any other expert alive. That's why you can be sure of a safe, sound, scientific plan with no drugs, no calorie counting. You get vitamins, special appetite-reducing wafers, and a big beauty book to guide you. See how easy it is to be slim. Ask about the Anne Delafield reducing plan at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Richard Diamond, the smiling gumshoe. Well, if it ain't Sergeant Otis, the laughing hyena. The lieutenant in? Yeah, go on in and spoil his afternoon. You know, Otis, I think you've got the kindest, most wonderful face in the whole wide world. You do? Absolutely. But I do wish you'd do me a favor. Well, sure, anything. Stop wearing it upside down. Hello, Walt. Hello, Rick. Sit down. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, what's doing? Want a sandwich? Mm, I'll take some of that coffee. Sure. Something on your mind, Rick? No, just got tired of sitting around the office. No business? Not in a week. Hmm. <laughs> got any sugar? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Here. Yeah, Otis? Uh, Lieutenant, I got some guy on the phone who won't give me his name. Says he wants to talk to you. Matter of life and death. Okay, put him on. Right. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. I'm going to say this once, so listen carefully. Tonight, somewhere in New York City, I'm going to kill a man, and there's nothing you can do about it. What? Promptly at 8 o'clock, somewhere in this city, I'm going to kill a man. Hello? Hello? Something wrong? Some guy says he's going to kill somebody at 8 o'clock tonight. Oh, dandy. Crank. Did he say who his victim is going to be? No, just a crank. I should have humored him. Made suggestions. My landlord, for instance. Be a little gruesome if he really did it. Yeah. You'd have a hard time protecting eight million people from a killer you don't know anything about. Hope it was just a crank. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. If that guy calls back, put him through and trace the call. Right. It sure would be miserable if that call was on the level. Oh, relax. I'll have some more coffee. I had some more coffee. Walt worried a little, not a lot, because a big precinct caters to a good number of cranks every day. We talked about old times, and around six, I matched Walt for dinner. He stuffed himself at the automat until I ran out of change and begged for mercy. Then he dropped me off at my flat on 53rd and went back to the precinct. I showered, shaved, slipped into my blue suit, and headed for the door. Yeah. Do me a favor, will you, Rick? You gotta stop stuffing yourself, Walt. You sound like you got indigestion. I'm down at the morgue. Meet me here, please. Oh, now look, I got a date with a live one. I'm in on the start of some trouble. It's liable to grow. That guy who called made good. He stabbed a man to death on Broadway at eight o'clock. Yes, Lieutenant. 
Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Thanks for coming down. Okay, Hal. Who is he? Or, uh, who was he? Brother identified him. Abraham Weiss. Stabbed in the heart from behind with a long, thin instrument. On Broadway at 8 o'clock. That's right. Mm. A dozen people saw him stagger to the curb and fall. Most of them just thought he was drunk. You think your boy on the phone did it? 8 o'clock, right on the nose. Whoever did it must have walked up behind him, jabbed him just below the left shoulder blade, and kept on walking. What do you want me for, Walt? If this guy on the phone did kill Abraham Weiss and we can't find a motive, that's a little more than a simple killing. We may be mixed up with a madman. Oh, so I qualify in that league. You're one of the few guys who really is interested in criminal psychology. Well, I think it's the answer. You can't stop something unless you know the cause. Will you give me a hand, Rick? Sure, sure. I've got Weiss's family at the station. Let's go see them. Why? Why, Lieutenant? Why did this happen to Abe? That's what we're going to try and find out, Mrs. Weiss. We were hoping you might help us. Oh, he, didn't, he didn't have any enemies. He was a good man. We have three children. I left them with Mrs. Bellotti, my neighbor. It's going to be hard on them. You're sure your husband didn't know it? No. He didn't have any enemies. He was a good husband and a good father. Everybody liked him. What? Only last week, Mrs. Dowd up the street from us. Oh, We'd like a list of your brother's friends, Mr. Weiss. Where he worked, people he had business with, anyone you can remember who might give us a lead. Been sitting out there thinking about that. There just isn't anyone that I know would want to kill Abe. He was a good guy, did his job, took care of Louise and the kids. He didn't bother nobody. How long were Louise and Abe married? For, uh, no, six years, maybe a little more. Nice girl, Louise. Oh, the best. Good wife. What happens to her now? I'll take care of him. You're not married, huh? No. Quite a job taking care of a widow and three kids. I'm doing all right. It's the least I can do. You got a girl? Yeah, why? Maybe going to get married, huh? Well, I'm engaged. I've been thinking about it. It'll have to wait for a while, I guess. Until Louise gets back on her feet. Okay. Tell us about some of your brother's friends. Well, I guess his best friend was Art Brearley. They were awful close to the He told us about everyone he could think of. Gave us a dozen names and addresses we could check. Like Louise, Martin couldn't figure why anyone would want to kill Abraham Weiss. The next was Mrs. Rebecca Weiss, tired, the hurt in her eyes, enough for all the mothers who had raised a son and lost him. We'll try not to keep you too long, Mrs. Weiss. It's all right, Lieutenant. You want to help. Would you like a glass of water? No, no. When will I be able to see my son? It's right that I should see my son. A few questions first, if you don't mind. I know you're trying to help. Just me a few questions. I mean, as you like, Lieutenant. Not long with Mrs. Rebecca Weiss. Nothing that would help to catch her son's killer. So we checked the people who had known Abraham, and there were plenty. His boss gave us a few more names to add to the long list. All of them friends who couldn't imagine why anyone would want to kill a nice guy like Abe. At 7.30 the next morning, Walt looked at reports and poured more coffee. Here. I'll put sugar in it. Ah, thanks. If that phone call was on the level, why would a guy kill like that? Call us and tell us he was going to do it. What would be his reason? Uh, Well, couldn't guess. But if that guy who called did do the killing, you can bet he'll phone again. Why? Well, he bragged he was going to do it. He'll want the credit. Well, I got to get some rest. A couple hours anyway. Let's both get a couple. Yeah. Sorry. Ah, it doesn't matter. Lousy dream. What time is it? Five o'clock. Oh, I died, didn't I? Our boy called again. Oh? You trace it? Phone booth in Grand Central. What do you have to say? Not much. Wanted to know how he liked his handiwork. What's a good answer to that one? 
Well, I said a few things, but I guess he figured we weren't satisfied, so he promised he'd kill somebody else tonight. Hello, Rick. Seen the papers? No. Here. Hmm. Fiend terrorizes city, unknown killer murders at will, police baffled. Everybody's on my back. Exactly. What did he say? You want to hear? I made a recording. Let's hear it. Okay, Otis, put him on. Hello, Lieutenant. Yeah? What do you think now, Lieutenant? I did what I said I was going to do, didn't I? Look, who is this? The man who called yesterday and said he was going to kill someone at 8 o'clock last night. I don't believe it. Well, certainly you do. You'd like to stall so you could have this call traced. Well, you'd better listen. I want everybody to know just how stupid the police force really is. I'm going to kill again tonight, and there's nothing you can do about it. Look, you, whoever you are, if it's the last thing I ever do, I'll... Tonight at 8, another innocent victim will die because the police can do nothing about it. Hello. Hello. Otis. The call came from a phone booth in Grand. He said another innocent victim. Yeah, so he's a nut. For some reason, he hates the police force. There's your motive. Well, I guess it's possible, but something sticks in my craw. Yeah? What? Eight o'clock. Why pick eight o'clock both times? Well, I guess like you said, he wants the credit. We're liable to get a couple of killings in an evening. He wants us to be sure which one he did. Okay, so he makes it 8 o'clock the first time. Why the second? Why not 6 or 7 or 10 or... Just following a pattern, I guess. Uh, maybe so. Well, what do we do? I got every man possible on the streets. But, Rick, let's face it, this is a pretty big city. And at 6, 2, and even, if he does kill again, it won't be anywhere near the scene of his first stabbing. I guess we just wait. Yeah, a little over an hour to go. So we waited. Walt got the coffee going, and I went through a whole package of cigarettes. Somewhere in the middle of New York, probably on a crowded street, a man was walking, waiting like we were for 8 o'clock, waiting to stab someone through the heart, waiting for 8 o'clock. Walt Coffee? No. Give me a cigarette. You don't smoke. Want a bet? Ah, uh, here. Got a match? Got a lighter. Ah, uh, this is no good. Yeah? Let's go. Where to? Entrance to Madison Square Garden. Man stabbed to death in the crowd going into the fights. Right at 8 o'clock. <laughs> Now you can get five times the established daily requirement of all vitamins with known minimums in one formula. It's Rexall 5X Multivitamin, a marvelous new product direct from the world-famous Rexall Laboratories. In this new carefully balanced formula, Rexall scientists have provided a tablet that is five times stronger than the minimum daily requirement of all vitamins with established minimums, plus red crystalline B12. Rexall family druggists are so anxious for you to reap the benefits of this amazing new vitamin formula that they invite you to try it for 10 days at their cost. They offer you a 10-day trial size, a regular dollar and 79 cent value in itself, free of extra cost with a purchase of the regular bottle of 50, both for only $6.95. If, after 10 days, you do not notice a marked difference in your general health and well-being, Return the unopened bottle of 50 tablets and your full purchase price will be refunded. Take advantage of this special introductory offer on Rexall 5X Multivitamins. The tablets that give you five times the established daily requirement of all vitamins with known minimums, plus red crystalline B12. Ask for 5X Multivitamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. (laughs) 
A man murdered going into Madison Square Garden to see the fight. Stabbed through the heart while he stood in the middle of the large crowd. We went through the same routine. Identify the body. Question witnesses who had been close to him. See his friend. Anyone who knew him. Name's Leon Ellis. Small-time fight manager. No family. Handles a young kid named Billy Martin. Wasn't fighting last night. At 10 o'clock the next morning, we found Billy Martin working at the East Side Gym. We talked to him for a while, but he couldn't help much. So we kept going, making our list of names, talking to everyone, all morning and into the afternoon. By 4.30, we were holding each other up. Look, we're working with a madman who kills anybody close to him so he can show how helpless we are to stop him. The whole city's in a panic. The newspapers are blasting everybody in the department, yours truly in particular. Yeah? I got him on the line again. He even bragged to me about this last killing. Trace it as fast as you can. Right. Start that recorder, Rick. It's our boy again. Okay. Go ahead. Fifth Precinct, Lieutenant Levinson. You can skip the formalities, Lieutenant. Your sergeant told you who was on the line. Well, I did it again last night, didn't I, Lieutenant? Okay, so we can't stop you. I admit it. I'll admit it to the papers. That should make you happy. The police department can't do anything about it. That's what you want, isn't it? Again tonight, Lieutenant. One more person will die. Now, wait a minute. At least give me a chance to talk to you. While you trace the call? No. Tonight at 8 o'clock, and you can't stop me. Hello? Yeah? Call came from a phone booth in Rockefeller Center. Fix the right place to call from. We look pretty silly rounding up everybody in Rockefeller Center. Walt looked sick, and I felt it. What could we do? We knew nothing about our killer or where he'd strike next. Walt called in the reporters and gave them the story. The papers would blast the department, but it was the best way to warn the public to stay off the streets. The department was alerted, radio stations were given bulletins to broadcast, and Walt and I climbed into a prowl car and started cruising. At 8.5, it came in. Attention, all units in the vicinity of Zone 12, a 211 in front of 415 West 64th, 415 William 64, ambulance, dead body, car 73, come in please. 73, go ahead. 211 at 415 West 64 is a stabbing, Lieutenant. Roger. That's it, Rick. The victim was an elderly man dressed expensively and lying face down on the sidewalk. Again, no witnesses to the killing. Most of the people who had seen the man fall realized almost immediately what had happened because of the publicity on the last two killings. But like one man said... Well, how are you going to see who killed him in a crowd like this? Maybe a hundred people on the block when it happens. Boy, you guys better start doing something. Yes, sir? Does Mr. Arthur Reeves live here? Yes, sir, but Mr. Reeves is not in at the moment. I'm from the police, Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Homicide? I'd like to talk with everybody in the house. Certainly, sir. Has something happened to Mr. Reeves? He's been murdered. Oh, no. No, not Mr. Reeves. How many people in the house? Myself, the maid, and Mr. George Reeves, Mr. Reeves' nephew. Tell him I'd like to talk with him. And we talked with the three people in the dead man's house. The maid, the butler, and George Reeves, the nephew. I warned him not to take his walk tonight. I showed him the papers. Did he usually take walks at night? Has for the past 15 years. Know why anyone would want to kill him? Mr. Reeves? Of course not. You know very good and well it was that fiend what did it. How about you? Can you think of why anyone would want to kill your employer? No, sir. I've been with Mr. Reeves for over 20 years. I'm acquainted with most of his friends and associates. Look here. I can assure you that my uncle knew no one who would want to kill him. You're his nephew? That's right. Your uncle took walks every night? Yes, every night. Well, if you don't mind, we'd like you all to come down at the station to make statements. Okay, we got the statements, another list of names, and a long one. None of these killings tie together. Nobody on the first list has any connection with anybody on the second list. Let's face it, if that madman calls again, we can't stop him. Oh, take it easy, Well, will you? can we? I want to talk to the maid, the butler, and the nephew again. Why? It's just the same as all the others. I want to talk to them, okay? I'm sorry. Getting jumpy. No, you're tired. 
So am I. Otis, send in the maid. What are you doing? Fixing the recorder. I may want to listen to it again. So we again talked to the maid, then the butler, then the nephew. And the tape recorder picked up everything they said, and it sounded very much like everything everybody else had said after the first two killings. Walt let them go home and went up to talk to the commissioner. When he came back, he looked pretty discouraged. I'm sure on the griddle. Salvador to turn in my badge. I want you to listen to something. Oh, sure. I've cut out sections of tape, stuck them together. Mr. Reeves took walks every night after dinner, and dinner was always at seven? That's right. Then he always left sometimes close to eight? Yes, 7.30 or a quarter to eight. He was never gone more than half an hour? No. What time did he leave tonight? About a quarter to eight. Weren't you worried when he didn't come back within half an hour? Well, certainly. Both the maid and I were very anxious. Were you all in the house between a quarter of eight and the time we arrived? Yes, sir. Where was Mr. Reeves' nephew? In his room. He went up right after dinner. How wealthy was your employer? He was very wealthy. Mr. Reeves, who inherits your uncle's fortune? Why, I do. Was Mr. Reeves ever longer than half an hour with his walks? Never more than a few minutes, one way or the other. Who handles your uncle's affairs, Mr. Reeves? Well, Richard B. Gregg. He's been my uncle's attorney for many years. Young Mr. Reeves has always been excitable. Gotten a lot of trouble in the past. Yes, he argued with his uncle many times. No, Mr. Reeves didn't come down and ask why his uncle had been gone so long. Certainly I worried about my uncle. But I thought he might have stopped along the way for something or other. Okay, so you took out pieces of the testimony and stuck them together. So what? Just this. Every one of these killings have taken place at 8 o'clock. I know, and it's worried you. Now, this is the first time that one of our victims was certain to be out on the streets at 8 o'clock. Coincidence. Ah, uh, maybe, maybe. Mr. Reeves was a wealthy man, very wealthy. And the nephew gets his money, and the nephew was in his room at the time of the killing. Who saw him? The butler and the maid both say he was up there. So he climbs out a window. His uncle was killed only two blocks from the house. Plenty of time to stab him, get back through the window. You're really reaching out, aren't you? Uh, sure I am. What do you want me to do? Well, the nephew's voice certainly doesn't match the ones we got on the threatening phone calls. So he disguises it. I got an idea. What? Let's put a tail on all three of these people anyway. It's not much. It's all we've got so far. I'm going out to check on something. What? Here's something that'll make your hair curl. I just saw the attorney for the Reeves estate, and he said the old man was planning on changing his will, leaving all his money to charity, not his nephew. He was supposed to meet with Mr. Reeves this morning. And Reeves gets killed last night. Pretty convenient for the nephew. We can't arrest him on that. No, but it makes a good motive. You think the nephew would kill two men and then his uncle, just so it would look like a madman had picked out another innocent victim? You've got to admit it'd be pretty clever. There's an understatement. Yeah. He's on the line again, Lieutenant. I'm tracing it. Oh, no. Our boy again. There goes your theory. Hello. You can't do anything, Lieutenant. I've killed three men, and you can't stop me. I'm going to kill again tonight at eight. Hello. It was him, all right. Tonight at eight. Rick, we've just got to do... Yeah? Call came from Grand Central again. Okay. Well, what happens to your theory now? Well, he might do it again. Expect you to react just this way. Uh, who's tailing George Reeves? Harrison. When does he report in again? Checks in on the hour. Last time was about 20 minutes ago. 40 minutes to go, huh? No way of contacting him? No. Nope. Okay, we wait. Yeah? Yeah? Where was he at 446? Don't let him out of your sight. Well? At 446, George Reeves made a phone call from a booth in Grand Central Station. He's home now. Well, we had something. A motive and a man calling from Grand Central, but not enough to make an arrest. We waited until 7 and then headed for the Reeves' house. The area is surrounded. 
He'll have two men on him no matter where he goes. He's still in the house? According to Harrison. No, I want to do more than pick him up with a knife. Here he comes. Yeah, climbing into his car. Attention, cars 314-15. Suspect heading east. Proceed east on your streets. We tailed him, keeping in contact with the other cars as they stayed parallel. When Reeves turned off, we went on ahead, notified the car in our right or left to pick him up. That way, Reeves wouldn't suspect a tail. About 7.30, we got a call that Reeves had parked. We headed for the spot in a hurry. Suspect is heading north on Coulter. Well, get ahead of him. Park at the corner of Davis. We'll pick him up there. We stopped at the corner and got out of the car. We waited until we spotted Reeves walking in our direction and then let him pass and followed, staying close. We kept after him until five minutes to eight. He swung out on Broadway and was pushing his way through the crowd. Then it happened. Where'd he go? We've lost him. Come on. Three minutes to eight. Let us through, please. Well, I never... Get out of the way. Who you push? Look out, please. You see him turn off? No, he's got to be... Walt, Walt, crossing the street. Let's go. Reeves. What? No! Look out for the knife. No, no, let, let me go, go. Let me go. Drop it. You okay? Yeah. Here's the knife. Young man. Young man, what right have you got to hit that nice gentleman? He was helping me across the street. I have a good mind to report... Lady, you. lady. If this man was helping you across the street, just forget about him. Go bet on a horse or something. This is your lucky night. Right when you need it most, Rexall scientists have developed a wonderful new product. Rexall Sunburn Cream. Available now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Rexall Sunburn Cream is a new film-forming compound that relieves sunburn misery almost immediately, gives more uniform coverage, and stays on longer than ordinary sunburn remedies. The protective agents in Rexall Sunburn Cream relieve the soreness and annoying itching of a fresh sunburn, soothe and cool the fire, help you sleep easier after overexposure. During these summer months, keep Rexall Sunburn Cream in the family medicine chest. It's available now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. The stores with the orange and blue sign. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell directed the RKO production Split Second, which is now in release, and his latest film appearance was in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer award-winning The Bad and the Beautiful. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this time when Rexall Drug Products again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Attention people on sugar-restricted diets. At last you can get a non-fattening sweetener in granulated form. It's Rexall Sweetenet Sprinkle, the easy-to-use sugar substitute in a shaker. Just sprinkle it on food for all the taste none of the calories. And there's no bitter aftertaste. Remember the name, Rexall Sweetenette Sprinkle, at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Listen while the makers of Rexall Drug Products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. (laughs) 
Good evening. This is Bill Foreman speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of their own store names. They've done that because they recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. This month, Rexall family druggists are introducing 10 great new products direct from the famous Rexall laboratories. One of them is Rexall Multivitamin Formula V10. Here's a really pleasant tasting, really easy to take liquid that supplies twice the minimum daily requirement of vitamin B1, five times the requirement for iron, plus the minimum daily requirement of vitamins A, D, and B2, plus red crystalline vitamin B12. Rexall Formula V10 aids in the formation of hemoglobin, stimulates appetite, and is especially good for convalescence. Remember and ask for it by this name, Rexall Formula V10 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, not a corpse in a carload. Rick? Hi, Helen. Hi. What are you doing? Oh, trying to think up a new ad for the phone book. What's the matter with the old one? Doesn't seem to be bringing in the business. Oh. See what you think of this one. Diamond Detective Agency, we'll split any case you've got. Bonded or dead on arrival. Well, by all means, use it. Like it? No, but think of all the business you'll get from the psychiatric ward. Oh, you're a living doll. Will I see you tonight? Mr. Diamond? Uh, Helen, dear, I'll talk to you later. I think I've spotted a client. Bye. Bye. Well, come in, come in. You're Mr. Diamond? That's right. My name is Quimby, sir. How do you do, Mr. Quimby? Pull up a chair. Uh, Thank you. Something I can do for you? Uh, Yes. You see, Mr. Diamond, I'm the manager of the Far East Importing Company. And when I went down to the store this morning... Our night watchman was missing. So? Also about $50,000 in unset gems. Why come to me instead of the police? But those jewels were on consignment to the store. I was in hopes you could recover them before I had to make an accounting to the owner. Who owned the gems? Uh, Mr. Philip Lasdown. He's a very eccentric collector. He has many things on display in the store. He's a very good client. Aren't you insured? Naturally. But if Mr. Lasdown knew that a robbery had taken place, he'd never again do business with my establishment. And uh, you want me to recover the missing jewels? If you can. Oh. You think the night watchman is responsible for the theft? But I don't know what else to think. The night watchman's name is Block, Arthur Block. Mm-hmm. He lives in an apartment on the east side. But I have already checked with his landlady, and he hasn't shown up. Uh, how long have I got to recover the jewels, Mr. Quimby? But I have no idea. It's impossible to tell when Mr. Lasdown will want an accounting. Well, I charge a hundred dollars a day in expenses. Oh yes. Well, a hundred be enough for now. Well, if you have nothing to do for the next few minutes, I'd be more than happy to grovel at your feet. I beg your pardon? Now, I want the night watchman's address, also the address of your shop. Then you go back to the shop and wait to hear from me. Quimby gave me what I wanted, then minced happily out of my office. I locked up, grabbed a cab for the east side of town, and 20 minutes later, I was talking to the missing night watchman's landlady. Sure, honey. Arthur Block lives here. You're the second one to come asking for him this morning. He killed somebody or something? Is he in? No. We ain't been in since yesterday evening before he left for work. Can I take a look at his room? Well, I don't know, Blue Eyes. It's against the rules. Oh, my goodness. I dropped a five dollar bill. <laughs> my goodness, so you did. Don't hurt your back bending over, honey. I'll get it. Right. Little rheumatism, but anything for a fin. <laughs> There, you got any more loose ones around? I'll show you every room in a joint. Just the one where Block lives. Right down here. You ain't no cop, honey. Shamus? Yep. Figured. Right in here. There you are, handsome. Thank you, Mother. Mother? <laughs> when you're done, stop back at my room and have a beer. I never touch anything stronger than opium. <laughs> The night watchman's room was a shabby affair, about 15 by 20, and I went over it inch by inch, cockroach by cockroach. Apparently, Block hadn't taken anything with him. The drawers of the broken-down dresser were filled with an assortment of socks and underwear. In the closet, I found the rest of his clothes and an old empty suitcase. 
Yes, if Arthur Block had skipped, he was figuring on buying a wardrobe someplace else. I left, keeping on my tiptoes as I passed the landlady's door. Then I headed for the address of Mr. Quimby's antique shop. Hey, Mr. Diamond, did you find out anything about the night watch? Well, his landlady's a lush and likes blue eyes. Didn't Oh, my goodness. What's the matter? Uh, Mr. Lansdowne. Mm. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, Mr. Lansdowne. I do hope you... Enough of your vulgarism, sir. Perfectly wretched afternoon, as you very well know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, it is. But yeah, pardon me. Mr. Diamond, Mr. Lansdowne. Philip J. Lansdowne. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Quimby, I've come for my Buddha. You've come to your... Oh, You've no. had it quite long enough. Where is it? Mr. Lansdowne, I have someone who's interested I've in... decided not to sell it. Now, come, come, come. Where, where is it? Uh, it's over there, in the corner, Mr. Lansdowne. In the corner? Uh, yes. I see. It's not enough that I suffer the torment of lending my exquisite stature uh, to a firm that employs a Philistine as manager. No! I'm now subjected to the ignominy of having it secreted in a corner behind a variety of bric a bra one would expect to find only in the men's lounge at Coney Island. Mr. Lansdowne... Maybe I told you that Buddha was to enjoy this room's most favorable location. You made a grave mistake, sir. A momentous mistake. But, but, but please, Mr. Enough, Lansdowne... Enough, sir. I'm repossessing my Buddha forthwith. For years, I forced myself to deal with you in a patient and forbearing manner. But never again. This is the crowning blow. Far be it for Philip Lansdowne to cast pearls before swine. Oh, that man, Mr. Diamond. Oh, that terrifying man. I, I must have been born under an unlucky star. Well, relax. Things could be worse. You've still got a little hair on your head. Uh, even that's getting thin. So who wants fat hair? I left Quimby wringing the cold sweat out of his hands and took a cab over to the 5th Precinct Police Headquarters. When I walked in, the clock above Lieutenant Levinson's desk said 12 noon, and Lieutenant Levinson said, Oh, no. Well, what's the matter, Fatty? I remind you of your lost youth? No, a lost cause. Well, you might as well face it, Walter. You hate me because I have an athletic waistline. Ha, ha, ha. Eureka. At last, a three-syllable word. I knew you could do it, Otis. I'm going to let you do me a favor. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I want you to check with the morgue and all hospitals and jails for an Arthur Block, lately employed as the night watchman of the Far East Importing Company. Oh. Well, I'll check, but not because you told me to. Mm-hmm. Then why? Because I'm stupid. I guess I told him. What's all this about, Rick? Uh, that's a busy night watchman and $50,000 in jewels, Walt. But you can't stick your nose in it yet. Nobody's dead. I've got a sergeant who could make a liar out of you. What do you know about a guy named Philip J. Lasdown? Never heard of him. Mm, Show me that phone, will you? Yeah. Thanks. Forget it. Just leave a nickel. Oh, he's a collector of rare art objects and nasty dispositions. Want me to check on this Lasdown for you? Mm, Might be a good idea. Okay. (laughs) Yeah? Quimby? Oh, Mr. Diamond, I was hoping you'd call. You and 10,000 foolish debutantes. Mr. Lansdowne has had the Buddha removed, and he is sending his lawyer over in the morning for an accounting. Now, should I tell him about the jewels now or wait until morning? Oh, wait, if you want this thing solved. What's Lansdowne's address? Blue Heron Road, at Long Island. Thanks. I'm going out to see him. I'll check with you later. read pick, look, see, quick, or popular mechanics. I refuse to endorse a petition, and as far as a free excursion to the Bahamas with all expenses paid, I couldn't be less interested. Now, if you'd be so kind as to remove your person from my property. I'm warning you, sir. Look, your highness, remember me? I met you this afternoon at the Far East Importing Company. I remember you. Good day. Uh, 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 uh. Young man, if you do not remove your foot from my door, I may resort to violence. You will kindly remove your foot? By all means, as soon as you answer a few questions. Who are you, sir? I mean, what's your occupation? I am a private detective. How earthy. Well, what do you want? How many things do you have on consignment in the Far East Importing Company? Oh, good grief. What kind of a question is that? The first of several. I have many things on consignment there. Anything of extreme value? What are you getting at? Just curious. Yes, disgustingly so. Of course, there are many things of extreme value. Approximately fifty thousand dollars in rare gems, a dozen priceless antiques. As a matter of fact, that Buddha which you saw this morning, my most priceless possession. Aside from being very old, the eyes are two perfect pigeon blood rubies. 
Now, is there anything else? I'm sure your foot must be going to sleep. Did you ever know or meet a man named Arthur Block? Never. He was the night watchman at the shop. The night watchman. So our conversation's at an end. I find your reference to my association with the night watchman the lowest form of discourse. Now, good day. Gesundheit to you. But. Sorry, I do not read pick, click, quick, look, spook. Hey, who's taking a census? Uh, Just want to know if a party named Larstown lives here. You could hardly call him a party. More like a friendly street fight. Look, friend, I got to pick up some luggage. Does Larstown live here? Yeah, with a bosom Buddha. Larstown's the one with the toupee. Oh, oh Mr. Diamond, I was just closing up sharp. Have you found out anything? Well, not much. Tell me something, Quimby. Where do you keep those jewels? Why, in the safe. Did the night watchman have the combination? Yes, in case of fire. There were also some perishables in with the gems. Did he know much about the rest of the merchandise in the store? Yes, of course. He had a list and made inventory every night. Hmm. Did he know Lazdown's Buddha had ruby eyes? But I don't know. Well, how'd you find out? Lazdown told me. If the night watchman knew about those rubies, I wonder why he didn't pry them out and take them along. I never thought of that. Have you touched that safe? Yes, when I opened it and discovered the loss. Well, don't do it again. It may have some of the night watchman's fingerprints on it somewhere. Tell me, did you, uh, did you know Lazdon was planning on leaving town? Leaving town? No, no, I didn't. Well, I'm not sure that he is, but I've got a hunch. Are you going home after you lock up? Yes. Well, give me your phone number. I'm going down to precinct and may want to reach you later. <laughs> Are you still looking for Block? That's right. Has he shown up? No. Hey, honey, you just skipped off without saying goodbye. Had a beer all open for you. Oh, I bet you were so unhappy you poured it down the drain. <laughs> you sure are the one. <laughs> yeah, I sure am. I sure am. Look, sweetheart, if Block shows up, call me at the 5th Precinct Police Station. Name's Diamond. Sure, has him. Oh, you fracture me. Well, that's an idea. <laughs> Couldn't find nothing on that missing night watchman, Shamus. Oh, well, thanks anyway, Otis. In appreciation, I may send you a large can of Red Heart, liver flavor. Oh, go chase your tail around the block. Otis. Yeah, and I got plenty more things to say. Funny thing? Funny as your face. I'm tired of you making fun of me. I ain't no dog. <laughs> you had any trouble with Otis again? Oh, I don't think it's anything serious. But I would suggest a rabies shot. Well, here's something that might interest you. Philip J. Lasdown booked passage on the Star of the Orient... Sailing for the Far East tonight at 11 o'clock. Famous beauty expert Ann Delafield says that women are tired of endless jars and bottles that cost so much time and money. She says that more than one cream is just nonsense. But can just one cream do everything for your skin? It certainly can. That is, if it's Anne Delafield's all-purpose deep cream. Here's a cleansing cream, face cream, night cream, eye and throat cream. All creams in one. A special blend of all the fine, rich, natural oils so necessary and good for care of your skin. Sounds wonderful. Did Anne Delafield have makeup, too? Yes, indeed. She's designed a whole new, no-nonsense cosmetic line just for you modern women. There are vitamins for true beauty from within. Fine powder with built-in foundation. Everything you need for looking your loveliest. All this must be pretty expensive. But you're wrong. You'll find that the Anne Delafield Cosmetics give you most for your cosmetic dollar and save you so much time as well. So look for them today at Rexall Drugstores everywhere. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, Walt's enlightening bit of information certainly seemed important. So I sat down to try and figure out exactly what I had to date. My client, Quimby, had come into my office and hired me to locate a missing night watchman named Arthur Block because $50,000 in gems had been pilfered from Quimby's shop. The gems belonged to a particularly disgusting character named Philip J. Lasdown. The missing night watchman, Block, was still missing. 
And by the looks of his room, he'd skipped without taking anything with him. And by the look of his landlady, I couldn't blame him. Well, I tied it all together, and the conclusion was amazingly simple. I had exactly nothing. Yeah, I got something hot, Lieutenant. 211 on River Street. I fished the guy out of the bay at the end of Pier 16. I identified as one Arthur Block. Hey. That's your missing night watchman, isn't it? That's his name. They bring the body in? Yeah, it's down the morgue now. Uh, get Quimby down there for identification. Here's his phone number. Does Block have any family or anything? I don't know, but you might check with his landlady. She can get you an identification, too. Otis, get this Quimby and the landlady. Take him down to the morgue. We're going to see Vadier in ballistics. Right. <laughs> Here's the slug, Lieutenant. Huh? Almost like a ball. This is really most amazing. That slug was fired from a weapon made in 1831 by Samuel Colt. He patented it in Europe in 1835 and in the U.S. in 1836. What did the gun look like? Well, it was the forerunner of the Colt 44, a single barrel with a revolving breech, carried five slugs. During the Fieschi Revolution in France in 1834, Fieschi had a rifle made like it. They tried to assassinate Louis Philippe. Oh, ah. Well, what is it, you mallet head? Call just came over the hot shot. That guy, Philip Lasdown, said someone had bust into his house and tried to rob him. He said he chased the guy off, but he was screaming for protection. Come on, Walt. I think we'd better go over there. Well, things were beginning to shape up. Walt and I piled in the squad car and headed for Long Island, the house of Philip J. Lasdown. When we got there, Lasdown was hopping around like a kangaroo with a hot foot. Fine state of affairs getting so a man isn't even safe in his own home. What's the city coming to? A police force is obviously second only to the Boy Scouts. Now, now, calm down, Mr. Calm down, my good fellow. I have no intention of calming down. How would you enjoy walking into your own living room and there, sneaking around in the dark, a pathological fiend intent on robbing you of your most priceless possession? What was he after? My Buddha. The object of your particularly uncouth interrogation of this afternoon, Mr. Diamond. By the way... Where were you 40 minutes ago? Oh, relax. Did you get a look at this guy? The lights were out. Well, did he take you, Buddha? He most certainly did not. But had I not walked in at the precise moment, he would probably be carrying his piggyback through the middle of Times Square. And your observing police force has undoubtedly stopped traffic for him. That's the Buddha right over there, Walt. Keep your hands off it. Now, look, Lassie. You called the police. The police are here, so relax before someone puts their foot in that big mouth. Well, really? Yeah, really. You're getting ready to leave town, aren't you? I don't see that that's any concern of yours, Lieutenant. Well, Buster, in case you don't know it, you're the number one suspect in a killing. I beg your pardon. Do you uh, own any antique guns? Guns? Sir, I do not collect weapons of any sort. I demand to know what you mean when you say I'm suspected of a killing. The night watchman at Quimby's antique shop was shot to death and dumped in the river. Uh, the night watchman again. I told Mr. Diamond once that my association with the night watchman was as ridiculous as... General MacArthur sending Sally in a charm bracelet. Nothing's been touched on the Buddha? Nothing. I assume that the thief knew the value of the ruby eyes. Has there been any publicity about the Buddha? Some. Hmm. Walt, come here. You accuse us a second, Mr. Lashdown? You couldn't make it a year, could you? Charming fellow. Yeah. Look, Walt. In some way, the night watchman, the missing Jim, Lasdown, and his Buddha are all mixed up together. Okay, so what? We haven't even got the murder weapon. Well, if the night watchman did swipe the jewels out of the safe, then... Someone probably killed him for them. Yeah, that figures. Mm. If he was planning on stealing them, wouldn't he be all ready to skip town? Sure. Well, he hadn't packed the thing. The department hadn't been touched. Oh, well, that's not much. Okay. If someone wanted to get that Buddha, why not break in the store? Because it's easier to break into a house out on Long Island. The Buddha was just moved this afternoon. Who knew Lasdown took it? Yeah. And if the potential thief is mixed up with the original jewel theft, why didn't he grab the rubies in the store? I never thought of that. No. I think he wanted that Buddha for something else. Oh, uh, uh last down. What do you want? Is there anything else about that Buddha besides the eyes? I told you once, it's a very rare piece. Yeah, aside from that. Did anyone hide something in it? Hide something? Why, yes, of course. It's hollow. The whole back swings open. Wealthy families used to place their valuable possessions inside the Buddha for protection. Show us. Show us. There you are. You see, the space inside is quite... Good grief. Don't touch it. Isn't that a gun? certainly is, and there may be fingerprints on it. Well, I assure you, that does not belong to me. Do you know anything about a gun like this? 
Well, only that it's apparently very old. An antique. Eight to five, that's the one that killed the night watchman. Give me a handkerchief. Yeah. I'm afraid you'll have to postpone your trip, Mr. Lasdown. Well, I've already purchased my ticket. Have you any idea why the night watchman was killed last night? Not whatsoever. All of those uncut gems you had consigned to Quimby were stolen. What? That's right. Well, why was I notified? Because Mr. Quimby thought I could recover them before you found out. That Shylock, that deceitful little pipsqueak. After all the business I've given him. Come on, Walt. Well, that I might... shall personally take extreme delight in exposing him as a discredit to his profession. Come on. You won't leave town, will you, Lassie, old boy? You have my word, sir. At least not until I'm dealt with that traitor person. But he's a suspect. We can't leave him. Nick! Nick! <laughs> With Walt protesting all the way, we climbed in the squad car and pulled it down the street to wait. In about two minutes flat, Lasdown came streaming out of the house, piled into his own car, and took off for the city with us right behind. A half an hour later, we watched him go into a building on the east side, and we followed. The mailbox gave us Quimby's apartment, and by the time we reached the floor, we could hear Lasdown raising his blood pressure up past the boiling point. How dare you? How dare you? After all these years, Quimby, this is unforgivable. You're really going at it. Shh, Mr. Listen. Lansdowne, you couldn't blame me. I told you anything else, Quimby, you, Quimby. There's no excuse. Please, the neighbors. I assure you, your neighbors will only be the first to hear of this atrocity. Well, when they find the night watchman, you... They have found it. You are. Floating in that filthy river out there. And who put that gun in my boot up? You found it? It's false, up. You knew it was there. That doesn't... No, 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 wait, no, no, wait. I don't know anything about it. Liar! Why did you think I found it? The police discovered it. Well, the police? Yes. They believe it's the same gun that killed. Quimby. Quimby, you didn't. What's going on? I don't know. We'd better get in it. Quimby. No. We'd sure better. No, 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 don't shoot! Stop it, Quimby! No, 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 no. <laughs> you all right, Rick? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Can you imagine such effrontery? That assassin's apprentice was going to shoot me. Here's his gun, Walt. Looks like I got him in the leg. I can't believe it. I, Philip J. lies down, being subjected to such deceitful melodrama. I'll call an ambulance. I haven't viewed such a spectacle since I was eight and a half. Sitting in the balcony of the Savannah Opera House, watching a third-class road company chase me lever across the ice. I can imagine, Lassie. Now, let's have a look at Quimby. Come on, Quimby. Better tell me about it. You killed the night watchman with that antique gun. Yes, I kept the gun in my desk at the office. I was taking the jewels from the safe to make it look like robbery when, when Block came on duty. He was early, and he surprised me. Shot him and hid the gun in the Buddha. That's why you were so shocked when Lazdown came and got it today. Yes, when you told me he was leaving town, I, I feared he would take the Buddha with him and discover the gun inside. It was you who broke into my house this evening. Yes, Mr. Lasdown. Wagon's on the way. Well, Mr. Lasdown, you were pretty lucky. What a revolting display of uncontrolled emotion. Lasdown! Oh, my goodness. Mr. Lasdown's fainted. Why were you so late, Rick? Oh, I got mixed up with a screwy one. I was going to leave the station earlier, but Otis got to discussing Freud with a very learned gentleman named Lasdown. Otis was discussing Freud? Mm-hmm, true. Couldn't tear myself away. <laughs> Seems, according to Otis, that this year Freud plays second base for Brooklyn. <laughs> then we got around to Kenzie and discovered he was batting 200. Oh, I don't believe it. Neither did I, but Otis explained he'd been in a slump all season. <laughs> you and your friends. Hmm. I hate to mention it, but you qualify in that league. Oh, but you love me. I do not. I just breathe hard from an irritated sinus condition. Well, use the condition and sing me a song. Mm, okay. What are you going to sing? I don't think it's any of your business. Oh, that's a nice song. How does it go? Well, you pick one. All right. Let's see. No. I like New York in June. How about you? That's cute. I like a Gershwin tune. How about you? I love it. 
I love a fireside when a storm is due. I like potato chips, moonlight motor drips. Ah, how about you? I'm mad about good books. Can't get my fill. And Doug MacArthur's looks give me a thrill. Holding hands in the movie show when all the lights are low may not be new. But I like it. How about you? I like it. You like me? Well, I... Come here. Oh, well, do you? I don't think it's more weak. <laughs> If your summer fun is being spoiled by the misery of athlete's foot, your Rexall family druggist has a great new product for you. It's Aerosol Fungi Rex, a greaseless, stainless, spray-on relief that's easy, quick, and clean. Fingertip-controlled spray eliminates messy application, gives positive coverage to the entire infected area, and all the burning, itching, and discomfort of athlete's foot are quickly relieved. Ask for Aerosol Fungi Rex. That's F-U-N-G-I hyphen R-E-X, aerosol fungi rex, at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards, with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell directed the RKO production Split Second, which is now in release. And his latest film appearance was in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer award-winning The Bad and the Beautiful. Heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Howard McNear, Jeanette Nolan, John McIntyre, Arthur Q. Bryan, Wilms Herbert, and Harold Dianforth. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this time when Rexall Drug Products again bring you Dick Powell as... Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Now get new and better relief from acid upset stomach. Try Bismarex Gel, the new liquid antacid that gives four-way relief. Bismarex Gel contains aluminum hydroxide for the plus benefits of absorbing and neutralizing excess stomach acid and leaving a protective covering. Ask for Bismarex Gel. B-I-S-M-A hyphen R-E-X-G-E-L. Bismarex Gel at Rexall drugstores everywhere. This is the CBS Radio Network. While the makers of Rexall Drug Products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is Bill Foreman speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of their own store names. They've done that because they recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. This evening, we want to call your particular attention to Rexall's exciting two-page ad in this coming week's issues of Life, Look, Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, and in the current issue of Farm Journal. 
One page is devoted to ten great new health aids, developed and perfected in Rexall's world-famous laboratories, and now available at Rexall drugstores everywhere. The other page features ten headline bargains, available all during the month of July, plus 53 additional values in Rexall money-back guaranteed products. So remember, for new and better health aids, for timely household bargains, be sure to check Rexall's sensational two-page spread in this coming week's issues of Life, Look, Collier's, The Saturday Evening Post, and The Current Farm Journal. Good health to all from Rexall. Now, your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond? That's right. Come in. My name is Hayden, Gustav Hayden. How do you do, Mr. Hayden? Won't you have a seat? Oh, yeah. Thank you. What can I do for you? I would like for you to protect me for the next two days. Protect you from what? Well, uh, maybe I should start at the beginning. By trade, I am a gun maker. Before I was fortunate to come to this country, I worked in German. Uh, do you mind if I smoke? Go right ahead. He pulled out a very old hand-carved pipe and stuffed it into a worn leather pouch. He was a little man, a few inches over five feet. I guessed his age to be somewhere in the 60s. He talked of his home in Germany before Hitler had moved in with the stormtroopers. He told me about his wife and how she had died in a prison camp because she was anti-Nazi. They allowed me to work because I was making a very advanced rifle. And Adolf could use such a rifle. But when it took my wife, I destroyed my blueprints and was myself interned in another prison camp. They tried to beat my secret out of me. I lived, somehow. Then the war was over. Your uh, pipe's gone out. Oh, so it is. I hope I'm not boring you, Mr. Diamond. Well, not at all, no. I have a sister, Anna. I sent her to America before the trouble came. She's a widow and has one son. Perhaps you have heard of a son, Mr. Diamond, William Ehrlich? No, I can't say that I have. Well, you will. He's a lawyer. Someday he will be a very big lawyer. You uh, said you wanted me to protect you, Mr. Hayden. Yeah. My sister, with the help of William, arranged for me to come to the United States. I was quite ill when I arrived, and they sent me to the summer cabin in the Catskill. I soon was better and took great pleasure in this place... So they have allowed me to stay at the cabin and make it my home. See. Si. Willie even made for me a complete workshop at my disposal. And in the last two years, I've occupied myself with my old trade. Making guns? Yeah. I have finally produced my new rifle, Mr. Diamond, and someone has tried to steal it. Well, if somebody's trying to steal it, you should go to the FBI or the police. Well, I think of that, Mr. Diamond, but it would involve my sister and her son. I'm not sure how good this rifle is until after I test it. And I don't wish to have my family involved unless the rifle is a good one. Have you any idea who might have tried to steal it? No. Hmm. How long do you want protection? Only for two days while I test the gun. And then I want somebody to go with me to the right people so I may show the rifle to them. Well, I, uh, I charge a hundred a day in expenses, Mr. Hyden. I have no money, only what Billy gives to me each month for living costs, but if you will take a chance with me, Mr. Diamond, that the rifle is a success, I will see you are well rewarded. And if the government doesn't want the rifle? Sir, like myself, I'll have lost such a time and effort. Mm. Where's the rifle now? In my shop in the Catskills. Well, if somebody's already tried to steal it, aren't you taking a big chance? Oh, that's a caretaker, sir. My nephew hired him when I moved in. Where was the caretaker when the attempt was made to steal the rifle? Uh, we were both asleep. I heard a noise in the shop and went out to see. Albert, uh, that's the caretaker, heard it also. We both got to the shop about the same time. Uh, whoever it was, we must have frightened him away. But someone had been there. The window was open and much of my equipment had been moved. All right, Mr. Hyden, I'll gamble with you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Diamond, thank you. I, I'm going to see my sister now, but I will meet you at the ticket window 11, Grand Central Station, at 8 o'clock. Well, look what 
just walked in. Hello, Sergeant Otis. You're looking exceptionally well this afternoon. Had a haircut, didn't you? Yeah. How's it look? Doesn't it confuse you, Barbara, working on two heads at once? No. No. Hello, Walt. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Diamond. Why don't you do me a favor, Fatty? Rick, I've thought of everything. There's no way I can get rid of Otis and make it look like suicide. Then do me another favor. All right. Check on a man named Gustav Haydn, German citizen. Been in this country for a couple of years. What's it all about? Oh, confidential. like to tell you, but I can't. Okay, I'll see what I can find out for you. Thanks. I've got to take a little trip tonight around 8. I'll be at home if you come up with anything. <laughs> Hey, what the... Mm. That's Diamond, all right. Pick him up and drag him over to the bed. Sure. Okay. Put him up on the bed. The heavy son of a gun. Wake him up. Come no. on. Come on, wake up. Here's one. <coughs> He's coming around. Yeah, yeah, he's with us. Okay. <sighs> now, don't try to get up or we'll have to belt you again. Oh, what's this all about? We want the plans. Oh, you do, huh? And we're going to get them. Oh, I, I guess I'm in a hole. I I don't give you the plans. You work me over. Believe me, I hate to mention it, but I haven't got them. Take off your coat, Max. Sure. Go over and turn on that radio. Right. Now, look, I told you... Yeah, that... I know. You don't have the plans. I, I I don't even know what you're talking about. And remember, friends, there's a federal excise tax to pay on all television. Get some music. So buy now and... Turn it up. Okay, come here. You want me to take, take over? Yeah. I'll keep the gun on you. Mm, no. Oh, why, you dirty... Lie down. Go on. Work on his ribs. Okay. Hey. Oh. You, you better tell us. Oh, you, you knuckleheads. I, I can't tell you if I don't know. Oh, he's sure stubborn. <clears throat> Hold it. Not a noise out of you, Diamond. Blue eyes, blue eyes. Come on, open up. Who is it, Diamond? My brother-in-law. Come on, Diamond. Get out of the sack. I got something for you. If you don't want him to get hurt, get rid of him. But he's got something for me. Well, get it and tell him to beat it. Go on over to the door, but don't let him in. I'll be right behind you. Okay. Okay. Well, it's about time. Hey, what's with you? Look, I thought you... Uh, Walt, uh, uh, tell Marge and the kids I, I can't come over. I'm busy. What? Look, And, man. uh, and uh, about the fur coat. Tell her I couldn't get it for under 418. Huh? 418, and, uh, I don't want to get stuck with it. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll tell her. You uh, said you had something for me? It'll keep. I'll give it to you when you got more time. Sorry, but you know how it is. Business. Sure. Uh, tell Marge I'm sorry. I, I couldn't come over. I'll tell her. See you soon. Hey. Yeah? What kind of a coat do you buy for 418 bucks? Uh, 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 a beaver. A beaver? Well, I could have gotten it for you for half. Forget it. Over on the bed, Diamond. Now, look, I, I swear, I don't know about plans or anything else. We got a lot of time. Maybe after a little while, you'll remember. Move. All right. Mm. Now, let's see. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. Mm. Come on, Diamond. The plans the little guy gave you. Sorry, I wish I could help. Mm. We know the guy came to your office an hour ago. If he didn't give you the plans, he told you where they are. I had one customer in the office today. Yeah, and what did he want? Max? Look, look, now, look. It, it wasn't anything about plans. What was it? Again, Max. <laughs> mm. Max kept working, and I took it. For one reason, because I had to. For another, I knew Walt had gotten a 418 tip. In police code, that meant a slugging. It was sooner than I expected. 
I looked over at the open window at the back of the room, and there was Walt, looking in from the fire escape. Come on, Diamond. I'm getting tired. And I feel rested, huh? Okay. Drop the gun. Ah. Wait, look out. Ah. Rick. Okay. Here. Get this guy off me, Walt. Okay. Hey. Oh, oh, thanks, thanks. Well, this one's had it. Oh, you got both of them. This one fried, and the other went for his. They're both dead. Oh, turn off that radio, will you? Okay. Why were they working you over? Well, they wanted something I didn't have. Something they thought my client gave me this afternoon. Gustav Hayden? Yeah. You find out anything about him? Well, nothing incriminating. Got a whole background on him here. I'll read it on the way down to Grand Central. Hayden didn't want the law in on this, but with two men dead, as far as I'm concerned, that puts it right in your lap. This coming week's issues of Life, Look, Colliers, the Saturday Evening Post, and the current Farm Journal carry an important two-page Rexall ad. One page features ten great new health aids, developed and perfected in Rexall's world-famous laboratories and now available at Rexall drugstores everywhere. The other page features ten headline bargains good all during July. Here are just a couple of examples. Rexall 5X Multivitamins, the tablets that are five times stronger than the established daily requirement of all vitamins with known minimums. Special introductory offer, 10-day trial size, a regular dollar and 79 cent value, free of extra cost with the purchase of the regular bottle of 50. Stag brushless shave cream, regular 50 cent jumbo tube, now only 25 cents, exactly half price. So remember, for new and finer health aids, for bigger and better bargains, Be sure to check Rexall's sensational two-page ad in this coming week's issues of Life, Look, Collier's, The Saturday Evening Post, and The Current Farm Journal. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, this is Ed Walt. I was supposed to meet him here with the ticket window. Oh, where is he? Oh, I, uh... Well, Sam, this is ticket window 11. Mm-hmm. Let's give him a few minutes. And we gave Gustav Hyde more than a few minutes. At 8 o'clock, we were still waiting. At 8.15, the train Hyde and I were supposed to take pulled out. You stood up? Yeah. Let's check with the ticket seller. Uh... Pardon me, sir. May I talk with you for a minute? Certainly. What can I do for you? Police business. Oh. Did uh, did you notice a little man standing near this window? About 5'3", big bunch of gray hair, old brown hat and suit, button shoes. Smoking a big pipe? That's it? Sure, I couldn't help but notice him. Stood around for about 15 minutes. See him leave? Yeah, left with a man, big guy. You remember what the big guy looked like? I uh, didn't pay much attention, just big. What do you think, Rick? I think we better look up Gustav Hyden's sister. What is this all about, Lieutenant? Gustav left for the train station an hour ago. He was going back to the mountains. Now, it's nothing to be alarmed about, Mrs. Ehrlich. He just didn't take the train. Are you certain? We checked. But I still don't understand. Mr. Diamond, what is your interest in my brother? Well, he retained me this morning to protect him. To protect him? Protect him from what? Well, Mr. Ehrlich, he said someone was... Trying to steal a new rifle he was developing. A new rifle? A gun he started designing a long time ago in Germany. He never told us anything about it. Well, I don't believe he wanted to involve you until it was all finished and tested. Mm. If it was a success, he was going to turn it over to the government. Mm, He certainly kept it a secret. I helped him fix up a workshop, but I just thought it was to keep him occupied. An old man, you know, wanted to keep him busy. Mr. Diamond, you think something's happened to him because of this rifle? Well, maybe not. But if you hear from him, please contact Lieutenant Levinson at the 5th Precinct Police Station. Anna Ehrlich gave us the location of the mountain cabin where Hayden was living, and we left. Walt went back to the station, put out a description on the missing gunsmith. 
and I caught the next train for the Catskills. It was morning when I climbed off the train and hired an old car to take me the five miles back into the woods. Twenty minutes of bumpy road, and I arrived at the cabin to be met by the caretaker. Thanks, driver. You want something? Ah, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Hyden. Uh, what did you want him for? He's here. Well, didn't you think he'd be? I'd like to talk to him, please. I don't know. He's in kind of a strange mood. Came in about four this morning, acting like he'd seen a... Albert. Uh, yeah, Mr. Hyden. Those are gentlemen in. Yes, sir. It will be out, Albert. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Diamond, what are you doing here? I saw your sister. You talked with my sister? That's right. Your face is bruised. Two men beat me up. Mr. Diamond, I did not meet you at the station because I changed my mind. I'm so sorry you made this long trip, but I have no need for your service. Oh, what changed your mind? I decided not to go on. Mm. Who was the man you left the station with, the big man? The ticket agent saw you. Oh, he must have made a mistake. This is police business now, Mr. Hyden. Please leave. I can't. I want to know what this is all about. Please, please, I can't tell you. I'd like to see your rifle, Mr. Hyden. Mr. Diamond, I don't care what has happened. I cannot allow you. Mr. Hyden, you might as well cooperate. If I leave here, I'll leave with you. Oh, no, no, you don't know what it would mean. Look, the two men who beat me up are dead. There's a dragnet out for you. Now, if you want me to help, maybe I can do you some good. It's up to you. Uh, I must think. Okay. But while you're thinking, I'd like to see that rifle. Of course. I keep it locked in this closet. All that's left is to test it. Hmm. Beautiful. I'd like to fire it. I have decided to tell you everything, Mr. Diamond. Well, I'm glad. You were right about the big man I was leaving the station with. He warned me to forget my dealings with you and not to call in the police. Then he drove me here and demanded the rifle and the plans. I told him the rifle was not nearly finished, but I gave him a set of blueprints and he left. Then they've got the plans? They have some plans. I expected something like this, and I drew up several sets of blueprints that will be no good to anyone. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what to do now. My sister and her son are in danger. Well, the first thing we've got to do is get a hold of Lieutenant Levinson and tell him I found you. He'll give your family an armed guard if necessary. But we don't know who these men are, who they're working for. You can't guard my sister and nephew forever. That's a matter for the FBI. We've got two dead bodies to identify. They might give us a lead. Oh, uh, somebody just drove up. Uh, we can see from this window. Oh, you know the car? Well, it looks like Willie's car. Oh, it is your nephew. Oh, why did he come here? Really? Oh, Uncle Gustav, we've been worried sick. We couldn't wait to hear from Mr. Diamond, so I drove up. Mother's beside herself. Oh, sorry, Willie. I should have notified Mr. You. Diamond said you left the station with the man. We'll tell you all about it on the way back, Alec. I've got to put in a call to the lieutenant and tell him to call off the dogs. Uh, the telephone is in the other room, Mr. Diamond. Thanks. I'm sorry to make all this trouble, Willie. Oh, I couldn't do anything else. What's this all about? Mr. Diamond mentioned something about a new rifle. I was going to tell you, but I wanted to wait until I was certain of its performance. Yes, but you certainly could have told me. I could have helped. I thought of it, but... Yes, Hello? Hello, operator. Uncle Gustav, you think that would have made... Operator. operator. What would have to me after all you and Anna have done for me? <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Diamond. Hey, the phone's dead. What? We've never had any trouble with it before. That's what I was afraid of. Where's that caretaker? He was here a moment ago. Albert! Albert! Yes, sir? The phone's dead, Albert. Well, it was, it was working all right a little while ago. I, I called the store and ordered some uh, some groceries. Mm. Come on, you're going to show us those phone lines. Uh, that's the phone line coming down from the trees. Over the house, right? Well, what do you know? Yeah, the line's been cut. What? That's right, Mr. Hyden. Mr. Diamond. Now, just take it easy. Mr. Ehrlich, we're all going to pile in your car and get out of here. Wait. Don't you see what this can mean? My sister's alone back in New York. You can't reach the police to give us the necessary protection. Well, we certainly can't stay here. We must. I can't take a chance on my sister's life. 
I will give them the rifle and the plans. Oh, don't be ridiculous. If you give it to them, you don't think they're going to let you live, or for that matter, let any one of us get out of here alive. I'm an old man. It doesn't matter. Sorry. We're all getting into that car. No, Mr. Diamond. I cannot. Uh, wait a minute, Diamond. In a way, he's right. My mother's life is important also. I can appreciate that, Mr. Ehrlich. But we're only presuming she might be in danger. We know that your uncle is, and that rifle's too important. I won't leave. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to, and I wouldn't like to use force. Now, come on. All of you get in that car. Wait just a minute, Mr. Diamond. No one's leaving this cabin. Look, Ehrlich, you look... Really? You don't have to use a gun. I'm afraid I do, Uncle. But you can't... Shut up and get over there with Mr. Diamond. Really? Shut up, you old fool. Get over there. You better do as he says. But I don't understand. It's not too hard to figure out. Albert. Yeah? Go and get that rifle. Well, now, wait a minute. Go and get the rifle. Look, I'm the man you've been expecting. You? Of course. Do you think I would have hired you as caretaker unless I knew you were working with us? Now go bring that rifle. Yes, sir. Really? You are behind all this? Oh, now, now. Don't be so naive, Uncle. I've been with the party for years. The party? Certainly. <laughs> you didn't think we were a bunch of thugs, did you? There's a difference? That's all right, Diamond. Enjoy yourself. You don't have too long. I... I simply can't believe it. And Anna... Mother knows nothing about it. She couldn't understand. And Albert telling everything I did. That's how they kept such close tabs on you, Mr. Hyden. They tried to get the gun first by stealing it. When you came to my office, they thought you'd given me the plans and sent two of their strong arms to beat it out of me. That didn't pay off, so they had you picked up at the station. You gave the big man the wrong plans and... Up came your sweet little nephew. But why didn't Albert steal it? He could have many times. Well, he'd have been the first one suspected. Quite shrewd, Mr. Diamond. Oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a dilly. <laughs> you played it pretty cozy, too, Ehrlich. Even your own man didn't know you were running the show. Here it is, Mr. Ehrlich. I brought some shells in case you wanted to see it work. Ah, good. Well, Uncle, I suppose you're just as interested in the performance of your rifle as I am. Uh, you can try it right here, Albert. Yes, sir. Pick a good target. Uh, walk down the road about a hundred yards and see if you can kill Mr. Diamond on the first shot. Really? Now, relax, Mr. Hyden. There's nothing we can do about it. You are completely right for the first time, Mr. Diamond. Go ahead, Albert. Uh, move away, Uncle. And if you try anything, Mr. Diamond, then I shall have to shoot you. Move away, Uncle. No. No. I think I shall stand with my friend. Mr. Hyden, please. I am sure they don't intend to let me live anyway. Oh, on the contrary, Uncle. We were planning a long voyage for you. We know of a place that could use a man of your talents. I see. I prefer to stand with my friend. Very well. Albert! Yeah? Don't do it, Mr. Hyden. After Mr. Diamond, Mr. Hyden. Both of them! Uh, first, Mr. Diamond, then my uncle. Okay. It's good enough. Uh, no, move farther down. I want my uncle to see how good his gun really is. Okay. But the first couple of shots might be off. This thing hasn't been zeroed in yet. Mr. Hyden, please get out of the way. Is it all right if I smoke my pipe? Oh, certainly. There's nothing like a good pipe and good tobacco. Did you ever see Germany before the war, Mr. Diamond? No. In the spring, beautiful. I used to take long walks and smoke my pipe. I can't complain. I have some wonderful memories. You ever see Hell's Kitchen in the middle of the summer? No. Stinks. It's okay! Well, Mr. Diamond? I'll get it over with. Uh, that's fine. All right, Albert. I hope to talk with you again, Mr. Diamond. Someplace. You're a nice guy, Gus. <laughs> Mr. Diamond... Oh, I don't know. I'm still too scared to find out. You're scared? Uh, I didn't know whether I could hit him or not. Uh, you made a fine rifle, Mr. Hyden. Mr. Diamond, he shot Willie. Really. He wasn't even trying to hit you. Oh, I think I'd better sit down. But I don't understand. Oh, wait until good old Albert gets back here. I, I think you'll find out he's more than a caretaker. Bless his little heart. <laughs> And good old Albert was a little more than a caretaker. His real name was Baxter, special agent for the FBI. 
working for the past six years as undercover man inside Ehrlich's organization. The last time I saw Gus, the government had accepted his rifle. He was smiling and smoking his old pipe. We talked for a long time, just like he had hoped he would. This time of year, no woman wants to spend endless hours caring for her skin and makeup. Since you want the finest beauty care in the least time and with no nonsense about it, why not try the new Andelafield Cosmetics? Designed expressly for the busy modern woman, they give you the most for your cosmetic dollar and save time as well. There are no endless bottles and jars, no endless creams for different corners of your face and neck. Just one fine cream. The Anne Delafield All-Purpose Deep Cream. A day cream, cleansing cream, night cream. All creams in one. There are vitamins, too, for true beauty from within. And other lovely makeup aids tailor-made for you. Look for the fine Anne Delafield Cosmetics at Rexall Drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell directed the RKO production Split Second, which is now in release, and his latest film appearance was in the Metro-Golden-Mayer award-winning The Bad and the Beautiful. Heard in tonight's cast were Arthur Q. Bryan, Wilms Herbert, Ben Wright, Jack Crucian, Virginia Gregg, Don Diamond, and Lillian Bayef. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this time when Rexall Drug Products again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Remember, for new and better health aids for bigger and more useful bargains, check Rexall's sensational two-page ad in next week's issues of Life, Look, Collier's, The Saturday Evening Post, and in the Farm Journal. You can know better health. You can save money. Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we can solve any crime but television. Diamond, stop clowning and get right down here. Well, Sergeant Lovelum, what's the matter, Otis? Didn't the zoo pick up your option? Oh, now quit that. You gotta get right down here. Something terrible's happened. They haven't made you commissioner. Worse than that. Lieutenant Levinson's been kidnapped. Diamond to see you, Captain. Hello, Collins. Sure. All right, Diamond. Uh, Otis just called me about Walt. Now, look, Rick. I know Walt's a personal friend of yours. He's a good friend of mine, too. But this is police business. A cop's been kidnapped. Diamond was a cop for six years. I don't need a case history, Sergeant. Oh, get off it, Charlie. I'm down here to help. Of course you are. But there's one thing I won't stand for, Rick. The way you operate. Well, what's the matter with the way I operate? I know how you feel about Walter. When a guy feels that strongly about someone, he's liable to do a lot of things to get a few answers. Oh, for Pete's sake, Charlie. What are you going to do? Hold a tea party and hope someone will spread some gossip? That's not fair, Rick. Well, if you think I'm going to sit back knowing that Bert Fisher's got Walter... Who said anything about Bert Fisher? Well, nobody had to say anything. Pretty obvious, isn't it? Walt sent Bert's brother Art to the electric chair. Bert swore he'd get Walt for it. Fisher dies tonight, doesn't he? Yeah. Sure, I think it's Bert Fisher, too. 
And we're going to do everything about it we can. Bird's been to Detroit, hasn't he? Yeah. We've got a call into Detroit. Should be hearing any time. This phone call you got saying they had Walt. I didn't have time to trace it. The guy said Walt was being held, and when Art Fisher dies tonight in the chair, so does Walt. Charlie, I'm going to work on this thing whether you like it or not. Well, that figures. But I promise you, Rick, I won't save your skin if you get out of line. Mm. Any leads yet? No. You're rounding up the usual stoolies. Well, I know a couple of boys who might have a few angles. Who? Nobody who would give you any information. These guys aren't stoolies. They might tell me because I think they like me. You see, Charlie, sometimes it pays not to be a cop. I'll expect any information you get, Rick. Oh, sure. Well, I'll see you later. Uh, Rick? Yeah? Be a good boy, will you? Uh, Collins, if we don't find Walt by 11 o'clock, can you hold up Fisher's execution? No. Oh, that's swell. I'll keep in touch. Ed Diamond, you think you can do anything? And I can try. Do me a favor, Otis. Okay. Get me a complete background on Bert Fisher. Everything. All his friends, his record, as far back as you can go. Gee, Diamond, I'm scared for the lieutenant. You're not alone with that one, Otis. In the Bowery, living in a broken-down rooming house, was a man. Twenty years ago, he'd come to the big city with his trumpet tucked under his arm. He'd started playing with little combinations along 52nd Street, and pretty soon the word got around. Everyone came to listen to him. They called him the Dean of Jazz, and the title stuck. Then one night he had an argument with one of the Fusari mob, and the next morning they found him in an alley, half dead, his face beaten to a pulp. It was a long time before the Dean could get around again, and it was a lot longer before he could play his trumpet. And by then, no one would have him. He couldn't make enough with the horn, so he tried crime. And that's where I met him. I did him a favor, and a short time later, he went straight. He'd still kept his underworld connections, but he he wasn't a stoolie. I'd just done him a favor once. Yeah, who is it? Uh, Richard Diamond. Oh. Hello, Diamond. How are you, Dean? Like to see you. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of figured you would. Dean, uh, you ever run into a guy named Fisher? Burke Fisher? How about a drink? No, thanks. Skull. <sighs> oh, man, it's going to be hot today. This, uh, Burke Fisher grabbed Lieutenant Levinson. Says he's going to kill him. Well, I can't help you. Oh, Dean, I just need one little lead to get started. Yeah, sure. Whew, I wish I had a fan in here. How's business? Hmm. It isn't. I make enough to pay the rent. How about a few bucks to keep you going? Well, I ain't proud, but it won't buy you anything. The lieutenant's a good friend. Yeah, yeah. Word got around this morning. Yeah. Here's ten. Buy yourself some groceries. Well, thanks. You... He did me a favor once. Forget it. Bert Fisher's got a lot of rough hoods working for him. They're most all from Detroit. But they kill the same as anyone from here. Mm-hmm. Dean, do you know anything at all? I might. Who wants to die? Pretty good. Oh. <laughs> sure, me and Bix. Well, I'll see you around. Yeah, thanks for the tent. Oh, uh, Dean, about 11 o'clock tonight, play a few bars at the funeral march. Oh, uh, Diamond. Yeah? You, uh, remember this tune, don't you? Sergeant Lovell 
out, Lou. Oh, this is Diamond, Otis. What'd you find out? Oh, I got reports on everybody we know is connected with Bert Fisher. You want me to read them off? Anybody on that list named Mary? Mary? No. These guys are all named Hallelujah or something. Look, uh, check all of those names and see if Fisher or any one of his boys ever knew a girl named Mary. Then after you do that, I'll... You'll what? Holy smoke. I'll talk to you later. Dean! Dean! Dean had blown his last note. He was sprawled face down on the dirty carpet, clutching the shiny trumpet. The thin line of red was spreading out from a bullet hole in his chest. And the open window sent me across the room in a hurry. I looked out on the fire escape to see a man drop to the alley below. We both fired a split second apart. He staggered as my slug knocked him against the building. And then before I could try again, he disappeared around the corner. I turned, looked down at the Dean, and wondered if Gabriel was getting a lesson in jazz. I warned you before you left here okay, that I... Okay, okay, Charlie. A nice guy's been killed, but all the crying in the world isn't going to help. Hey, I got something, Diamond. Let's Good see. Good grief. He's got the whole department working for him. Come on, Otis. What have you got? Uh, is it all right, Captain? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I should be in the second-hand business. Report on one of Fisher's old mob, Lou Baxter. Only one of the whole bunch who had a girl named Mary. Mary? Who's Mary? Charlie, look at this picture. Lou Baxter. I've been looking at it all morning. Oh, take another look. This is the guy I shot climbing down off the fire escape after he killed the Dean. What? Holy smoke. You know where you can pick him up? Oh, he's a local boy, all right. Didn't go back to Detroit with Fisher. I've had a call out him since 1020 this morning. Hey, what about that girl, Otis? Name's Mary Sinclair. I uh, used to go with Lou Baxter, Captain. No address on her. Mary Sinclair and Lou Baxter, huh? Well, it's the first lead we've had. I'll get the boys on it. Charlie had his methods and I had mine. Otis got in touch with the musician's local, and in half an hour, I had a list of all the places the dean had worked since the union had a record on him. I started checking. Dive, restaurants, jam joints. Questioning owners, bartenders, waiters. No one knew a girl named Mary Sinclair. Around 3 o'clock, I wandered into a place on 52nd Street known as the Red Parrot. Hey. I'm uh, looking for information. Your cop? Private cop. Uh-huh. You, uh, remember a guy who played here last year? Trumpet man? The Dean? Sure. Everybody knows the Dean. Something wrong? The Dean got himself killed. Oh, no. Gee, that's too bad. Real nice guy. You ever know a girl named Sinclair? Mary Sinclair? Uh, no. No, I don't think so. Uh, okay. Hey, mister. Yeah? Watch your sketch. He's the boy with the fingers playing the piano. He knew the Dean pretty well. Thanks. You, Ed? Yeah. What can I do for you, Pops? I understand you're a good friend of the Dean. Sure, we're compatible. But I ain't seen him in a while. You looking for him? No, for a friend of his. A Mary Sinclair. Cute chick. Uh, where can I find her? Why do you want to find her, Pops? Well, the dean was murdered a few hours ago. She used to live over on 47th Street, 69 West. That was a year ago. You sure about the address? Couldn't forget it. We had a few balls up there. She was kind of a flip. We had a little combo in here, pretty crazy, too. She used to come in and listen. Real hep on jazz. Knew all the old-timers by name. Like the dean. I remembered when he was tops, before he got hurt. Did you ever hear him in those days? Yeah. I played with him a lot. Used to watch him real close sometimes, after hours. And the boys would just sit around and blow because I felt like it. The dean used to lean back and close his eyes and blow things like he was getting a word from the other side. It was great. Might have been the greatest. Well, we all got to go on ahead sometime. I guess it ain't so bad, though. The harp's a real wild instrument.
I left the piano player and headed for the address he'd given me. There was a good chance Mary Sinclair wasn't living there anymore, but it was the closest I'd come to any kind of a lead. When I got there, I held my breath and looked at the mailbox. Score for Diamond. Miss Mary Sinclair still lived in the building. Mary Sinclair? Yeah. Whatever you're selling, I'll take a dozen. I'd like to talk with you. I'd like you to. Some other time. I'm busy right now. I'm afraid this can't wait. It'll have to, baby. Give me a call. Plaza 45466, Mr. Uh, Diamond. Okay, doll. Call me tomorrow, huh? You got your foot in the door, honey? Old habit. Can't seem to break it. Well, I'll break it for you, honey. Your whole leg. You'll be sorry, doll. Hmm. All right, baby, make it quick, huh? What do you want? Let's talk inside. I told you. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's cooler in here. The coolest. But it won't be for long. Where's Lou Baxter? Who? You know, the boy you used to run around with. I ran around with a lot of boys. Ever since I was in grammar school, I ran around with boys. It's a hobby. Where's Lou Baxter? Baby, I don't know. You want to twist my arm? Go ahead, it might be fun. He just killed a dean. He did? Shame on him. Forget it, Mary. Hey, Lou. Get out of the way. That's the guy who put a slug in me. Looked like you're in pretty bad shape, Baxter. Doctor's coming. But he ain't gonna be able to help you. See, honey, you should have come back tomorrow. Shut up. Well, wouldn't have been half so painful. I want Bert Fisher. Well, good for you. Get away from that door. Now. Walk into that other room. Robin, back to the Didn't want to play. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, Charlie. I needed him alive. That's gratitude for you. I knew you'd get into trouble, Diamond. So I tailed you from that last bar on 52nd. Is this uh, Mary St. Clair? Charmed, I'm sure. Ought to stay here. Call the wagon. Right. There's a doctor coming up. I doubt if he's legit. Wait for him, then bring him down to the station, Otis. Right. Come on, Miss Sinclair. Sure, honey. You know, Mr. Diamond, I think I'll have to break that date for tomorrow. Here are Baxter's things, Captain. Watch, wallet, nothing much. Yeah, let's check the wallet. Hmm. Book of matches. Danny's Diner, Route 51. Check on the doors. Right. Uh, nothing much in the wallet. Social security, driver's license, some money. Yeah, quite a lot of money. Want to take a look? Yeah. No addresses, huh? Uh, here's a ticket to a shoe repair shop. Well, nothing much here that would give us a lead. Mm. Yeah? Danny's Diner is about 160 miles out on Route 51. And guess who runs it? Who? Gino Amalo. That does it. Call the authorities in that area. Right. Gino Amalo. Mm. Eight years for armed robbery. Used to work for Bert Fisher. Yeah, maybe this is it. What time is it? Uh, going on seven. This better be it. We only have four hours. We've got to drive 160 miles. <laughs> Captain Collins talked to the sheriff's office and set up a rendezvous with them near Danny's Diner. Then we piled into a squad car and roared across the 59th Street Bridge for Route 51. Step on it, Otis. We're doing 80 now. Then do 90. It's getting late. Now, Rick, uh, you think we should bust right in the diner and take Amalo? No. Amalo doesn't know me. Never seen me. You stake out your men around the place and I'll go in. Give me a couple of minutes, then you come in, work on Amalo a little, and then leave. If he knows where Fisher is, you'll try to get in touch and I'll tag him. Something for you? Uh, yeah, uh, a cup of coffee and a piece of pie. You got raspberry, chocolate, lemon, peach, custard. Oh, uh, raspberry. Yeah. Hmm. Here you are. Uh, where's the closest gas station? About a mile down the road, but I think it's closed. It's after 10. closes at 10. Oh, uh, thanks. Miss? A miss? Yeah. Where's Tino Amalo? In the back. You want him? Call him. Sure. Hey, Mr. Amalo, someone wants to see you. Okay, be right there. Yeah, something I can do. Oh, what are you doing way out here, Captain? Is this your book of matches? 
Yeah, that's the name of my place. Ah, uh, these matches on Lou Baxter. Baxter's dead. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, you're not going to tie Baxter up with me, are you? Lots of people come in here and take my matches. If Baxter came in here, you saw him. You're an old friend. Well, sure, I, I know, Lou, but I ain't seen him in years. You got word your old boss is in town, Bert Fisher. Oh, is that right? You know where we might find him? No, I haven't seen Bert in years either. Look, Captain, I've been going straight. Sure. You're uh, a little out of your territory, ain't you? This is unofficial. If you were in my jurisdiction, I'd haul you in. Look, I tell you, I'm going straight. I don't know nothing about Lou Baxter or Burke Fisher. Okay, Amaro. You may hear from me again. Well, nice seeing you again, Captain. Now, uh, miss. More coffee? Yeah. Where's the phone? Right over there on the wall. Is there another one? In the kitchen, but you can't use that. Mm-hmm. Hey, you can't go back there. Honey, it's the police. You stay where you are. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Tino. Let me talk to Fish. I... Hey, what are you doing? Don't to... move, Amalo. What is this? Cover up that mouthpiece. Cover it up. Okay, okay. Now, when you get Fisher on the line, say what I tell you. Hold that receiver out so I can listen. Look, friend. You I... look. Say one thing wrong, and I'll use this gun. Your cop? None of your business. Well, look, look I thought. Yeah, what do you want, Amalo? There he is. Tell him you just heard Baxter was killed. Hello. Tell him, tell him. Uh, hello. Look, I just uh, just got news that the Baxter was killed. Yeah? Okay, anything else? No, that's all. Uh, no, no, that's all. So what's the matter with you? Uh, nothing, nothing. Okay. You got any more of those? Keep in touch. Hang on. Now, where's Fisher hiding out? <laughs> Get up. Where's Fisher hiding out? You dirty flat foot. You nearly bust my jaw. Only nearly? Where is he, Amalo? Well, you kill me if I tell you. That's getting late. Are you going to tell me? Okay, to... okay. It's in a cabin about a mile up the road. Come on. You're going to show us. Just around that bend. Yeah, we better get out here and walk. How many men has he got in there with him, Chino? Uh, two. Now, whose cabin is it? Mine. Otis, get out and tell the rest of the men to douse their lights and come over here. Right, Captain. Now, uh, here's a piece of paper. Draw us the floor plan of that cabin. Here, I'll give you some light. Okay, go ahead, Amalo. How many rooms? Uh, three. Uh-huh. Hey, we're all set, Captain. Okay. One big room with a door here, a kitchen here, and a bedroom here. Oh, where's Lieutenant Levinson? I've only been up there once since they got in. He, he was in the bedroom. How about closets, back door? Uh, one closet in the main room here, one in the bedroom here. Let's see, a broom closet in the kitchen and the back door here. Has it got an attic? I no, no. Where's Fisher's car? Parked around the back in the shed. Okay, I'll have the men stake out the place. You're going to take me up there, Amalo? Me? He's going to take us up there. You're a civilian, Rick. If there's any shooting to be done... If there's going to be any shooting, I'm going to be in on it. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who said I was going to take you guys up there anyway? I did. I, did. I told you everything I know. I ain't going to get my head shot off. You're going to walk us up there, Amalo, and you're going to knock on the door. No, no, no. And no. you're going to get them to open up. Look, they're loaded with artillery, shotguns. When the door opens, you duck. Okay, suicide. You heard what the captain said, Amalo. I'm a civilian. Without a badge, I'm allowed to get pretty nasty with you. Look, you can't make me do something I don't want. I know my rights, Captain. You know something, Rick? I think I'm catching a cold. I can't hear a thing. All right, now, wait a minute. I'll go check the men. I, uh, trust you'll not take advantage of the prisoner, Rick. I couldn't hear if he yelled or something. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay. Fine cop. All right, let's go. All right, men. Listen now. I'm going to put Diamond... Three of you take that side of the house. Three take the other. You and you go around the back to the shed where the car is. Yeah. Otis? Yeah? You and this man cover the front, but stay out of sight. If it comes, it'll come in a hurry, so close in fast. And look, boys. The lieutenant's in the back room. So try and be as careful as you can. All set? Yep. Let's go, Amalo. Here. Right, Captain. Good luck. 
What are you stopping for, Amalo? I, I just remember they told me to yell if I came up. If you try to pull anything... No, no, no. Honest, honest. They told me to yell. Okay. You stay here. We're going up on that porch. Count 20, then yell. And play it smart. I won't fool with you, Amalo. Okay, okay, Captain. But I'm scared stiff. You're not alone. Come on, Charlie. Get on that side of the door. <laughs> hey, Bert! Bert, it's me, Chino! Hey, Bert, I gotta see you! You along? Yeah, yeah. Can I come up? So light on him, Ed. Okay, come on up. Get him right. Where are you? Stop it! One going to the room. Take out! Okay, okay. Don't shoot anyone. I'm all right. See you, Walt. Okay. Walt? Well, it's about time. Get these ropes off me. You okay, Walt? Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. What time is it? 11 o'clock. Happy birthday. <laughs> Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. While the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Good evening. This is Bill Foreman speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of their own store names. They've done that because they recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. All this month, Rexall family druggists are offering four of these products at attractive bargain prices. Just listen. Rexall hydrogen peroxide, USP 3%, a pint for only 30 cents. Rexall Epsom salt, Medicinally pure, regular 41 cent pound, now only 27 cents. Rexall mineral oil, extra heavy body, non-habit forming and non-fattening, the regular 69 cent pint, down now to only 46 cents. Alcorex rubbing alcohol compound, top quality, the regular 49 cent pint, yours now for only 32 cents. Remember, these bargains are available all during August at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember this, too. You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, 
starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we can solve any crime but television. Diamond, stop clowning and get right down here. Well, Sergeant Loveloom, what's the matter, Otis? Didn't the zoo pick up your option? Oh, now quit that. You gotta get right down here. Something terrible's happened. They haven't made you commissioner. Worse than that, Lieutenant Levinson's been kidnapped. Diamond to see you, Captain. Hello, Collins. Sure. How are you, Diamond? Uh, Otis just called me about Walt. Now, look, Rick. I know Walt's a personal friend of yours. He's a good friend of mine, too. But this is police business. A cop's been kidnapped. Diamond was a cop for six years. I don't need a case history, Sergeant. Oh, get off it, Charlie. I'm down here to help. Of course you are. But there's one thing I won't stand for, Rick. The way you operate. Well, what's the matter with the way I operate? I know how you feel about Walter. And when a guy feels that strongly about someone, he's liable to do a lot of things to get a few answers. Oh, for Pete's sake, Charlie. What are you going to do, hold a tea party and hope someone will spread some gossip? That's not fair, Rick. Well, if you think I'm going to sit back knowing that Bert Fisher's got... Who Walt... said anything about Bert Fisher? Well, nobody had to say anything. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Walt sent Bert's brother Art to the electric chair. Bert swore he'd get Walt for it. Fisher dies tonight, doesn't he? Yeah. Sure, I think it's Bert Fisher, too. And we're going to do everything about it we can. Bert's been in Detroit, hasn't he? Yeah. I've got a call into Detroit. Should be hearing any time. This phone call you got saying they had Walt. I didn't have time to trace it. The guy hmm. said Walt was being held, and when Art Fisher dies tonight in the chair, so does Walt. Charlie, I'm going to work on this thing whether you like it or not. Yeah, that figures. But I promise you, Rick, I won't save your skin if you get out of line. Hmm. Any leads yet? No. You're rounding up the usual stoolies. Well, I know a couple of boys who might have a few angles. Who? Nobody who would give you any information. These guys aren't stoolies. They might tell me because I think they like me. You see, Charlie, sometimes it pays not to be a cop. I'll expect any information you get, Rick. Oh, sure. Well, I'll see you later. Uh, Rick? Yeah? Be a good boy, will you? Uh, Collins, if we don't find Walt by 11 o'clock, can you hold up Fisher's execution? No. Oh, that's swell. I'll keep in touch. Hey, Diamond, do you think you can do anything? Well, I can try. Do me a favor, Otis. Okay. Get me a complete background on Bert Fisher. Everything. All his friends, his record, as far back as you can go. Gee, Diamond, I'm scared for the lieutenant. You're not alone with that one, Otis. In the Bowery, living in a broken-down rooming house, was a man. Twenty years ago, he'd come to the big city with his trumpet tucked under his arm. He'd started playing with little combinations along 52nd Street, and pretty soon the word got around. Everyone came to listen to him. They called him the Dean of Jazz, and the title stuck. Then one night he had an argument with one of the Fusari mob, and the next morning they found him in an alley, half dead, his face beaten to a pulp. It was a long time before the Dean could get around again, and it was a lot longer before he could play his trumpet. And by then, no one would have him. He couldn't make enough of the horn, so he tried crime. And that's where I met him. I did him a favor, and a short time later, he went straight. He'd still kept his underworld connections, but he he wasn't a stoolie. I'd just done him a favor once. Yeah, who is it? Uh, Richard Diamond. Oh. Hello, Dan. How are you, Dean? Like to see you. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of figured you would. Dean, uh, you ever run into a guy named Fisher? Burke Fisher? How about a drink? No, thanks. Skull. <sighs> oh, man, it's going to be hot today. This, uh, Bert Fisher grabbed Lieutenant Levinson. Says he's going to kill him. <laughs> well, I can't help you. Oh, Dean, I just need one little lead to get started. Yeah, sure. Whew, I wish I had a fan in here. How's business? <laughs> it isn't. Well, I make enough to pay the rent. How about a few bucks to keep you going? Well, I ain't proud, but it won't buy you anything. The lieutenant's a good friend. Yeah, yeah. Word got around this morning. Yeah. Just ten. Buy yourself some groceries. Well, thanks. 
You... You did me a favor once. Forget it. Bert Fisher's got a lot of rough hoods working for him. They're most all from Detroit. But they kill the same as anyone from here. Mm-hmm. Dean, do you know anything at all? I might. Who wants to die? Pretty good. Oh. <laughs> sure, me and Vix. Well, I'll see you around. Yeah, thanks for the tent. Oh, uh, Dean, about 11 o'clock tonight, play a few bars at the funeral march. Oh, uh, Diamond. Yeah? You, uh, you remember this tune, don't you? Diamond, Otis. What'd you find out? Oh, I got reports on everybody we know is connected with Bert Fisher. You want me to read them off? Anybody on that list named Mary? Mary? No. These guys are all named Hallelujah or something. Look, uh, check all of those names and see if Fisher or any one of his boys ever knew a girl named Mary. Then after you do that, I'll... You'll what? Holy smoke. I'll talk to you later. Dean! 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 The Dean had blown his last note. He was sprawled face down on the dirty carpet, clutching the shiny trumpet. The thin line of red was spreading out from a bullet hole in his chest. And the open window sent me across the room in a hurry. I looked out on the fire escape to see a man drop to the alley below. We both fired a split second apart. He staggered as my slug knocked him against the building. And then before I could try again, he disappeared around the corner. I turned, looked down at the dean, and wondered if Gabriel was getting a lesson in jazz. Diamond, I warned you before you left here okay, that I... Okay, okay, Charlie. A nice guy's been killed, but all the crying in the world isn't going to help. Hey, I got something, Diamond. Let's Good see. Good grief. He's got the whole department working for him. Come on, Otis. What have you got? Uh, is it all right, Captain? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I should be in the second-hand business. Report on one of Fisher's old mob, Lou Baxter. Only one of the whole bunch who had a girl named Mary. Mary? Who's Mary? Charlie, look at this picture. Lou Baxter. I've been looking at it all morning. Well, take another look. This is the guy I shot climbing down off the fire escape after he killed the dean. What? Holy smoke. You know where you can pick him up? Oh, he's a local boy, all right. Didn't go back to Detroit with Fisher. I've had a call out him since 10.20 this morning. Hey, what about that girl, Otis? Name's Mary Sinclair. I uh, used to go with Lou Baxter, Captain. No address on it. Mary Sinclair and Lou Baxter, huh? Well, it's the first lead we've had. I'll get the boys on it. Charlie had his methods and I had mine. Otis got in touch with the musicians local, and in half an hour, I had a list of all the places the dean had worked since the union had a record on him. I started checking. Dives, restaurants, jam joints. Questioning owners, bartenders, waiters. No one knew a girl named Mary Sinclair. Around 3 o'clock, I wandered into a place on 52nd Street known as the Red Parrot. Hey. I'm uh, looking for information. You a cop? Private cop. Uh-huh. You, uh, remember a guy who played here last year? Trumpet man, the dean? Sure. Everybody knows the dean. Something wrong? Uh, the dean got himself killed. Oh, no. See, that's too bad. Real nice guy. You ever know a girl named Sinclair? Mary Sinclair? Uh, no. No, I don't think so. Oh, uh, okay. Hey, mister. Yeah? Why don't you ask it? He's the boy with the fingers playing the piano. 
He knew the Dane pretty well. Thanks. You, Ed? Yeah. What can I do for you, Pops? I understand you're a good friend of the Dean's. Sure, we're compatible. But I ain't seen him in a while. You looking for him? No, for a friend of his. A Mary Sinclair. Cute chick. Uh, where can I find her? Why do you want to find her, Pops? Well, the Dean was murdered a few hours ago. She used to live over on 47th Street. 69 West. That was a year ago. You sure about the address? Couldn't forget it. We had a few balls up there. She was kind of a flip. A little combo in here, pretty crazy, too. She used to come in and listen. Real hep on jazz. Knew all the old-timers by name. Like the Dean. Remembered when he was tops, before he got hurt. You ever hear him in those days? Yeah. I played with him a lot. Used to watch him real close sometimes. After hours... The boys would just sit around and blow because it felt like it. The dean used to lean back and close his eyes and blow things like he was getting the word from the other side. It was great. Might have been the greatest. Well, we all got to go on ahead sometime. I guess it ain't so bad, though. The harp's a real wild instrument. I left the piano player and headed for the address he'd given me. There was a good chance Mary Sinclair wasn't living there anymore, but it was the closest I'd come to any kind of a lead. When I got there, I held my breath and looked at the mailbox. Score for Diamond. Miss Mary Sinclair still lived in the building. Ladies, famous beauty expert Ann Delafield says that women don't really need most of the cosmetics they own. You mean I could actually do without all the lotions and creams I buy? Exactly. Ann Delafield says it's nonsense to think a woman needs more than one cream. She has originated a single cream, the Ann Delafield All-Purpose Deep Cream that does everything for you. It's a face cream, a cleansing cream, neck, eye, and throat cream. All creams in one. So good for your skin and so economical, too. Sounds marvelous. Are there other Andelafield cosmetics? Yes, indeed. There are vitamins for added beauty protection, double-duty powder with built-in foundation, and other Andelafield beauty aids to save you time and money, yet give you the very best you can buy anywhere. Well, you've convinced me. I'll be looking for them tomorrow. Then look no further than your nearest Rexall drugstore, the store with the orange and blue sign. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah? Oh, hello. Uh, Mary Sinclair? Yeah. Whatever you're selling, I'll take a dozen. I'd like to talk with you. I'd like you to some other time. I'm busy right now. I'm afraid this can't wait. It'll have to, baby. Give me a call. Plaza 45466, Mr. Uh, Diamond. Okay, doll. Call me tomorrow, huh? You got your foot in the door, honey. Old habit. Can't seem to break it. Well, I'll break it for you, honey. Your whole leg. You'll be sorry, doll. Hmm. All right, baby. Make it quick, huh? What do you want? Let's talk inside. I told you. Yeah, yeah, I know. It was cooler in here. The coolest. But it won't be for long. Where's Lou Baxter? Who? You know, the boy you used to run around with. I ran around with a lot of boys. Ever since I was in grammar school, I ran around with boys. It's a hobby. Where's Lou Baxter? Baby, I don't know. You want to twist my arm? Go ahead, it might be fun. He just killed the dean. He did? Shame on him. Forget it, Mary. Hey, Lou. Get out of the way. That's the guy who put a slug in me. Looked like you're in pretty bad shape, Baxter. Doctor's coming. But he ain't gonna be able to help you. See, honey, you should have come back tomorrow. Shut up. Well, wouldn't have been half so painful. 
I want Bert Fisher. Yeah. Good for you. Get away from that door. Now, walk into that other room. Drop it back to there. Didn't want to play. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, Charlie. I needed him alive. That's gratitude for you. I knew you'd get into trouble, Diamond. So I tailed you from that last bar on 52nd. Is this uh, Mary Sinclair? Charmed, I'm sure. Ought to stay here. Call the wagon. Right. There's a doctor coming up. I doubt if he's legit. Wait for him, then bring him down to the station, Otis. Right. Come on, Miss Sinclair. Sure, honey. You know, Mr. Diamond, I think I'll have to break that date for tomorrow. Here are Baxter's things, Captain. Watch, wallet. Nothing much. Yeah, let's check the wallet. Hmm. Book of matches. Danny's Diner, Route 51. Check on that, Otis. Right. Nothing much in the wallet. Social security, driver's license, some money. money quite a lot of money. Want to take a look? Yeah. No addresses, huh? Here's a ticket to a shoe repair shop. Well, nothing much here that would give us a lead. Mm. Yeah? Danny's Diner is about 160 miles out on Route 51. And guess who runs it? Who? Gino Amalo. That does it. Call the authorities in that area. Right. Gino Amalo. Hmm. Eight years for armed robbery. Used to work for Bert Fisher. Yeah, maybe this is it. What time is it? Uh, going on seven. This better be it. We only have four hours, and you've got to drive 160 miles. Captain Collins talked at the sheriff's office and set up a rendezvous with him near Danny's Diner. Then we piled into a squad car and roared across the 59th Street Bridge for Route 51. Step on it, Otis. We're doing 80 now. 10 to 90. It's getting late. Now, Rick, uh, you think we should bust right in the diner and take Amalo? No. Amalo doesn't know me. Never seen me. You stake out your men around the place and I'll go in. Give me a couple of minutes, then you come in, work on Amalo a little, and then leave. If he knows where Fisher is, you'll try to get in touch and I'll tag him. Uh, yeah, a uh, uh, cup of coffee and a piece of pie. You got raspberry, chocolate, lemon, peach, custard. Oh, uh, raspberry. Yeah. Hmm. Here you are. Uh, where's the closest gas station? About a mile down the road, but I think it's closed. It's after 10, closes at 10. Oh, uh, thanks. Miss? A oh, miss? Yeah. Where's Tino Amalo? In the back. You want him? Call him. Sure. Hey, Mr. Amaro, someone wants to see you. Okay, be right there. Yeah, something I can do. Oh, what are you doing way out here, Captain? This your book of matches? Yeah, that's the name of my place. Huh, these matches on Lou Baxter. Baxter's dead. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, you're not going to tie Baxter up with me, are you? Lots of people come in here and take my matches. If Baxter came in here, you saw him. You're an old friend. Well, sure, I, I know, Lou, but I ain't seen him in years. We got word your old boss is in town, Bert Fisher. Oh, is that right? You know where we might find him? No, I haven't seen Bert in years either. Look, Captain, I've been going straight. Sure. You're uh, a little out of your territory, ain't you? This is unofficial. If you were in my jurisdiction, I'd haul you in. Look, I tell you, I'm going straight. I don't know nothing about Lou Baxter or Burke Fisher. Okay, Amaro. You may hear from me again. Uh, nice seeing you again, Captain. No, uh, miss. More coffee? Yeah. Where's the phone? Right over there on the wall. Is there another one? In the kitchen, but you can't use that. <clears throat> hey, you can't go back there. Honey, it's the police. You stay where you are. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Tino. Let me talk to Fish. I... Hey, what are you doing? Don't move, Amalo. What is this? Cover up that mouthpiece. Cover it up. Okay, okay. Now, when you get Fisher on the line, say what I tell you. And hold that receiver out so I can listen. Look, friend. You I... look. Say one thing wrong, and I'll use this gun. Your cop? None of your business. Well, look, look, I... Yeah, who you want, There he is. Tell him you just heard Baxter was killed. Hello, hello. Tell him, tell him. Uh... Hello. Look, I just uh, just got news that the Baxter was killed. Yeah? Okay, anything else? No, that's all. Uh, no, no, that's all. So what's the matter with you? Uh, nothing, nothing. Okay. You got any more news? Keep in touch. Hang up. Now, 
where's Fisher hiding out? <laughs> Get up. Where's Fisher hiding out? You dirty flat foot. You nearly bust my jaw. Only nearly? Where is he, Amalo? Well, you kill me if I tell you. That's getting late. Are you going to tell me? Okay, to... okay. He's in a cabin about a mile up the road. Come on. You're going to show us. <laughs> Just around that bend. Yeah, we better get out here and walk. How many men has he got in there with him, Chino? Uh, two. Now, whose cabin is it? Mine. Otis, get out and tell the rest of the men to douse the lights and come over here. Right, Captain. Now, uh, here's a piece of paper. Draw us the floor plan of that cabin. Yeah, I'll give you some light. Okay, go ahead, Mello. How many rooms? There's three. Uh-huh. Okay, we're all set, Captain. Okay. One big room with a door here, a kitchen here, and a bedroom here. Well, where's Lieutenant Levinson? I've only been up there once since they got in. He, he was in the bedroom. Now, how about closets, back door? Uh, one closet in the main room here, one in the bedroom here. Let's see, a broom closet in the kitchen and the back door here. Has it got an attic? I no, no. Where's Fisher's car? It parked around the back in the shed. Okay, I'll have the men stake out the place. You're going to take me up there, Amalo? Me? He's going to take us up there. You're a civilian, Rick. If there's any shooting to be done... If there's going to be any shooting, I'm going to be in on it. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who said I was going to take you guys up there anyway? I did. I, did. I told you everything I know. I ain't going to get my head shot off. You're going to walk us up there, Amalo, and you're going to knock on the door. No, 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 no. And no. you're going to get them to open up. Look, they're loaded with artillery, shotguns. When the door opens, you duck. Look, it's suicide. You heard what the captain said, Amalo. I'm a civilian. Without a badge, I'm allowed to get pretty nasty with you. Look, you can't make me do something I don't want. I know my rights, Captain. You know something, Rick? I think I'm catching a cold. I can't hear a thing. All right, now, wait a minute. I'll go check the men. I, uh, trust you'll not take advantage of the prisoner, Rick. I couldn't hear if he yelled or something. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay. Fine cop. All right, let's go. All right, men. Yes, sir. Listen now. I'm going up with Diamond. Three of you take that side of the house. Yes, Three sir. take the other. Yes, sir. You and you go around in the back to the shed where the car is. Yeah. Otis, yeah. you and this man cover the front, but stay out of sight. If it comes, it'll come in a hurry, so close in fast. Yes, and look, boys, the lieutenant's in the back room, so try and be as careful as you can. All set? Yep. Let's go, Amalo. <laughs> front window. Yeah, it's ten minutes of eleven. I hope their watches aren't fast. Keep going, Amalo. Okay, Otis. You two drop here. Right, Captain. Good luck. What are you stopping for, Amalo? I, I just remember they told me to yell if I came up. If you try to pull anything... No, no, no. Honest, honest. They told me to yell. Okay. You stay here. We're going up on that porch. Count twenty, then yell. And play it smart. I won't fool with you, Mallow. Okay, okay, Captain, but I'm scared stiff. You're not alone. Come on, Charlie. Get on that side of the door. Hey, Bert! Bert, it's me, Gino! Hey, Bert, I gotta uh, see you. You alone? Uh, yeah, yeah. Can I come up? It's all right, Animat. Okay, come on up. Get him right. Where are you? Get him. Stop it. One going in the room. Take out. Okay, okay. Don't shoot anyone. I'm hurt. See you, Walt. Okay. Walt? Well, it's about time. Get these ropes off me. You okay, Walt? Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. What time is it? 11 o'clock. Happy birthday. If your vacation plans include some outdoor living, there are two great new Rexall products you should certainly take along. 
One is Rexall Sunburn Cream, a wonderful new soothing lotion that actually forms a protective film over the skin, spreads more evenly and stays on better than ordinary sunburn remedies. The other is Aerosol Fungi Rex, a new spray-on relief from athlete's foot that's easy, quick, and clean. You simply push a button and a greaseless, stainless spray goes direct to the infected area, eliminating messy applications and quickly relieving all the burning misery of athlete's foot. Yes, this year your vacation can be rid of those two summer plagues, sunburn and athlete's foot. Just ask for the new Rexall Sunburn Cream and Aerosol Fungi Rex at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell directed the RKO production Split Second, which is now in release, and his latest film appearance was in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer award-winning The Bad and the Beautiful. Featured in tonight's cast were Wilms Herbert, Bill Johnstone, Sidney Miller, John Stevenson, Arthur Q. Bryan, Virginia Gregg, and Jay Novello. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this time when Rexall Drug Products again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Now, a non-fattening sweetener in granulated form. It's Rexall Sweetenette Sprinkle, the sugar substitute in a shaker. Just sprinkle it on for all the taste and none of the calories. Remember the name, Rexall Sweetenette Sprinkle at Rexall drugstores everywhere. This is the CBS Radio Network. Makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. This is Bill Foreman speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of their own store names. They've done that because they recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Rexall's brand new multivitamin product, Formula V10, is an excellent example. For Formula V10 is a really pleasant tasting, really easy to take product that helps prevent vitamin and iron deficiencies. The recommended daily dosage supplies twice the minimum requirement of vitamin B1, five times the requirement of iron, plus minimum daily requirements of A, D, and B2, plus red crystal and vitamin B12. Ask for pleasant tasting formula V10. That's V as in vitamin. V10 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. The stores with the orange and blue sign. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. (laughs) 
Oh, gee, Diamond, I'm sorry. Did I hurt you? Oh, no, 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 Seymour. I feel great. Oh. Who needs teeth? Come to think of it, though, I might be more comfy down here if you'd lift this desk off my chest. Oh, yeah, sure. There, oh. there you go. Oh, oh well, thanks, thanks. Sorry, I didn't mean to knock you over. Oh, sorry, forget it, forget it. I, I enjoy having my chest crushed as much as the next guy. Okay. Now, the throw I'm going to show you now is called a Japanese shoulder toss. Huh? Uh, look, uh, Seymour, you've convinced me. Judo is a wonderful sport. I... I didn't realize what I've been missing all these years. I, I, I love this sport, judo. Now, what'll it be, canasta or old maid? What? How about hopscotch? Oh, come on, come on. Uh, let me show you just one more throw, huh? Not even if it was with a beanbag. Hey, maybe some wrestling holes in. I know a lot of wrestling stuff. Must be some trick you'd like me to try. No, 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 Seymour. I, I, I really don't believe I... Well, come to think of it, yes, I... There is. A wonderful little trick. Huh? You get yourself a nice long rope, throw it high up into the air. Yeah? And then real quick, you climb way, way up to the top and just disappear. Oh, uh, that's nuts. Oh, I defeated it, huh? What? No. Diamond Detective Agency, brains, experience, enthusiasm, delirium tremens. Greg, don't be so silly. I might have been a prospective client. Oh, hi, sweetie. Hi. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. But you'll have to admit, I, I have got brains and enthusiasm and good looks and a dynamic personality. And my father can beat up your father. Rick, you're incorrigible. No, I'm right here in New York. Oh, that's just dandy. Now, will you please tell me what we're doing tonight? Oh, that, honey, is a long story. I'm comfortable. Well, remember the day we walked into Gimbel's basement and I bumped into an old schoolmate of mine who was demonstrating barbells? <laughs> I remember how funny you looked when he goaded you into picking up that big weight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how hysterical it was when he had to carry me upstairs to the chiropractor. I carried you just like a baby, too, didn't I? Who's that? No, that's him. Muscles. He bicycled all the way over from Jersey just to tell me his ideas on self-defense. He bicycled? Oh, he was dressed for it. Top hat, tail, sneakers. Now, what are you talking about? One of his cleverest ideas was that I'd treat him to dinner tonight if he could knock me to the floor in less than 30 seconds. So? Gave him the battle of his life. Seven seconds. The point is, where can we eat where they'll poison his food? Hey, I heard that. It's all right, Seymour. You can order small helpings. Rick. Let's make it Leon's, baby. Okay? Must we? Will you be an angel and meet us at Leon's? I'll meet you at Leon's. Eight o'clock sharp. Rick, if you keep me waiting. If I keep you waiting, you have a lock of my hair. Eight o'clock. Sharp. Well, I'll see you at Leon's at eight o'clock, huh? Uh, bring lots of money, because I'm a guy that can really eat. Oh, I bet you are. Well, if you arrive there before I do, Seymour, start in on the ferns by the front door. <laughs> Seymour was too stupid to go away mad, but at least he went away. I settled back in my chair and made a half-hearted attempt to figure a face out of the water spot on the ceiling. When I woke up, it was 5 o'clock, and I hated myself for the indulgence. As I sat there, thinking how much my mouth tasted like an old motorman's glove, I heard a noise in the hall on the other side of my door. Well, good afternoon. Something I can do for... Uh, juice bar. Juice bar. Uh, hey. He fell face forward into the pool of blood at his feet, like a wino who'd stumbled into a fountain of muscatel. Funny, isn't it, how an ice pick loses all its homey appeal when it's sticking out of a guy's back? The ice pick this guy was wearing was no exception. I didn't know how long he'd been leaning against my door, but one thing was certain, it was long enough to die. I put in a call to 5th Precinct Police Headquarters and Lieutenant Levinson, and ten minutes later, my office was full of badges. And you have no idea who he is, huh, Rick? Not the vaguest, Walt. Well, the checkup shows you're the only office in the building that's been open after two. So he must have been on his way to see you when he got it from behind. Uh, maybe he was delivering ice and just happened to fall on his ice pick. Otis. Yeah? Otis, now that you've solved it, why don't you go down to the glue factory and let them put you up in nice little glass bottles? Oh. Well, anyway, he has a billfold in his pocket. That ought to tell us something. How about a look, Fatty? Huh? Oh, oh, sure. Here. Hmm. Quite a card collector, wasn't he? Quite. Gold furriers, the copper room, O'Toole's diner. It's lousy food. Got Tomein once from their cheesecake. I remember. I got Tomein just watching you eat it. I resent that. And I accept your apology. Yeah. Huh? Where's that green card from? This one? Yeah. Mm, the Apollo Health Club. 
Hey, that's right down the street. Nothing with the old boy's name on it, though. Afraid not. However, something tells me you'll get that from the old boy's fingerprints. Let's hope so. Ah, a salute you this afternoon to you, sir. Welcome to the Apollo Health Club. May I be of assistance? I'd like to get a massage. Splendid. <laughs> Performs wonders after a fatiguing day. A veritable balm to the chafed tissues of the body. But will it cure snow blindness? I beg your pardon? No, oh, just ignore me. I'm a little chewed up today. I assume you're referring to a state of mind. Well, not altogether. Got a kink at my back that isn't entirely mental. Well, at least you've come to the proper place. A measure of skillfully applied anatomical science will regenerate the damaged musculature in no time. Oh, Byron? Mr. O'Brien, front, please. One of my best masseurs. Oh, you're the owner, huh? <laughs> I am, sir. Let me introduce myself. Emerson Van Arter, Doctor of Anatomical Science. Richard Diamond. A pleasure. A uh, nice layout you have here. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Five years of assiduous study in Switzerland under the illustrious Dr. Von Seppeville has given me a boundless knowledge of the human mechanism. As a consequence, of course... Can uh, you call me, Doctor? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Oh, by, oh Byron, I did. <laughs> uh, Mr. Diamond here wishes a massage. Sure, fine. I'll speak to you later, Mr. Diamond. Right this way, sir. Remember, the blood tore the heart. Always tore the heart. A real private detective, huh? Uh, Too private, judging from last month's receipts. (laughs) Hey, you know you really rubbed that kink out of my back? Good. Don't know if you noticed it, but I was doing all my rubbing with my right arm. Tore a muscle on my left shoulder this morning. Really put it out of commission. Oh, that's too bad. Speaking of things being out of commission reminds me. There's a body down at the morgue I'd like you to take a look at. Guy might have been a client of yours. Well, what makes you think that? Had a card from the Apollo Club in his billfold. Oh? Uh, when could you come down? Uh, how about tonight? We close here at 10. Fine. Make it, uh, what about 10.30? Know where the morgue is? Yeah. Now, how'd this guy die, anyway? Well, somebody hid their ice pick in his spinal column. No kidding. Yeah. The corpse is a little dark complexioned man. Kinky hair, glasses, bald spot on the top of his head. Hey, that description fits a guy who comes in here every night around closing time. Fanatic on diet, he buys wheat germ from us by the case. Know his name or where he lives? Oh, I know that he's... Uh, pardon the intrusion, gentlemen, but I'm afraid I'll have to ask Mr. O'Byron to hire you down to the gymnasium. Oh, sure, right away, sir. Uh, here's a fresh towel, Mr. Diamond. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt like this, but we are a trifle understaffed, and expediting the evening rush is something of a problem. It's quite all right. Talk to you later tonight, Mr. Diamond. All right. Oh, hey, in case you can't make it, give me a buzz at Leon's restaurant. I'll be there till a quarter of nine. Right. <laughs> Monsieur Diamond. Hello. Bonsoir, bonsoir. Hello, Leon. Par ici, par ici. Yes. Which translated in English means? Right this way. <laughs> Both my guests arrived? Oui. First the young lady, then a few minutes later the uh, gymnast. Uh, but, uh, uh, Monsieur Diamond, a telephone call is waiting for you. Oh, thanks, thanks, Leon. Hello, Diamond speaking. Hello, Mr. Diamond. This is Red O'Byron down at the Apollo Club. Oh, yeah, O'Byron. Hey, listen, you got to come down here right away. I really stumbled into something. Yeah? What's that? Can't tell you over the phone. Just get down here. Drop everything and get down here. Hurry. Look, uh, Red, I'm right in the middle of a... Hello? 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 Oh. Hey, kids, I gotta run. Be back in a few minutes. Just where do you think you're going? Place called the Apollo Club. Yeah? Well, how about my dinner? Uh, go, go right ahead and order. I'll be back. Oh, uh, by the way, Seymour, that potato salad on the child's plate is a real deal for a quarter. And Helen? Yes, Rick? Shoot the kill if he even suggests wrestling. I walked out of Leon's, flagged down a cab, and spent the trip back to the Apollo Club, wondering what Red O'Byron was so worked up about and why he'd hung up on me. As my cab started to swing in toward the curb, I got that lousy feeling again, and I decided... Definitely, it was not one of Leon's martinis, but rather the large white ambulance parked in front of the Apollo Health Club. I was halfway up the steps of the club when Dr. Van Arter appeared in the doorway. Oh, oh good evening, Mr. Diamond. This, this is terrible, terrible. What is? We, 
We've had an accident. Red O'Byron? Uh, yes. Oh, terrible. I, like losing a son. Losing? He's dead? Yes. yes. He, he, he was performing a handstand on the rings in the gymnasium when he slipped and fell. Broke his neck. <laughs> Now, Rexall's pharmaceutical laboratories announce a brand new vitamin product, Rexall 5X Vitamins. They're called 5X because each tablet supplies five times the daily requirement of all vitamins with known minimums. What's more, each tablet contains five micrograms of red crystalline B12. Right now, your Rexall family druggist is introducing this new vitamin product with a special offer. He will give you free of extra cost a 10-day trial supply of 5X vitamins when you purchase the regular bottle of 50 tablets. Try 5X vitamins for 10 days. And if you're not completely satisfied, simply return the unopened bottle of 50 and your full purchase price will be refunded. Ask for the regular 50-tablet bottle and 10-day trial bottle of Rexall 5X vitamins, both just $6.95 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. The stores with the orange and blue sign. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, hello, Otis. Is the lieutenant around? Yeah, he's around, so what? Otis, did you ever think how silly you'd look hanging from your thumbs? Ah, oh, go soak your head. You mean that's how you shrunk yours? Ooh. Well, now, isn't that a coincidence? Is it? I was just thinking how peaceful it is around the precinct when you're not. Yeah. You shut up, you. Uh, you tell him, Fatty. How would you like to... I'd like a little information, if you don't mind. I'd like you to see what facts you can scare up on the guy who runs the Apollo Health Club. His name is Van Arthur. If I remember right, the stiff we hauled away in front of your office today... Had a card from the Apollo Club in his billfold. You remember right. And we found out his name was Rudy Lubin. Narcotics has a file on him that goes forever. How about the ice pick? Any fingerprints? None. Well, that's always a help. I should say. Personally, I think Otis did it. Think I did what? You see, Walter, typical pathological reaction. What do you mean? Oh, don't worry, Otis. We won't let them hang you, right, Walt? Right. Not as long as we have a rope and a tree. No. Hey, what's up? Who are you calling? Leon's restaurant. Helen's over there breathing with her diaphragm. And Seymour... Oh, you don't know him, but he's tearing phone books apart. Good evening, Leon. Oh, hello, Leon. This is Richard Diamond. My friend's still there? We? Oui. They are waiting for you, no? They're waiting for me, yes. Let me speak to the noisy one with the biceps, will you? Oui, bien entendu. What's all this about? It's about a guy who got stabbed in front of my door. A masseur named O'Byron who got his neck broken doing tricks on the rings and something that O'Byron mentioned earlier. Hello, hello. Uh, Seymour? Uh, where are you, anyway? We've been waiting an hour. That's not the point. The point is, I want you to listen to me. Could a guy do a handstand on the rings if he had a torn muscle in his shoulder? Are you kidding? I'm very serious. Heck no, he couldn't. It's impossible. Shoulder muscles are the ones that do all the work. Deltoids, trapezius, upper pecs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Look, Seymour, you got to do me a favor. Beat me in front of the Apollo Health Club as soon as you can get there. Well, how about your girlfriend? Tell her to wait there till I come for her. Well, okay, then. Only, what are we going to do? Trap a murderer. I hung up, assured Lieutenant Levinson that I was just going to do a little reconnaissance work and then left for the Apollo Club. Seymour was waiting when my cab drew up in front. I explained to him the part I wanted him to play. Just leave it to me. If this doctor's a phony, I'll find out for you. Let's go. <laughs> Hello again, Mr. Diamond. Doctor? I just talked to the O'Byron boys' family. Oh, it was heartrending, ab absolutely heartrending. I... <laughs> I almost broke down. No, you will before it's over. Hmm? I'd like you to meet a friend of mine, Seymour Caper. Uh, a pleasure, sir. What do you say, Doc? Seymour's been having a little trouble with his chest lately. I told him you were a doctor of... Uh, uh, anatomical science. Yeah, and that you could undoubtedly do him some good. Very kind of you. There's something to do with my muscles here. You know anything about them? Muscles are what an anatomical scientist knows most about. Oh, swell, swell. The doctor studied all about muscles in Switzerland. Oh? Uh -huh. <laughs> Just what seems to be the trouble. Well, here's the deal, Doc. It all started the other day when I was working out with my barbells. I was doing an exercise for my trapezius when all of a sudden I got a spasm in my tensor fascia. 
So I bent over to set the barbell down on the floor, and that's when the pain hit me. First in my pectoralis minor, then in my intercostals, and finally in my diaphragm. A kind of spasmodic contraction like when you get the hiccups. Only, no hiccups. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Uh, oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. A, a spasmodic contraction. Of the uh-huh. diaphragm. Only no hiccups. And then my abdominals began tightening until I could hardly expel my rib cage. Oh. That's when I called Diamond here. Uh, I see. Yes, yes, quite naturally. Uh, if you'll pardon me a moment, I'll see if I uh, can... Yeah, but uh, wait a minute. I haven't told you about my rhomboids. His rhomboids seem to be completely out of whack. Beg your pardon? Well, it must be either my rhomboids or my dorsal spinalis. Awful pain right between my shoulder blades. What do you figure it is, Doc? Well, actually, a hasty diagnosis isn't uh, feasible. Huh? I, I really couldn't... Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, you just put your hand on my left rhomboid and feel how naughty it is, huh? Hey, left rhomboid. Yeah, go ahead, feel it. It's right under the middle trapezius, Doc. You know where that is. Please, please, Seymour. Don't insult the doctor. Any old quack knows where that is. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Middle trapezius. Uh, oh, oh, great Scott. I'd almost forgotten. I left a client under the sun lamp. <laughs> Pardon me, gentlemen. I'll be back in a much... Uh, a moment. Hmm. Have a hunch he's heading straight for an anatomy chart. Yeah, you're not kidding. That guy's as funny as the title he uses. Doctor of Anatomical Science, my glorious. Mine too. Come on. I took Seymour by his rhomboid and led him out onto the street, down to the middle of the block and up three flights to my office. While I did my thinking, Seymour did his push-ups. 302. 303. Well, Seymour, we know three things. Oh, Byron couldn't have been exercising on the rings with an injured shoulder. Five right. And the doctor's a phony. Six right. Then the doctor is a, is a front for something that's important enough to kill people over. Three hundred and right eight. As a consequence, you and I are burglars. And right, what? Starting as soon as the Apollo Club closes. But you mean we're going to bust into the joint? We're going to bust into the joint or flatten your head in the attempt. Seymour, you opened that window beautifully. Uh, thanks. Remind me to autograph your biceps later. Hey, uh, this detective business is dangerous, ain't it? Oh, yes, yes, but think of the advantages. Long hours, no time for meals, and on a good day, a guy can pick up as high as two or three hundred bullets in his back. I don't like it. Go on, crawl in. Okay, okay. Don't push! I followed Seymour in, and we waited a minute for our eyes to get accustomed to the darkness. Then we moved cautiously down the stairway to the first floor. I had no idea what I was looking for, but Dr. Van Arthur's office was the first place where I tried to find it. I had a door's locked. You want it opened? Well, of course I do, Seymour. Use your head. Okay. <laughs> Seymour would be pulling plywood out of his scalp for the next week, but it got us in. I took the place apart, but came up with a big fat nothing. So we left the office and headed down the hall toward the back of the building. Hey, look. What's the matter? It's a fruit juice bar. Oh, boy, am I thirsty. Well, go mix yourself up a... Juice bar? Juice bar, that's it. Yeah, good stiff belt of celery juice, No, no, no. This is what the little man who was stabbed outside my office was gasping about when he died. A juice bar. Come on. Nothing but juice. Oh, I wonder what's in this cupboard under the counter. Is it locked? Yeah. Think you can pull it open? <laughs> Just watch me. Ah, you see? See more. Yeah. Will you marry me? I'll give you a belt and a solar plexus. Later, huh? Right now, let's see what's in this cupboard. Uh, you got a match? I don't smoke. That's all right. I found one. Well, what do you know about that? Nothing but cans of wheat germ. Hey, you know what that stuff is, don't you? I know that the masseur who got killed here told me that the guy who died in front of my office bought it up by the case. Hand me a can, will you? Sure. Here. <laughs> His stuff is full of vitamins, you know. You want a handful? Oh, uh, no, thanks. Yeah. Well, it must be some extra special brand. Never tasted anything like this before. Chew a little louder, Seymour. We can dance to it. Hey. <laughs> hey, that really hits the spot, man. 
Hey, you want to wrestle? Oh, quiet, Seymour. <laughs> you know what, boy? I can fly. Seymour. I can fly, I tell you, see? Oh, man, do I ever love to fly. While Seymour stood there flapping his arms, I stuck my nose into the can he was holding. Uh-huh. Once you've smelled opium, you can always recognize the aroma, even when it's mixed with wheat germ. I was trying to decide what to do with Seymour when he slid slowly to the floor under the counter and rocked out. I loosened his collar and then started for a telephone. Leaving, Mr. Detective. Uh, wow. Doctor, working late? <laughs> I'm glad I arrived in time to offer you a drink of fruit juice. Well, thanks loads, but I'm driving. Where you're going, Mr. Detective, the weather is too hot for driving. Now, isn't that a nasty thing for a guy who sticks ice picks in people to say? Oh, that was a most unpleasant experience, I assure you. It's just that Mr. Lupin began demanding a little too high a percentage for distributing my uh, <laughs> health foods. Even went so far as to threaten me with exposure. So you grabbed up an ice pick from your juice bar and followed him out of the club? Mm-hmm. I doubt if he ever knew what hit him. Oh, I bet he had a hunch. Well, huh? I I perceive that you've sampled my wheat germ. Oh, I opened a can or two. Personally, I never touched the stuff without bananas and cream. You've made the same unfortunate discovery that Red O'Brien made, Mr. Detective. Oh, that's why he called me at Leon's. Yes, and that's also why I had to resort to the unsportsmanlike expedient of luring him to the balcony of the gymnasium. And then pushing him over, head first. I was about to call the doctor a particularly dirty name when Seymour's hulking shoulders loomed up behind the juice bar, not over three feet from where the doctor was standing. Doctor, you're wrong. Seymour is not a sissy. What? I don't think you could beat up Seymour with one hand. That's why. Mr. Diamond, I'm afraid you're asking to be shot. Yeah, well, just to try it. Who said... <laughs> <laughs> I'll teach him to call somebody who knows how to fly a sissy... Yeah, we, we, but very angry. Look, Leon, you got to do something for me. We? Tell the violinist to get his big, fat Stradivarius over to where she's sitting. And quick. We. Immediately. Hello, Miss Asher. Oh, come on, sweetie. I've had a rough night subduing murderers, opium eaters. At least you could do is say hello. Hello. I, uh, like that song, don't you? Look, I know all about you and your little violin bit. Huh? I saw Leon pointing us out to the violinist. He did? Mm-hmm. And where, may I ask, is little Seymour? Little Seymour ate too many goodies. He's having his stomach pump. Oh, now that's sweet. I think so. I think the song is nice, too. I think you should sing it, too. I think I should, too. Hold me close and hold me fast The magic spell you cast This is la vie en haut. When you kiss me, heaven sighs And though I close my eyes I see la vie en haut. When you press me to your heart I'm in a world apart a world where roses bloom And when you speak, angels sing from above Everyday words seem to turn into love song Give your heart and soul to me And life will always be La vie Nothing? Hmm? I won't say. Want to feel my biceps? All right. Well? Nothing. Here's a way to lose up to five pounds a week and lose where it shows. Yes, friends, I'm talking about the new Ann Delafield reducing plan. Today, there's simply no reason for any woman, or man either, 
to be handicapped by ugly fat. With a scientific and Delafield reducing plan, losing weight is easy. It's fun. You don't starve. You don't count calories. There are no drugs. No unbalanced dieting. Why put up with those dangerous extra pounds a moment longer? Ask for the Ann Delafield Reducing Plan today at any Rexall drugstore. And overweight men, here's wonderful news for you. Rexall has just introduced a brand new men's product for the first time anywhere. The Delafield Reducing Plan for men. Look young, feel young. Stay young for your age with a plan tailor-made for you at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Harvey Easton with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell directed the RKO production Split Second, which is now in release. And his latest film appearance was in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer award-winning The Bad and the Beautiful. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Arthur Q. Bryan, Wilms Herbert, Bill Conrad, Jay Novello, and Dan O'Herlihy. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this time when Rexall Drug Products again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Enjoy quick, cooling relief from sunburn with Rexall Sunburn Cream. It's a new, soothing lotion that actually forms a protective film over the skin. Spreads better. Stays on longer than ordinary sunburn remedies. Take the burn out of sunburn. Try Rexall Sunburn Cream. It's at Rexall drugstores everywhere. This is the CBS Radio Network. Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Oh, pardon me. Huh? You know where I might find Mr. Richard Diamond? You want to hire him? Yes. Well, stop being Sebastian, friend. Come in, come in. Thank you. You're Mr. Diamond? Well, any resemblance to the Irish washerwoman is purely intentional. Do you always do your own laundry? Always. Keeps my petty cash from looking too petty. Sit down, Mr. Uh... Baxter. Clay Baxter from Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Clay Baxter from Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Was a man, I guess, to be in his early 50s. Straight up, he crowded six foot three, counting the two-inch heels on his handmade boots. Looking at him, I thought of an old Remington print and suddenly felt like singing a chorus of Home on the Range. I'd like you to come to Oak Mulvey with me, Mr. Diamond. Well, why, Mr. Baxter? My brother was killed yesterday. The sheriff and the coroner said it was an accident. I don't believe it. How did you happen to look me up? I raise cattle, Mr. Diamond. I do a great deal of business in Chicago and New York. I wanted a detective with experience, someone with a good reputation. Bless you. I called a friend on Wall Street, and he recommended several men. One of them was you. I checked your background. I'm satisfied. Oh, good. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. Chicken feed. I'll pay it, and if you catch the man who done it, I'll give you a thousand dollar bonus. Oh, well, no, I I can't leave right away. It'll take me at least five minutes to get my affairs in order. <laughs> Yeah, I can certainly see you appreciate a buck. <laughs> Mr. Baxter, I appreciate a buck like a Texan appreciates Texas. Texas? Never heard of it. How was your brother supposed to have been killed? Thrown from his horse. Skull fracture. And you don't believe it? I do not. Why? Too good a horseman. Well, it could have happened. Well, if it did, he'd have taken the fall right. Might have busted something, but wouldn't have killed him. Anything else? His wife. My brother was a wealthy man, Mr. Diamond. His wife will inherit everything. Ranch, cattle, all worth about eight or ten million. You think she had something to do with his death? 
You tell me, Mr. Diamond. I called Helen, told her I was off to Oak Mulgee, promised I'd send her a couple of Navajos or whatever they had out there. Then I took Clay Baxter over to my flat and threw a few things into a suitcase. <coughs> Oklahoma's dry. So's Richard Diamond. Might get arrested. I don't want to leave it here. Wouldn't make any difference if it was empty, would it? No. Got a couple of glasses? A fifth usually adds up to a full evening, but that's only when Clay Baxter isn't around. When he poured one for the road, the water line receded six inches. I had a quick one, and he finished it. Uh, how'd that soldier? How do you feel? Oh, lively. Why don't we forget the plane? You just start running for the window and I'll climb on. <laughs> Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Population 17,091, according to the last census, and very hot in August. Baxter's station wagon's waiting at the airport, and the driver took us into town where I was introduced to the local law. This here is Sheriff Billings. How are you, Sheriff? Jim, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective from New York. Howdy, Diamond. Howdy. Private detective, huh? Oh, I've been called other things. Still ain't satisfied, huh, Clay? Not yet. And you ain't either, and you know it, Jim. How about it, Sheriff? You think Mr. Baxter's brother was killed deliberately? Coroner says it was an accident. Hit his head on a rock. That ain't what Mr. Diamond asked. Well, Will Baxter was a pretty good rider, but he could have been thrown. Yeah, I don't... All the evidence says he was. Could see plain where his horse bolted. What could have made his horse shy? Snake, maybe. Not that horse, and you know it, Jim. Well, maybe stepped in a chuck hole. He was limping right bad when he got back to the barn. No signs of anyone else near the body? Well, when I got there, some of Will's boys had already ridden out. Who found him? A couple of old miners. Luke and Phineas Merriweather. Well, let's go out to the ranch, Mr. Baxter, and take another look at the spot where your brother died. Will Baxter's ranch is 40 miles from here, Mr. Diamond. Maybe you'd like to go out to my place and freshen up a bit first. <laughs> You go ahead and shave and shower. I'm going to go build me a drink. Hey, this is quite a place, Mr. Baxter. Glad you like it. Take a swim in the pool if you'd want, but watch out for the catfish. Catfish? Well, I'm a bachelor. Don't use the pool much, and I don't usually have guests. Love catfish for dinner, so I keep them in the pool. I caught a guy who wants floating bodies in his bathtub. Don't say. Funny, Harvey. I showered and shaved and met Baxter out by the pool where he was feeding his catfish. I watched a pound of liver disappear like leachy nuts in the tongue war. And we all headed back to town where we picked up Sheriff Billings. Forty miles later, we pulled up in front of the late Will Baxter's ranch. A little different architecture, but just as impressive as my clients. Afternoon, Sheriff. Oh, Wilma. Afternoon, Wilma. Wilma, this here is Mr. Richard Diamond. Wilma Baxter, my brother's wife. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Diamond? Private detective. Come up from New York. Oh? Well, why don't we all go in the house? It's too hot out here. Uh, Mr. Diamond wants to go out and look at the spot where Will got himself killed. Certainly. Have one of the boys fix you up with some horses. When you're done, why not stop back for dinner? Uh, Mr. Diamond's eating with me, and he's going to be pretty busy for a while. Now, I'll give you a rain check, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, thank you. I'd like you to tell me about New York. It's been a long time, and I've almost forgotten what it's like. Let's go, Jim. It's getting late. Bye, Mr. Diamond. Nice meeting you. Goodbye, Mrs. Baxter. Seems all broken up, don't she? Yeah. Where was she when her husband got killed? Perfect alibi. In town all day. A lot of people saw her. Mighty fine-looking woman. Mighty. We all rode down to the stables, and one of the hands saddled up three horses, and we started out across the open desert. For a man who had spent all his life riding around in taxi cabs, the experience was just short of agonizing. Just up ahead, Diamond. Swell. Never rode much, did you? No, I always bounce like this. Like to make my money belt jingle. Uh, well, here it is. Whoa. Yeah, whoa. Oh. Oh. Well, here's where they found the body. Now, uh, uh, what did he hit his head on? That rock right there. Mm -hmm. Did you take an impression of the wound to see if it matched? Nope. Well, why not? Never thought about it. Well, that's a pretty good reason. Anyway, let's dig that rock.
truck out and take it back with us. I spent the next minutes limping around looking for something and came up with nothing except a longing for a hot Epsom salts bath. We dug up the large rock and took it back with us to Wilma Baxter's ranch. Howdy, Sheriff. Howdy, Frank. This here is Mr. Diamond, Frank. Diamond, this is Frank Kelly, the ranch foreman. Howdy. Detective fella, huh? Miss Baxter told me about you. Said you was doing some investigating. Yes, sir. Scientific investigation. The way the city boys do it. What you going to do with that raw? A hopscotch. Oh, uh, on second thought, I, I think we'll take turns untying the knots in my back. Good warm shower and you'll feel fit as a fiddle. Well, I got a good start. I'm shaped like one. You'll find it a little bit rough out here, Diamond. Oh, I'll get used to it, Mr. Kelly. I hope you're right. Ain't much like the big city. Oh? Just what is the big city like, Mr. Kelly? I ain't never been there. Just what I've noticed. Looks like a man can get pretty soft living in the city. Mm, well, I'd like to show you where I was brought up sometime, Mr. Kelly. We never got around to playing cowboy, though. We were too busy kicking each other's teeth out. See you later, Mr. Baxter. So long, sir. I, I don't think Frank likes you, Diamond. Uh, well, what about Will Baxter's horse? I can take a look at him. Right over there in that stall. Really pulled up lame. Oh, good horse. Never figured to shy at anything. Man, look at that. Mm. His hip's swollen. Yeah, he really twisted something. <laughs> Steady, boy. Steady. Hey, that looks like an infection. Yeah, it's a funny thing. It kind of does. What are you getting at, Mr. Diamond? Oh, I'm not getting into thing, Mr. Baxter. I just said it looked like an infection. Yeah, we better tell Mrs. Baxter or Frank. Have someone take care of it. Tell me, uh, boys, if you jabbed a horse with something, would that make him bolt? Come on, I want to get back to town and talk with the coroner. Now, look here, Jim. Ain't my word good enough? Why, sure it is, coroner. But Clay hired Mr. Diamond to do some investigating. And he's doing it. Clay, I tell you, your brother died from natural causes. I don't think so. But if you insist, I'll show this detective fella the body. I want the head wound matched with this rock. Okay, but the mortuary ain't gonna like it. They got him already to bury. The coroner led me across the street and into a funeral parlor where I took a look at the late Will Baxter. Six years with the fifth precinct homicide and a couple of dozen killings should have conditioned me. But like always, the first look shakes something loose in the middle of my stomach, and I have to keep swallowing hard. Looks right natural, don't he, Clay? Yeah. They do a good job here. And uh, bully for them. And he hit his head right here. Concussion, plain and simple. No other marks or bruises? Mm, no. Nope. While the coroner rolled the late Will Baxter into one of the back rooms and made a comparison with the head wound and the rock we'd brought in from the ranch, we went out on the front porch for some air. I lit a cigarette and thought about an old case I'd worked on five or six years before. You got a cigarette? Sure, Doc. Pick a uni, all right? Mm. Funny thing. Head wound doesn't match the rock. Sure doesn't. Mm. Wound is too deep. Rock's round and flat. Nothing sticking up to go that deep. Then I want an autopsy. Why? Fracture still killed him. No, I doubt it. When someone plans a murder, they don't count on one blow to do the trick. Bet there's nothing else that could have done it. Well, nothing you can see. I've met someone here in Oak Mulgee that I'm pretty sure is wanted for another killing very similar to this. Now, Doc, go make that autopsy and fast. You think maybe you found something, Diamond? You, you think Will was killed deliberately? Maybe, but we'll have to wait for the autopsy. In the meantime, I'd like to go out and visit those two old-timers. Luke and Phineas? That's right, Sheriff. Well, it's my dangerous. Come on, I'll take you out. Uh, you better wait here for the report. Mr. Baxter and I will go on out. All right, you can use my horses, so you won't have to go all the way back to the ranch. Horses? Well, the Merriweather is on the other side of town, out oh. about ten miles, no roads. Oh, horses, ten miles. I may never play kick the can again. <laughs> Take the horses, do you, Diamond? Uh, uh, maybe if you could find me a nice, long, thin one. <laughs> Holy Ike. Whoa, 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 steady. That's one of the Merryweathers. Well, let's get out of here. Come on, horse. 
Now, come on, I'm yellow, and I admit it. Now, it's, it's okay, Diamond. That's just the boy's way of letting you know not to come any farther, unless they say so. Oh, uh, swell greetings. What happens now? Hey, up there! Luke! In here! Aren't you a... It's Clay Baxter. I got a friend here who wants to talk to you. Ain't it? Yeah, Luke? Hey, Baxter. Got some friend who wants to palaver. I don't feel like palavering. Better shoot him. Giddy up. Just take it easy. Take it easy. They always act like this. Penny don't want to palaver. I got to shoot you if you don't promote. It's important. About my brother. Penny? Yeah, Luke? About his brother, the dead one we found the other day. Oh, all right, I guess. Let one of them come up. Baxter? Here, yeah, Luke. Send your friend on up. And up I went, leaving my better judgment running off across the desert. I climbed a small hill and found myself standing at the entrance of an old mine shaft. Luke and Phineas and Merriweather stood on either side, shotguns ready, pointed right at my chest. Start talking. Well, uh, uh, gentlemen, my, my name is Diamond. Don't pay no import to names. What do you want? Just wanted to ask some questions about the man you found the other day. You a policeman? Well, kind of. Shoot him. Oh, now, 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 wait a minute. I'm not a real policeman. Then what are you? I'm a, I'm a private detective. Luke? Yeah. What's the matter? It's an honest profession. A fellow's got to make a living. You a real live private detective? Well, I'm a private detective. The real live part I'm depending on. Well, my goodness gracious. Come on in and have some vittles. Huh? Why, mister... Me and Finney read all them stories about you fellas. Uh-huh. We filled up one whole tunnel with old detective magazines. You fellas really are something. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Let's see your badge. Oh. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. There you are. Oh, me? Yes, sir. Well, I'll be dogged. Come on in, friend. Come on in, in. I'd like to ask you some questions about this here Dick Tracy fella. Well, one minute I'd face two shotguns, the next I was turned into an honored guest. I had coffee and biscuits with Luke and Phineas and answered enough questions about the private detective business to fill a dime knob of my own. I squeezed in enough questions to find out that the boys hadn't seen or found anything unusual when they discovered Will Baxter's body. Four cups of coffee and a dozen biscuits later, I bid the Merryweathers a fond farewell and return to Clay Baxter. They loved you? Oh, worshipped me. Hmm. They're starting a Richard Diamond fan club. Well, did you find out anything? No. Uh, well, give me your hand. I'll help you up on your horse. Oh, couldn't I just walk back? Come on, horse. Hold still. Steady, boy. <laughs> Clay Baxter, sitting in his saddle, had leaned down and grabbed my hand to help me up on my horse, and that was when he got it. His horse took out with the wounded man still up and hanging on. I booted my horse in the ribs. Oh! <laughs> I took off after Baxter like citation on a good day. I closed my eyes, prayed a little, and tried to remember every jockey I'd ever seen before. Suddenly, I looked up and spotted Baxter's horse dead ahead, standing still and right in my path. Whoa! Well, I guess it's just my time. If I don't die from this bullet I got in me, I'm going to do it from laughing. <laughs> How is he, Doc? Oh, he'll be all right. Collarbone. Didn't break anything. How do you feel, Mr. Diamond? Uh, crippled. Any idea who shot Clay? No. Clay said he thought it might have been the Merriweather boys. Oh, uh, I, I, no, it couldn't have been. Why not? Well, the Merriweather boys use shotguns, not rifles. What about that autopsy, Doc? Well, come on, what about it? You was right. Will Baxter didn't die from a skull fracture. What was it? I don't know what was used for sure. A long, thin instrument. Whoever did it pulled the lower eyelid down, killed Will Baxter by jabbing something through the eye into his brain. Probably hit him over the head to knock him off the horse and then got down and made sure. Yeah, and then jabbed his horse in the flank to make him bolt. Nasty way to kill him, man. Eh? That's been done before. It's not a man's way of killing. 
Wilma Baxter was in town all day. When Clay comes around, tell him I borrowed his station wagon. Going out to see Wilma? Going out to her ranch. I want to take another look at Will Baxter's lame horse. And Doc, I want to borrow a pair of surgical probes. I climbed into the station wagon, and close to an hour later, pulled up on the side of the road. The gate to the ranch house was another hundred yards up ahead. So I piled out, climbed the tall white fence, and slipped into the barn. <laughs> Steady, fella. Steady. Steady. The horse's left flank was still swollen, very close to a serious infection. I ran my hand over the spot. <laughs> Steady, boy. There was something still stuck in the flesh, so I used the surgical probes and prayed the horse wouldn't kick my brain out. Oh, oh. Steady, boy. Steady. There. Sorry, fellow. I didn't know you were a vet, Mr. Diamond. Huh? Oh, good evening, Mrs. Baxter. You know, in this part of the country, you can get shot for horse stealing. Oh, not stealing. Just taking this out of your horse's flank. What is it? That's a piece of a long needle. Might be a hat pen or something. I think you'd better tell me what this is all about. Oh, certainly. Your, uh, your husband was murdered. That's impossible. Uh, suit yourself, but he was. Somebody hit him over the head, knocked him from his horse, jabbed this needle into his eye, then jabbed it into the horse's flank so the horse would pull up lame, look like he'd shied. The killer tried to shoot me this evening, but he missed and got Clay Baxter instead. And who do you think did this? I don't know. The method doesn't fit a man. A woman, then? Well, the blow on the back of the head rules out a woman. Too much force. What have you got left? What I started with. A man. And a woman. It's a very interesting theory. Mm-hmm. You're uh, from New York, aren't you? I've been there. I thought so. Your face is familiar. I haven't been in New York in at least ten years, Mr. Diamond. Oh, funny. Well, I've got to go out to the Merriweathers. Are those two old miners who found my husband? Mm-hmm. They saw the murderer. What? Yeah, that's why I know how it was done. I was out there earlier, and I've got to go back after a sworn statement. Well, why didn't they speak up before this? Afraid. Said it was none of their business. See you later, Mrs. Baxter. Have another biscuit, Inspector. Uh, uh no thanks, fellas. Ten's plenty. No. Uh, so, uh, Will Baxter was murdered, huh? That's right, and Mrs. Baxter thinks you two saw who did the killing. Gonna lay a trap, huh? Yes, Luke, gonna lay a trap. Mm. Now, look, I remembered Mrs. Baxter from someplace the first time I saw her. Then when I found out how the murder was committed, I recalled a case very similar back in New York. Man was hit over the head, pushed down a flight of stairs, and his brain pierced by a hat pen. A man actually did it, but a woman planned it. The man was caught, but uh, the woman disappeared. Why'd they do it? Uh, the victim was insured. They wanted to make it look like an accident. Well, come on, we better spread out. We should have company pretty soon. The two old timers took off their coats and gave me some beat up pants, which I stuffed with pillows and blankets. In five minutes flat, I had two dummies sitting with me at the little table. You think they'll fall for it? Well, you can't tell, but uh, you two go on outside and wait until somebody comes in. I just want him to try for one of the dummies. Well, what if he tries for you? Killjoy. Luke and Phineas took their place outside the mine, and I smoked a dozen cigarettes, and then I heard someone coming in, moving quietly up the tunnel toward the light. I played it big. Well, that, uh, that's fine, Phineas. Uh, now, if you'll just sign this statement... I rolled, and the dummy that represented Phineas Merriweather doubled over from the force of the slug. He shot again, and Luke's dummy toppled. I kicked the lamp out before he got around to yours truly. Two down and one to go, Diamond. I'm afraid I got a big surprise for you, friend. I ain't worried. You should be. That wasn't even close. You're a lousy shot. Yeah? You missed earlier this evening and got Clay Baxter instead. I'll make up for it. No, you won't, train. Stop it. Uh -oh, uh -oh. You heard him, drop it. Oh, okay, all right, don't you? Wait a minute. Where'll I get the light? Yeah. Well, hey, it's a Kelly fella. Yeah, you're getting way out of line for a ranch foreman, Kelly. <laughs> Give it to him, Mr. Diamond. Who had you kill Will Baxter? 
You know, Kelly, you said something today about getting soft in the city. Wonder just how soft I've gotten. Maybe you'd like to find out. Turn him loose, boys. Yes, sir. Go on now, go to it, Mr. Diamond. I don't like getting shot at. It makes me real unhappy when anyone runs around killing people. No, uh, 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 stop him, do it. Shut up, Finney, and let him fight. Now, now, Kelly, why'd you kill Will Baxter? Well, my Baxter talked me into it, promised me a share of the ranch. And for that, you killed a man, huh? It's a big ranch. Oh, get up. Sure hate to see you leave, Mr. Diamond. I hate to go myself, boys. Love them biscuits. Mm, maybe we'll get up and see you in New York sometime. Hey, Kelly's coming, too. Hmm? Doesn't like being tied to his horse like that, I guess. Finney. Uh, yeah, Duke? Fellas coming, too. Hit him with something. <laughs> sure. Richard Diamond, private detective, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Uh, what does the sign say on the door? I'm a detective agency. Now read the second line, please. Recommended good housekeeping. And the last line, please. Homicides delivered at the rear. That's fine. Twenty twenty vision. Now, if you just hop around on one foot while I classify you in 1A, I'll see that you're on the next boat to the Aleutians. Are you Diamond? Are you a prospective client? Yes. I'm Diamond. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. You ever leave town, Mr. Diamond? Occasionally. But I could never get used to the tar and feathers. I'd like you to go to California with me. Oh, just lonesome, or have you got a problem? I represent a very wealthy man in Hollywood. He has a problem. A very wealthy man, huh? Millions. I'd love to meet him. I'll arrange it. When can you leave? Well, now, that's, uh, that's a bit of a problem. Let's see. Close the office, do some packing, take care of a few uh, <clears throat> engagements. It'll take me at least 13 minutes. Uh, Four o'clock now. We can leave LaGuardia by five. You have the tickets already? No tickets are necessary, Mr. Diamond. Mr. Harvey's private plane and pilot are standing by. The gentleman's name turned out to be Kane, Fred Kane, from Beverly Hills, California. Obviously, representing a client with more than a cozy income. Private plane, private pilot, and worth millions. How cozy can you get I called Helen, told her I'd send her a starlet swimming pool or something, and by 5.30, I was riding with Fred Kane in Mr. Harvey's private plane, headed for sunny California. Comfortable? Oh, I haven't seen furnishings like this since I got lost in the men's lounge at the Waldorf. <laughs> Drink? Uh, later. The time has come, the Walrus said. To talk of many things. Uh, right. I represent Mr. George L. Harvey. The big motion picture producer? Yeah. He's uh, being blackmailed. Well, why come all the way to New York for me? You've got some pretty good boys in California. Spade, Novak. Of course, they haven't got my blue eyes. GL didn't want any local talent brought in on this case. You were quite well known, even in California. Oh, well, I, I can understand that. Uh, GL thought it'd be a good idea to have an outsider helping him. Someone who wouldn't be recognized. Okay, bless old G.L. and all his little millions. Now, who's blackmailing him? G.L. will tell you everything himself when we get to California. Fred Kane and I played Jen for the next couple of hours, and we didn't talk anymore about G.L. Harvey and his blackmail trouble. By 8.30, we were somewhere over Kansas, and I was getting sleepy, so I turned in. Around 6 the next morning, 
We landed in Burbank. I stepped out to get my first look at beautiful, wonderful, sunny California. We'll have to run for it. GL will have a car waiting. A car? I'm surprised at GL. I thought sure he'd meet us with his private life raft. The car was waiting all right, complete with chauffeur, footman, and dinghy. We plowed our way through six inches of early morning dew and headed for the Beverly Hills Hotel, where I was supposed to stay. We arrived around seven, got me settled in my room, a tiny little affair that reminded me of a well-decorated roundhouse. Then we had breakfast, and by ten o'clock I was standing in the offices of George L. Harvey, Hollywood producer. Uh, glad you're here, Diamond. Have a seat. Ah, thank you. You haven't got an old ringer around you, have you? Nasty weather, isn't it? Mm. It'll clear up. Got to. Can't stand a cover set all week. Schedule's too tight. Cover set? Uh, GL shooting a new picture... If the company has some unexpected bad weather and they're shooting exteriors, uh, they have a cover set and they can move into and shoot some interior scenes. Oh. You interested in motion pictures, Diamond? Well, I, uh, I, I see a few. Right now, I'm more interested in blackmail, Mr. Harvey. Oh, yes. Well, here's the setup. Fred here introduced me to a girl about a month ago, Mary Conrad. And now she's got you on the hook? Very much on the hook. Pretty girl. No, more than that, beautiful. Brunette, about five six. Well, she's uh, beautiful. Uh, we became very well friendly. Yes. Mm. I'm married, Mister Diamond. My wife doesn't know anything about this unless Mary Conrad tells her. Yes, and she's threatened to do just that unless you kick through or something. Yes. Money? Yes, a hundred thousand. Oh, well, that's a that's a nice round sum. Fred should be more careful about the girls he introduces you to. I had no way of knowing Diamond. I met the girl in Las Vegas. Two weeks later, I met her at a party down here. It was just as much my fault. I saw her with Fred and wanted an introduction. And you got it. A hundred thousand dollar. How do you do? Yes. You uh, want me to get something on her or to get the evidence back? Well, yes. Hmm. So why do you don't get into more trouble, GL? You just don't know how to say no. <laughs> It was pretty obvious that I'd have to meet the blackmailer, so a party was arranged by Fred Kane at GL's beach house and without GL's presence, so I could get acquainted with the beautiful Mary Conrad. GL gave me a $200 retainer and blushed a little when I kissed him on both cheeks. Then Fred Kane sailed me back to the Beverly Hills, where he rented a car for me and told me how to get to the beach home. By 8 o'clock that evening, I was driving down the coast highway on the way to Malibu. I couldn't get over it. The rain had stopped. There was a big yellow moon sitting up in a cloudless sky, and a warm breeze was blowing in off the Pacific. I even put the top down. Uh, hello, Diamond. Come on in. Hey, what's with this weather? One minute it's pouring, and the next time it comes out like a travel folder. Uh, we're just getting into the rainy season. It'll probably stay clear like this for at least a week. Oh. Uh, give me your hat, and I'll take you in and introduce you to the guests. Oh, that's what? A New York gumshoe out looking for a bike mailer? Yeah, that's right. You're an agent. Agent? I don't know anything about agents. You like money, don't you? That's my name, spelled backwards. Then you're an agent. It was a small little party. That is, of course, if you compared it to Ebbets Field during a World Series. GL's house was in the middle of what was known as Malibu Colony. That's a bunch of houses built right out on the sand and surrounded by money. Fred took me around and introduced me as an agent from New York and an old friend. I met everything from producers, writers, and directors to several well-known motion picture stars, one of which had her French poodle with her. And this is Michelle, Mr. Diamond. Say hello to Mr. Diamond, Michelle. Oh, oh! Oops, sorry. Great Dane. And on and on until finally we got around to my objective for the evening. And believe me, I'd enlist three times a week just to go after that kind of an objective. Brunette, about five, six. When she looked up at me, I felt as nervous as a cat in a ukulele factory. This is Mary Conrad, Mr. Diamond, Mary. Hello. Uh, be Hello. nice to him. He's a big New York agent. Uh, I see some other guests now. Uh, take care of him, Mary. <laughs> Looks like Fred has paired us all. Well, he knows a good combination when he sees it. Two best-looking people at the party. 
Of course, I'm prettier than you are. <laughs> How long have you known Fred? Fred? Oh, years and years. We used to play stickball together over in Canarsie. Hmm, I thought Fred was a native Californian. Hmm. Well, oh, yes. Well, he, he is. He used to come all the way to New York just for the stickball. We uh, had quite a team. I'll bet you did. What position did you play? I played left gutter. That's the dirty side of the street. Oh. How about a drink, huh? She showed me where the bar was, and we sat down and got acquainted. Then she showed me where the ocean was, and we took off our shoes and walked out on the sand. Then we sat down and really got acquainted. Oh, it's nicer out here. I don't like parties much. Oh, I like this one. Compliments? Naturally. Oh, thank you. How long are you going to be in California? Oh, I don't know. It depends. Business? Yeah. You're not having much fun, are you? Oh, sure. I'm having a ball. You're lonesome, aren't you? Like 50 miles of dirt road. Let's leave the party. All right. Where to? Well, my car's here, and it wouldn't be good to be seen leaving together. I'll go first, and you'll follow in about five minutes. You can pick me up at my house. Score for Diamond. She gave me her address and told me how to get there. Then we walked back to the party, and uh, she left. I gave the high sign to Kane, and in five minutes, I followed. Mary Conrad's house was on the outskirts of Beverly Hills, south of Pico. There was a long, low, black sedan, the type of chauffeur usually drives, parked in front of the house. The same car that had picked me up at the airport that morning. And it belonged to G.L. Harvey. Before I could get parked, the door to the little house flew open and old G.L. himself came barreling out like a squirrel with his tail on fire. G.L.? Oh, uh, hello there, Mr. Harvey. Diamond, did you get into the studio? I went to your home first. My home? You didn't talk to anyone? Your or... car wasn't around, so I tried the studio. The cop at the gate wouldn't let me in, so I climbed a fence. Climbed a fence? It was better than having him call you. You might have wanted to see me. I wanted to see you. Don't be foolish. Why not see you? You often come to your office this late at night. Look, Diamond... I saw you when you yelled at me in front of Mary Conrad's house. Why didn't you stop? I was too frightened. I was scared stiff. I suppose you found her. Yeah. It was terrible. Awful. Just awful. I'll bet it was. I thought about going home. I thought about a lot of places. I ended up here. Did you kill her? No, no. Of course I didn't kill her. She called me from Malibu, told me to meet her at her house. I got there before she did. She drove up and we went in. It was just awful. You went in, then what? She turned the living room light on and there was a shot. She looked kind of surprised and I was too stunned for a minute to really know what had happened. Then she just kind of looked at me like she wanted me to help. It was then I really got it. I knew she'd been shot. She fell and I rushed over to her. She died right there. Lying on the floor looking up at me like... I... I, I don't know. There was a gun beside her. Was there? I didn't see it. Well, here it is. Take a look at it. Forty-five. One shot fired. Ever seen it before? No. You know, I could get in a lot of trouble taking this gun from the scene of murder. But I had a hunch it was worth it. I thought maybe it might be your gun. If it isn't, I'll get it back to the cops and take my chances. I don't know whether it is or not. Well, do you own a forty-five? Yes, I keep it at the beach house. But even if that turns out to be my gun, Mr. Diamond, I didn't kill Mary Conrad. Oh, I don't think you did either. You might have wanted to kill her because of the blackmail, but that would be premeditated. You'd plan it, and a man who commits a planned killing doesn't leave the murder weapon around, especially if it happens to belong to him. But if you were in love with her... I wasn't. Well, I'm, I'm taking that chance. A jealous lover might do a lot of silly things. I have a wife and family. I thought about that, too. I'm not sure the police would pay much attention. If the blackmail got out, you'd have a motive. If this gun turns out to be yours, has your fingerprints on it, that would cinch it. What about the police? I called them and got out. You know where the shot came from? I didn't even take time to think about it. I just ran. Well, there was a heavy smell of cordite on the other side of the room near the bedroom. Bedroom door was ajar. Bedroom window was open. 
killer probably shot her from the bedroom. You ran. He threw the gun in beside the body. What are we going to do? Well, there's one thing that makes me wonder a little. Mary Conrad asked me to come over to her house, too. What do you suppose she wanted with both of us there? I can't imagine. Well, neither can I. It's certainly worth looking into. Thanks, Diamond. You know, I've had some pretty fair experiences with murder, G.L., but like everybody else, I make mistakes. I hope this is not going to be one of them. I gave G.L. Harvey two instructions. First, find out if he was missing a forty-five automatic. Second, go on about his business like nothing had happened. And forget that he'd known Mary Conrad other than casually. I knew I was taking a big chance. Being an accessory after the fact could land me in a lot of hot water. But G.L. just didn't figure as the killer. And if I was right, someone was trying to fit him for a king-size frame. Why? Who? What was the motive? Those were things I was going to have to find out and find them out in a hurry. So while the police were undoubtedly still busy with an identification on Mary Conrad, I got back in my rented car and took off for Malibu. Uh, back so soon? Uh, no laughs. You uh, find out anything? Where can we talk? You look like something's wrong. You should see how Mary Conrad looks. Fred Kane took me in the den and we locked out the rest of the party. I told him just what had happened. And he poured himself a long drink. Yeah. You think G.L. really did it? I want to do some checking on Mary Conrad before I start making any guesses. Now, uh, you said you met her in Las Vegas, didn't you? That's right. Well, then tell me everything you know about her. And he didn't know much. He'd met Mary at the Serena Hotel, just ran into her at a party. He had seen her several times in the following few days, and she had mentioned she was coming down to L.A., so he'd ask her to look him up. She had, and that was the extent of it. What do I tell the police? They'll certainly find out who she's been seeing. It'll take them a while to check. Does she have any other friends? She never mentioned any. You met her at the Serena. Was, uh, was she with anyone? I don't remember his name. You remember the date? It was about a month ago, the last few days I was there. Oh, uh, well, okay. I'm going to take a trip to Vegas and see if I can find out anything more. You must really think G.L. is innocent. Don't you? Well, yeah. But he certainly had a motive. Oh, I don't think G.L. would kill anyone for $100,000. The thing I can't figure is why anyone would want to frame him. What could they gain by it? I drove back to Burbank, grabbed a late plane for Las Vegas, and about an hour and a half later, I was checking with the desk clerk at the Serena. We went through the lists of guests during the time Fred Kane's last visit. Kane had checked out on the 8th of October. He said he'd met Mary Conrad several days before. I gave the desk clerk her description, but he didn't remember. And she hadn't been registered at the Serena. So I started checking every hotel and motor court in Vegas. Uh, bartender, give me a scotch and water. Sure, thanks. Hey, you look a little beat, friend. Can I buy you a drink? I just bought one. Hey, uh, I understand you're trying to find Mary Conrad. You know her? Yeah. Well, friend, I'd like to ask you some questions. What's it worth? Depends on how much you know. I know plenty. Well, we'll see. What's your name? Not here. You get a car outside. I'll take a ride. Okay. Information, please. Slid off the stool and led the way out of the hotel and out across the parking lot. This guy knew I was looking for Mary Conrad. How? Had to be tipped off or he'd been tailing me. When he walked in front of me, the little old gun in his hip pocket showed up like a bathing beauty on the gorilla farm. Hey, uh, wait a minute. What's the matter? Where's the car? Huh? Oh, uh, right over there. Mm-hmm. The one with the fat guy behind the wheel? Just a friend. Oh, sure, sure. I think we talk right here. He thought about it for a second, glanced over at his fat friend sitting in the car, then back at me. Here? Right here. Okay. He made up his mind all right. He grabbed for his right hip pocket and that big gun, but that was as far as he got because I second-guessed him. <laughs> His 
friend took off, staying behind a line of parked cars until he was clear of the parking lot and far enough away so I couldn't get in a good shot. I leaned down over the man who had wanted to kill me. He was very dead. Well, I'd held out police evidence in Los Angeles and killed a man in Las Vegas. I was in the spot, and only one lead left. The big fat driver who'd taken off in the car. I went through the dead man's pocket and came up with one thing. A hundred dollar gambling chip from the Ace of Clubs Casino. Oh, uh, how about using that car of yours? Huh? Don't turn around or you'll get mixed up with a lot of bullets. What do you want? A talk. Keep looking straight ahead like nothing was happening. I'll kill you if you try anything. I promise you that. What is this? Who are you? I just shot a friend of yours in the Serena parking lot. They've been in my office all night. Oh, sure. Start walking for the door. You'll never get away with this, Diamond. I thought you didn't know me. Start walking. I own this place, Diamond. My boys are all over the joint. Well, yell for them once and you have a dirty old hole in your pretty coat. Look, you and me can discuss this without getting rough. Out the door. And smile. Now, where's the car? Across the street. Now, wait a minute. A couple of your boys are following us. They look a little worried about me. Tell them how happy you are. Go on. Okay, okay. Relax, boys. It's okay. Me and my friend are just talking some business. All right. Across the street. We're going to take a little drive outside of town where we can have some peace and quiet. Just you and me in the desert. That's good enough. Pull off the road. Look, Diamond. Pull off the road. Well, the cops are going to be out looking for you. That's why I need some answers in a hurry. Why did your boy try to kill me tonight? I don't know what you're talking about. Get out of the car. Now, look, I swear... Get out! What's this going to prove, Diamond? You're going to start walking straight out into that desert. At the end of a hundred paces, if you haven't told me what I want to know, you're going to get it. Right in your big, ugly face. You'll never get away with it. Walk. Now, that's the trouble with you big, tough guys. Get a fellow in a spot, and you never figure he might just be desperate enough to shoot his way out of it. Why did your boy try to knock me off tonight? I've got a lot of dough, Diamond. I can get you out of the state and make you rich. I'll swear you killed my boy in self-defense. How well do you know Mary Conrad? I've well, never heard of her. I've held out police evidence in California, and I've shot a man in Nevada. I'm in a tough spot. I'll just about do anything. You kill me, and you'll never find out anything. I'll keep looking. Who else is mixed up in this? How'd you know who I was? I found out. And you're nearly there. You're bluffing. You got 15 paces to go. You'll never get out of town. You kill me and every cop in the state will be after you. You're a big man, huh? I swing a lot of weight. Well, I don't like your kind of big men. Stop here. How about it? Going to tell me how you're mixed up in this? Now, wait a minute. This is getting ridiculous. It's a matter of opinion. You going to tell me? Wait, wait. You must be nuts. Supposing I did know something. I tell you, you tell the cops. Maybe I knocked off somebody. I get the gas chamber. Then it shouldn't make any difference to you. This would be a lot quicker. Hmm. What do you want to know? Who's Mary Conrad? My girl. Her real name's Mary Langley. Who killed her? Fred Kane. The guy who works for Jill Harvey. Why? Kane owed me a lot of dough. Couldn't pay it. Jill Harvey was to go to the gas chamber for killing someone. Kane had become head of the Harvey Productions. Why wouldn't Harvey's wife take over? Well, she'd own it, but Jill's will states that Kane would run it. How do you fit? Kane promised me a 50-50 split if I'd lay off about the debt. I talked Mary into it, and Kane introduced her to Harvey. The old boy went for a hook, line, and sinker. Then she started blackmailing him. So you'd have a motive for murder? Yeah. Oh. She never figured she was going to get killed. No, she just thought we were going to milk the old boy for the 100000 and pull out. How did I fit in? Harvey's idea. When Kane told me about it, I, well, I figured it wouldn't be bad. You could catch Harvey after the murder. Well, why did you make a date with me and then call Harvey? Well, we told her to. 
Well, you were a private eye working for Harvey's wife. We said that you could be bought and it would be a good idea to catch her with Harvey. So you waited in the bedroom until G.L. came in and you shot her through the gun in beside her. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't shoot her. Kane shot her. Oh, Kane took G.L.'s gun from the Malibu house? That's right. Oh, you lame brain. I left Kane at the Malibu house when I went to see Mary. He was there when I got back. Witnesses will swear he was around the whole time. You killed the girl and hopped the plane back here for Vegas. No, no, I didn't kill her. Go over by that rock. Uh, take it easy, Diamond. Go on. Okay. Okay, I shot her. I hid in the bedroom and shot her. But you won't be around to talk about her. Come on, get up. Get up. Oh, for Pete's sake, now I have to carry him back to the car. Richard Diamond, private detective, who come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. While the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. This is Bill Foreman speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of their own store names. They've done that because they recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Rexall's brand new multivitamin product, Formula V10, is an excellent example. For Formula V10 is a really pleasant tasting, really easy to take product that helps prevent vitamin and iron deficiencies. The recommended daily dosage supplies twice the minimum requirement of vitamin B1, five times the requirement of iron, plus minimum daily requirements of A, D, and B2, plus red crystalline vitamin B12. Ask for pleasant tasting formula V10. That's V as in vitamin. V10 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. The stores with the orange and blue sign. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Uh, what does the sign say on the door? Diamond Detective Agency. Now read the second line, please. Recommended by good housekeeping. And the last line, please. Homicides delivered at the rear. That's fine. 2020 vision. Now, if you just hop around on one foot while I classify you in 1A, I'll see that you're on the next boat to the Aleutians. Are you Diamond? Are you a prospective client? Yes. I'm Diamond. I charge 100 a day in expenses. Do you ever leave town, Mr. Diamond? Occasionally. But I can never get used to the tar and feathers. 
I'd like you to go to California with me. Oh, just lonesome, or have you got a problem? I represent a very wealthy man in Hollywood. He has a problem. A very wealthy man, huh? Millions. I'd love to meet him. I'll arrange it. When can you leave? Well, now, that's a, that's a bit of a problem. Let's see. Close the office, do some packing, take care of a few uh, <clears throat> engagements. It'll take me at least 13 minutes. Uh, it's four o'clock now. We can leave LaGuardia by five. You have the tickets already? No tickets are necessary, Mr. Diamond. Mr. Harvey's private plane and pilot are standing by. <laughs> The gentleman's name turned out to be Kane, Fred Kane, from Beverly Hills, California. Obviously, representing a client with more than a cozy income. Private plane, private pilot, and worth millions. How cozy can you get? I called Helen, told her I'd send her a starlit swimming pool or something, and by 5.30, I was riding with Fred Kane and Mr. Harvey's private plane, headed for sunny California. Comfortable? Ah, oh, I haven't seen furnishings like this since I got lost in the men's lounge at the Waldorf. <laughs> Drink? Uh, later. The time has come, the walrus said. To talk of many things. Uh, right. I represent Mr. George L. Harvey. The big motion picture producer? Yeah. He's uh, being blackmailed. Well, I come all the way to New York for me. You've got some pretty good boys in California. Spade, Novak. Of course, they haven't got my blue eyes. G.L. didn't want any local talent brought in on this case. You're quite well known, even in California. Oh, well, I, I can understand that. Uh, G.L. thought it'd be a good idea to have an outsider helping him. Someone who wouldn't be recognized. Okay, bless old G.L. and all his little millions. Now, who's blackmailing him? G.L. will tell you everything himself when we get to California. <laughs> Fred Kane and I played Jen for the next couple of hours, and we didn't talk any more about G.L. Harvey and his blackmail trouble. By 8.30, we were somewhere over Kansas, and I was getting sleepy, so I turned in. Around 6 the next morning, we landed in Burbank. I stepped out to get my first look at beautiful, wonderful, sunny California. Uh, we'll have to run for it. G.L. will have a car waiting. A car? I'm surprised at G.L., I thought, sure, he'd meet us with his private life raft. The car was waiting all right, complete with chauffeur, footman, and dinghy. We plowed our way through six inches of early morning dew and headed for the Beverly Hills Hotel, where I was supposed to stay. We arrived around seven, got me settled in my room, a tiny little affair that reminded me of a well-decorated roundhouse. Then we had breakfast, and by 10 o'clock, I was standing in the offices of George L. Harvey, Hollywood producer. Uh, glad you're here, Diamond. Have a seat. Ah, thank you. You haven't got an old ringer around you, have you? Nasty weather, isn't it? Mm. It'll clear up. Got to. Can't stay in a cover set all week. Schedule's too tight. Cover set? Uh, GL shooting a new picture. If the company has some unexpected bad weather and they're shooting exteriors, uh, they have a cover set and they can move into and shoot some interior scenes. Oh. You interested in motion pictures, Diamond? Well, I, uh, I, I see a few. Right now, I'm more interested in blackmail, Mr. Harvey. Oh, yes. Well, here's the setup. Fred here introduced me to a girl about a month ago, Mary Conrad. And now she's got you on the hook? Very much on the hook. Pretty girl. No, more than that, beautiful. Brunette, about 5'6". Well, she's... Uh... Beautiful. Uh, we became very, well... Friendly. Yes. Mm. I'm married, Mr. Diamond. My wife doesn't know anything about this. Unless Mary Conrad tells her. Yes, and she's threatened to do just that. Unless you kick through with something. Yes. Money? Yes, 100000 Well, that's a, that's a nice round sum. Fred should be more careful about the girls he introduces you to. I had no way of knowing, Diamond. I met the girl in Las Vegas. Two weeks later, I met her at a party down here. It was just as much my fault. I saw her with Fred and wanted an introduction. And you got it. A hundred thousand dollar. How do you do? Yes. You uh, want me to get something on her or to get the evidence back? Well, yes. Hmm. It's a wonder you don't get into more trouble, G.L. You just don't know how to say no. <laughs> It was pretty obvious that I'd have to meet the blackmailer, so a party was arranged by Fred Kane at G.L.'s beach house and without G.L.'s presence so I could get acquainted with the beautiful Mary Conrad. G.L. gave me a $200 retainer and blushed a little when I kissed him on both cheeks. Then Fred Kane sailed me back to the Beverly Hills 
where he rented a car for me and told me how to get to the beach home. By 8 o'clock that evening, I was driving down the coast highway on the way to Malibu. I couldn't get over it. The rain had stopped. There was a big yellow moon sitting up in a cloudless sky, and a warm breeze was blowing in off the Pacific. I even put the top down. Uh, hello, Diamond. Come on in. Say, what's with this weather? One minute it's pouring, and the next time it comes out like a travel folder. Uh, we're just getting into the rainy season. It'll probably stay clear like this for at least a week. Oh. Uh, give me your hat, and I'll take you in and introduce you to the guests. Oh, it's what? A New York gumshoe out looking for a blackmailer? Yeah, that's right. You're an agent. Agent? I don't know anything about agents. You like money, don't you? That's my name, spelled backwards. Then you're an agent. It was a small little party. That is, of course, if you compared it to Ebbets Field during a World Series. GL's house was in the middle of what was known as Malibu Colony. That's a bunch of houses built right out on the sand and surrounded by money. Fred took me around and introduced me as an agent from New York and an old friend. I met everything from producers, writers, and directors to several well-known motion picture stars, one of which had her French poodle with her. And this is Michelle, Mr. Diamond. Say hello to Mr. Diamond, Michelle. Oh, oh. Oops, sorry. Great Dane. And on and on until finally we got around to my objective for the evening. And believe me, I'd enlist three times a week just to go after that kind of an objective. Brunette, about five, six. When she looked up at me, I felt as nervous as a cat in a ukulele factory. Hey, this is Mary Conrad, Mr. Diamond, Mary. Hello. Uh, it'd be Hello. nice to him. He's a big New York agent. Uh, I see some other guests now. Uh, take care of him, Mary. <laughs> Looks like Fred is paired us all. Well, he knows a good combination when he sees it. Two best-looking people at the party. <laughs> of course, I'm prettier than you are. <laughs> How long have you known Fred? Fred? Oh, years and years. We used to play stickball together over in Canarsie. Hmm, I thought Fred was a native Californian. Hmm. Well, oh, yes. Well, he, he is. He used to come all the way to New York just for the stickball. We uh, had quite a team. I'll bet you did. What position did you play? I played left gutter. That's the dirty side of the street. Oh. How about a drink, huh? She showed me where the bar was, and we sat down and got acquainted. Then she showed me where the ocean was, and we took off our shoes and walked out on the sand. Then we sat down and really got acquainted. Mm, it's nicer out here. And I don't like parties much. Well, I like this one. Compliment? Naturally. Oh, thank you. How long are you going to be in California? Oh, I don't know. It depends. Business? Yeah. You're not having much fun, are you? Oh, sure. I'm having a ball. You're lonesome, aren't you? Like 50 miles of dirt road. Let's leave the party. All right. Where to? Well, my car's here, and it wouldn't be good to be seen leaving together. I'll go first, and you follow in about five minutes. You can pick me up at my house. Score for Diamond. She gave me her address and told me how to get there. Then we walked back to the party, and uh, she left. I gave the high sign to Kane, and in five minutes, I followed. Mary Conrad's house was on the outskirts of Beverly Hills, south of Pico. There was a long, low, black sedan, the type of chauffeur usually drives, parked in front of the house. The same car that had picked me up at the airport that morning. And it belonged to G.L. Harvey. Before I could get parked, the door to the little house flew open, and old G.L. himself came barreling out like a squirrel with his tail on fire. G.L.? Here's a question for all overweight women. Would you like to know how to reduce without starving, without counting calories, without back-breaking exercise? Would I? But it isn't possible, is it? It certainly is. With a new Andela Field reducing plan, you lose up to five pounds a week and gain new pep and energy besides. Best of all, you have none of the hunger pangs and bother that most people dread about reducing. The Andela Field reducing plan shows you how to lose weight naturally. Sounds wonderful. What does the plan include? Everything you need to slim you down and keep you slim. Vitamins to bolster your diet. 
and Delafield Appetite Reducing Wafers to curb that unruly appetite and an important, complete beauty book. And here's a tip for all overweight men. Rexall is proud to announce their new Delafield Reducing Plan for men. It's sound, scientific, and easy. So look young, feel young, stay young for your age. Ask for the Delafield Reducing Plan for men. Available only at Rexall Drugstores. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Hey, what the devil? Oh, hello there, Mr. Harvey. Diamond, how'd you get into the studio? I went to your home first. My home? You didn't talk to anyone? Your car wasn't around, so I tried the studio. The cop at the gate wouldn't let me in, so I climbed a fence. Climbed a fence? It was better than having him call you. You might have wanted to see me. I wanted to see you. Don't be foolish. Why not see you? You often come to your offices late at night. Look, Diamond, I saw you when you yelled at me in front of Mary Conrad's house. Why didn't you stop? I was too frightened. I was scared stiff. I suppose you found her. Yeah. Oh, it was terrible. Awful. Just awful. I'll bet it was. I thought about going home. I thought about a lot of places. I ended up here. Did you kill her? No, no. Of course I didn't kill her. She called me from Malibu told me to meet her at her house. I got there before she did. She drove up and we went in. It was just awful. You went in? Then what? She turned the living room light on and there was a shot. She looked kind of surprised and I was too stunned for a minute to really know what had happened. Then she just kind of looked at me like she wanted me to help. It was then I really got it. I knew she'd been shot. She fell and I rushed over to her. She died right there. Lying on the floor looking up at me like... I, I don't know. There was a gun beside her. Was there? I didn't see it. Well, here it is. Take a look at it. Forty-five. One shot fired. Ever seen it before? Uh, no. You know, I could get in a lot of trouble taking this gun from the scene of murder. But I had a hunch it was worth it. I thought maybe it might be your gun. If it isn't, I'll get it back to the cops and take my chances. I don't know whether it is or not. Well, do you own a forty-five? Yes, I keep it at the beach house. But even if that turns out to be my gun, Mr. Diamond... I didn't kill Mary Conrad. Oh, I don't think you did either. You might have wanted to kill her because of the blackmail, but that would be premeditated. You'd plan it, and a man who commits a planned killing doesn't leave the murder weapon around, especially if it happens to belong to him. But if you were in love with her... I wasn't. Well, I'm, I'm taking that chance. A jealous lover might do a lot of silly things. I have a wife and family. I thought about that, too. But I'm not sure the police would pay much attention. If the blackmail got out, you'd have a motive. If this gun turns out to be yours, has your fingerprints on it, that would cinch it. What about the police? I called them and got out. You know where the shot came from? I didn't even take time to think about it. I just ran. There was a heavy smell of cordite on the other side of the room near the bedroom. Bedroom door was ajar. Bedroom window was open. Killer probably shot her from the bedroom. You ran. He threw the gun in beside the body. What are we going to do? Well, there's one thing that makes me wonder a little... Mary Conrad asked me to come over to her house, too. What do you suppose she wanted with both of us there? I can't imagine. Well, neither can I. And it's certainly worth looking into. Thanks, Diamond. You know, I've had some pretty fair experiences with murder, G.L., but like everybody else, I make mistakes. I hope this is not going to be one of them. I gave G.L. Harvey two instructions. First, find out if he was missing a forty-five automatic. Second, go on about his business like nothing had happened. And forget that he'd known Mary Conrad other than casually. I knew I was taking a big chance. Being an accessory after the fact could land me in a lot of hot water. But G.L. just didn't figure as the killer. And if I was right, someone was trying to fit him for a king-size frame. Why? Who? What was the motive? Those were things I was going to have to find out and find them out in a hurry. So while the police were undoubtedly still busy with an identification on Mary Conrad, I got back in my rented car and took off for Malibu. Uh, Back so soon? Uh, No laughs. You uh, find out anything? Where can we talk? You look like something's wrong. You should see how Mary Conrad looks. Fred Kane took me in the den and we locked out the rest of the party. I told him just what had happened. And he poured himself a long drink. Yeah... You think G.L. really did it? I want to do some checking on Mary Conrad before I start making any guesses. 
Now, uh, you said you met her in Las Vegas, didn't you? That's right. And then tell me everything you know about her. And he didn't know much. He'd met Mary at the Serena Hotel, just ran into her at a party. He had seen her several times in the following few days, and she had mentioned she was coming down to L.A., so he'd ask her to look him up. She had, and that was the extent of it. What do I tell the police? They'll certainly find out who she's been seeing. It'll take them a while to check. Did she have any other friends? She never mentioned any. You met her at the Serena. Was, uh, was she with anyone? I don't remember his name. You remember the date? It was about a month ago, the last few days I was there. Oh, uh, well, okay. I'm going to take a trip to Vegas and see if I can find out anything more. You must really think G.L.'s innocent. Don't you? Well, yes. But he certainly had a motive. Oh, I don't think G.L. would kill anyone for $100,000. The thing I can't figure is why anyone would want to frame him. What could they gain by it? <laughs> I drove back to Burbank, grabbed the late plane for Las Vegas, and about an hour and a half later, I was checking with the desk clerk at the Serena. We went through the lists of guests during the time Fred Kane's last visit. Kane had checked out on the 8th of October. He said he'd met Mary Conrad several days before. I gave the desk clerk her description, but he didn't remember, and she hadn't been registered at the Serena. So I started checking every hotel and motor court in Vegas. Mary Conrad, huh? Yeah, about five six, brunette, blue eyes. Mary Conrad. Oh, she didn't register here. Here, take a look for yourself. I kept going, one hotel after another, and no Mary Conrad registered at any of them. But she had to live someplace if she stayed in Las Vegas. Uh, bartender, give me a scotch and water. Sure, thank. Hey, you look a little beat, friend. Can I buy you a drink? I just bought one. Hey, uh, I understand you're trying to find Mary Conrad. You know her? Yeah. Well, friend, I'd like to ask you some questions. What's it worth? Depends on how much you know. I know plenty. I will see. What's your name? Not here. You can get a car outside. We'll take a ride. Okay. Information, please. Slid off the stool and led the way out of the hotel and out across the parking lot. This guy knew I was looking for Mary Conrad. How? Had to be tipped off or he'd been tailing me. When he walked in front of me, the little old gun in his hip pocket showed up like a bathing beauty on a gorilla farm. Hey, uh, wait a minute. What's the matter? Where's the car? Huh? Oh, uh, right over there. Mm-hmm. The one with the fat guy behind the wheel? Just a friend. Oh, sure, sure. I think we talk right here. He thought about it for a second, glanced over at his fat friend sitting in the car, then back at me. Here? Right here. Okay. He made up his mind, all right. He grabbed for his right hip pocket and that big gun, but that was as far as he got because I second-guessed him. <laughs> His friend took off, staying behind a line of parked cars until he was clear of the parking lot and far enough away so I couldn't get in a good shot. I leaned down over the man who had wanted to kill me. He was very dead. Well, I'd held out police evidence in Los Angeles and killed a man in Las Vegas. I was in a spot, and only one lead left. The big fat driver who'd taken off in the car. I went through the dead man's pocket and came up with one thing. A hundred dollar gambling chip from the Ace of Clubs Casino. Oh, uh, how about using that car of yours? Huh? Don't turn around or you'll get mixed up with a lot of bullets. What do you want? A talk. Keep looking straight ahead like nothing was happening. I'll kill you if you try anything, I promise you that. What is this? Who are you? I just shot a friend of yours in the Serena parking lot. I've been in my office all night. Oh, sure. Start walking for the door. You'll never get away with this, Diamond. I thought you didn't know me. Start walking. I own this place, Diamond. My boys are all over the joint. Well, yell for them once and you have a dirty old hole in your pretty coat. Look, you and me can discuss this without getting rough. Out the door and smile. Now, where's the car? Across the street. Now, wait a minute. 
couple of your boys are following us. They look a little worried about me. Tell them how happy you are. Go on. No. Okay, okay. Relax, boys. It's okay. Me and my friend are just talking some business. All right. Cross the street. We're going to take a little drive outside of town where we can have some peace and quiet. Just you and me in the desert. That's good enough. Pull off the road. Look, Diamond. Pull off the road. You know, the cops are going to be out looking for you. That's why I need some answers in a hurry. Why did your boy try to kill me tonight? I don't know what you're talking about. Get out of the car. Now, look, I swear... Get out. What's this going to prove, Diamond? You're going to start walking straight out into that desert. At the end of a hundred paces, if you haven't told me what I want to know, you're going to get it. Right in your big, ugly face. You'll never get away with it. Walk. Now, that's the trouble with you big, tough guys. Get a fellow in a spot and you never figure he might just be desperate enough to shoot his way out of it. Why did your boy try to knock me off tonight? I've got a lot of dough, Diamond. I can get you out of the state and make you rich. I'll swear you killed my boy in self-defense. How well do you know Mary Conrad? I've never heard of her. I've held out police evidence in California, and I've shot a man in Nevada. I'm in a tough spot. I'll just about do anything. You kill me, and you'll never find out anything. I'll keep looking. Who else is mixed up in this? How do you know who I was? I found out. And you're nearly there. You're bluffing. You got 15 paces to go. You'll never get out of town. You kill me and every cop in the state will be after you. You're a big man, huh? I swing a lot of weight. Well, I don't like your kind of big men. Stop here. How about it? Going to tell me how you're mixed up in this? Now, wait a minute. This is getting ridiculous. It's a matter of opinion. You going to tell me? Wait, wait. You must be nuts. Supposing I did know something. I tell you, you tell the cops. Maybe I knocked off somebody. I get the gas chamber. Then it shouldn't make any difference to you. This will be a lot quicker. Hmm. What do you want to know? Who's Mary Conrad? My girl. Her real name's Mary Langley. Who killed her? Fred Kane. The guy who works for Jail Harvey. Why? Kane owed me a lot of dough. Couldn't pay it. Jail Harvey was to go to the gas chamber for killing someone... Kane had become head of the Harvey Productions. Why wouldn't Harvey's wife take over? Well, she'd own it, but Jill's will states that Kane would run it. How do you fit? Well, Kane promised me a 50-50 split if I'd lay off about the debt. I talked Mary into it, and Kane introduced her to Harvey. The old boy went for a hook, line, and sinker. Then she started blackmailing him. So he'd have a motive for murder? Yeah. Mm. She never figured she was going to get killed. No, she just thought we were going to milk the old boy for the 100000 and pull out. How did I fit in? Harvey's idea. When Kane told me about it, I, well, I figured it wouldn't be bad. You could catch Harvey after the murder. Well, why did you make a date with me and then call Harvey? Well, we told her to. Told her you were a private eye working for Harvey's wife. We said that you could be bought and it would be a good idea to catch her with Harvey. So you waited in the bedroom until G.L. came in and you shot her through the gun in beside her. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't shoot her. Kane shot her. Oh, Kane took G.L.'s gun from the Malibu house? That's right. Oh, you lame brain. I left Kane at the Malibu house when I went to see Mary. He was there when I got back. Witnesses will swear he was around the whole time. You killed the girl and hopped a plane back here for Vegas. No, no, I didn't kill her. Go over by that rock. Uh, Take it easy, Diamond. Go on. Okay. Okay, I shot her. I hid in the bedroom and shot her. But you won't be around to talk about her. Come on, get up. Get up. Oh, for Pete's sake, now I have to carry him back to the car. Here at last is a mouthwash that cleans as it sweetens as it deodorizes. It's new triple-acting Rexall mouthwash with chlorophyll. And it's more effective because it combines nature's own breath freshener, chlorophyll with a foaming action that floats away retained food particles. What's more, a special surface active ingredient gives Rexall mouthwash with chlorophyll a wider coverage, a deeper penetration. The result? A clean, fresh mouth. A clean, fresh breath for hours. So fresh up with a cooling, minty-flavored mouthwash that cleans as it sweetens, as it deodorizes. 
Rexall mouthwash with chlorophyll at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell directed the RKO production Split Second, which is now in release, and his latest film appearance was in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer award-winning The Bad and the Beautiful. Featured in tonight's cast were Junius Matthews, Raymond Burr, Gene Bates, Virginia Gregg, and Wilms Herbert. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this time when Rexall Drug Products again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Men, cut your shaving time in half. Use Stag Brushless Shave Cream, the brushless cream that stays moist longer. No fuss, no rub in. Just smooth it on for quicker, closer, face happier shaves every time. Ask for Stag Brushless Shave Cream. Jumbo Tube, only 50 cents. At Rexall drugstores everywhere. This is the CBS Radio Network. And Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Uh, just a moment. Walt, Walt, is that your blood pressure I hear bubbling, or are you calling from Niagara Falls? What's the big idea keeping me waiting like that? Well, the big idea is that it's a beautiful day, and I'm happy. When I'm happy, I whistle. And when I'm happy and whistling, I don't like to be interrupted. I'll remember that the next time you're unhappy, and you ask a favor from me. You can whistle then, too. Oh, the great, big, important police lieutenant wants a favor from poor little old Richard Diamond. I want you to go to a funeral. Yours? No, it's mine. <laughs> Say, I'll lift a dance to Charleston on your grave, wise guy. Now, they're burying Bigfoot Grafton this afternoon. How do you know? How do I know? How do I know what? That it's Bigfoot Grafton they're tucking in. The way it read my paper, the Harbor Patrol fished out a guy presumed to be Bigfoot Grafton, boy racketeer. We're satisfied with the identification. Huh? Fingerprints? Fingerprints. Look, the body was in the Hudson River for nearly a week. Oh. Then tell me, what makes you so sure the guy they're putting in the ground today is Grafton? Look, Diamond, you're beginning to exasperate me. Will you or won't you go with us to Bigfoot Grafton's funeral this afternoon? Why me? Maybe you can show the boys how to dig the grave. Oh, Walt, Walt, that's silly. I don't know a grave from a hole in the ground. So why me? Because you once told me about a little business matter you had with some of Grafton's gang out west. And because some of those same hoods may attend the funeral, and because if any of them do, you'll recognize them. And I can point them out to you. Say, you are a detective. Otis and I'll pick you up in about an hour. Goodbye, Diamond. Goodbye, Bright Eyes. Come on, Billy. How many times have I got to tell you this is the only thing left to do? It's all wrong, Marge. I tell you, there's no need to call in a private eye. Well, hello, girl. Who are you? The name's on the door. Your diamond? Uh, you see something you don't like? Yeah, you. Oh, you'll never be lovely, be engaged, or get to use puns with an attitude like that. It's a waste of time, Marge, a waste of time. Lay off it, Billy. I know what's right. We came a long way to see you, diamond. All the way from West Frampton we came. We're ducklings. Oh, first impressions are so deceiving. I almost thought you were girls. 
Now, look, there's a psychiatrist just down the hall. Who Get I'm... this, Billy. The guy thinks we're nuts. Well, maybe you are a couple of ducks, and I'm the one who's crazy. Not ducks. Ducklings. Oh. Well, then if you have that kind of a problem, go to the Audubon Society. You never heard of the Long Island Ducklings? All we done was win the pennant last year. Pennant? Oh, baseball? Now it's coming. We're a girls' softball team. We got our own park out in West Frampton. I play third base. Who's on first? Me. Come on, let's get out of here, Marge. We'll stay. We've got to find Lottie, and he's got to help us. Lottie? Lottie Wyracek, our second baseman. She's been missing almost a week now. We can't win without our second baseman. Oh, yes. I can see where it must leave quite a gap between first base and shortstop. We ain't going to win the pennant again unless we get Lottie back, Diamond. We've got to have her. You're elected. Elected? I'm not even sure I accept the nomination. See? Let's go, Marge. You don't want the job, Diamond? Well, I've never looked for a missing second baseman before. I wouldn't know where to begin. A fine detective. Here, you, you begin by looking at her snapshot. Oh, no, no, girls. Really, I'm terribly busy right now. I've got to go to a funeral and help the police department Look with it. Look at her picture. But I tell you, I... 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 Ay, ay, ay. Don't tell me this is... Lottie Wirechick. You mean a girl who looks like this wastes her nights playing second base? Yeah. Wastes, he says. Diamond, stop drooling. You take the job? Well, I, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted, yes. I'm, I'm very tempted. <clears throat> now, let's, uh, let's get some answers first. I asked Billy. She's a roommate. All right. Now, think back, Billy, to a day or so before she disappeared. Uh, she seemed worried about anything, nervous, upset? No. Why, she even hit two home runs the very last night she played. She did, huh? Well, I wonder if... Oh, no, no, that isn't possible. The Dodgers do a lot of things, but they wouldn't kidnap people. You say she's been with the team two years? Yeah. Diamond, what sort of questions are these? Please, Lefty. It's my turn at bat. Now, Billy, what did she do before she became a second baseman? Who knows? You'll find her for us? For you? <laughs> oh, no. For me. They gave me a pass for the game that night with the Amagans at Amazons, informed me how to get out to West Frampton the quickest way as the E-train flies, then exploded themselves out, leaving me with a snapshot of a second baseman who looked like Jane Russell, only more so. I wasn't able to dream too long because soon the door opened and I looked up to find the most beautiful gabardine suit I'd ever seen walking toward my desk on the frame of the ugliest hoodlum I'd ever seen. Hey, you diamond? To some people. To others, I'm Mr. Diamond. Uh, Diamond. Mr. Diamond. The late Mr. Diamond. Yeah, that's the one I like the best. All right, parrot puss. Who's been eating your crackers? All right, comic. I'm just a boy with a message. Well, spill it. You had visitors, huh? Yeah? Yeah. A couple of overgrown tomatoes. A couple of tomatoes that look more like they belong to the Russian infantry than to the human race. Well, you're not very much to look at yourself, ugly. Get on with the message. Messages lay off. Don't go looking for no missing girl. You don't wake up with no bullet holes where your eyes ought to be. Huh? That's the message. The whole message. No signature? You don't need no signature, friend. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Uh, uh, just a minute, Repulsive. Yeah? I want to tell you about the last side of the mouth punk who brought me a message like this without a signature. Go on. Frighten me. Go on. He just stand back that diamond. Don't come no closer. I'll let you. Don't reach into that pocket, punk. Oh, my arm. Now, let me get it for you. Now, a luger. And almost as ugly as you are. We won't be needing it for this game. My arm. My arm. Oh, there's your arm. Now, put it up with the other one, and I'll knock your head off. A few seconds later, when I picked myself up off the floor, I looked around for my spar mate, but he'd taken his arms and gone home leaving me with an eye which for weeks to come would have me lying to people about walking into a door. Yeah, a door wearing gabardine. Ha! How'd you get that shiner, Diamond? I walked into a door, Walt. A door with a fist at the end of it. Where is this cemetery? South Carolina? We'll be there soon. Bigfoot Grafton won't mind waiting a little longer. Assuming, Sergeant Otis, that it is Bigfoot Grafton they're planting. Oh, no, you're not going to start that again. I told you on the phone. We're satisfied with the identification. What identification? Laundry marks and Grafton shirt. Cleaning marks and Grafton suit. Go on. What do you mean, go on? Look, Walt, suppose you're wanted for murder. 
two murder raps, and you don't have a chance of beating. And suppose that next to the mailman with the income tax refunds, you're the most looked-for guy in the country. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're going to say, Diamond. You think maybe Grafton finds a sucker with his same general build, shoots him in the spine, changes clothes with him, and then dumps him in the big bathtub. That's right, Walt. Well, us silly, confused, homicide cops figured that way, too. Until we checked up on what gave Grafton his nickname. His nickname? Bigfoot. Yeah. Yeah. Fourteen and a half. We found his shoemaker. He verified the size. So? So it's possible that Grafton can find a guy that fits his general physique. It's even possible that the guy he finds not only is built the same way body-wise, but wears exactly size 14 and a half brogans, too. Yeah, it's possible. But highly improbable. Yeah, maybe you're right at that. Well, on behalf of myself and all the other simple-minded fellas known as cops, thank you, Diamond, for saying what you just did. Thank you. There's the cemetery. It was just a simple little funeral. Except that the coffin cost maybe $10,000 more than mine will ever cost. And excluding the fact that there were enough flowers to make a couple of dozen floats for the turnip of roses parade. Yes, it was just a simple little funeral with maybe a thousand simple little mourners. Good conservative people, like safe blowers, burglars, con men, petty thieves, and some not so petty. Big wheels, little wheels, chiselers, grifters, grafters, jiff artists. Well, Diamond, you see anyone who used to run with Grafton's mob? No, not yet. Hey, now look. Now, what's he doing here? Oh. The parrot nose in the stylish gabardine suit. I've been admiring that suit. Gabardine, huh? Too bad a poor little gabardine had to go give up its life just so a mug like that could have a suit. Where are you going, Diamond? Who is that guy? He's a messenger boy. I'll be right back. I edged my way through the crowd toward him, hoping that in view of the solemnity of the occasion, none of the pickpockets among the mourners would make use of the opportunity to swipe my suspenders. Five yards away, he turned. He saw me and started to run. I put my head down like a sprinter and turned to follow. There's nothing like a merry chase in a merry place like a cemetery. And just when I thought I had him... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Diamond! Diamond, what are you doing running into tombstones? Oh, well, I suddenly remembered it's been years since I had a collision with a tombstone. Oh, what were you chasing that guy with a fancy suit for? I wanted to find out who his tailor is. Look, uh, Otis got a good look at that twerp I was chasing. Tell him to go through Rogue's Gallery and try to identify him for me, huh? Yeah, but where are you going? Me? No, I think I'll go to a ball game. It was a good game as games go, fast and exciting, and my girls did themselves proud. Eight three. Even though the girl who was playing second in place of the missing Lottie made three errors. After the game, I was in the corridor outside the dressing room talking to Billy, the first baseman. The one who didn't think I should have been hired to bird dog the missing girl. Look, Diamond, this is all for nothing. Lottie ain't missing. We never called on you. There's no case. Now, that's the same tune with a slightly different lyric and ugly in a gabardine suit sang to me. It's a good thing I'm stubborn. It's a bad thing, Diamond, for you. It's gonna maybe cost you your life. No. No! Don't! It happened that fast. By the time I turned around to see who did the shooting, he had disappeared in the crowd. <laughs> Dirty heel. Simon, what happened? I heard shooting. Stand back, everybody. Send for a doctor. Oh, my God. He grabbed me. I was on his team. Who, Billy? Who? I told him, Marge. Called on you to find Lottie. Who, dear? They'll kill Lottie. They'll kill Lottie. Billy. Uh, uh, Billy. Diamond. Is she? Is she? If anyone asks you who's on first... The answer is no one. Diamond, this department isn't in operation so that you can find girls. I don't care how she looks in her baseball uniform. Oh, but this is business, Walt. I tell you, she's been kidnapped. Another girl on the team was just murdered. Another murder? Where? West Frampton. West who? Frampton, out on Long Island. City limits? No. Huh. That's the quickest case I ever marked close. What do you want to waste my time with imported homicides for? Don't I have enough to do right here? Oh, but Walt... Don't I... bot me. 
They've been knocking each other off like flies this week. We're so jammed up, I got three stiffs that don't even have a place to lie down. Four, if you include Otis. Oh, just for that wise guy, I ain't talking. Oh, if I could only be sure of that. I mean, I ain't talking about the guy you played tag with in the cemetery. I found him in the picture book, all right, Diamond. It took me two hours. And just for making cracks at me, I ain't telling you his name. Whose name? Joe Gabardine's, that's whose. And I ain't telling you what else I found out about him in the picture book either. Why not? Because you think you're smarter than the whole police department put together. That's why not. Oh. And so if I go spill to you that this Joe Gabardine used to work as a gunsel for the late Bigfoot Grafton, you're going to right away say Bigfoot Grafton ain't dead after all. And that I'm a dope. Well, you hear that? The guy that threatened me if I went looking for Lottie Wirecheck, this Joe Gabardine, is one of Grafton's boys. Say, who told you? Was one of Grafton's boys. Grafton's dead. No, but maybe not. Maybe all these shenanigans are part of Grafton's plot to put some sucker in his coffin and stay undercover. Sure, sure. Maybe Lottie Wirecheck knew in some way or other that the guy they fished out of the river and buried today wasn't Grafton. Look, Walt, you got a... Uh, 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 Diamond, tell me. Uh, that name you said, the, the one that sounds like something spelled backwards... Wire a check? That's funny. What's fun? That's the same name as this name's in the file missing person sent over. Only this one's name is Lottie Wire a check. So is this one, you dope. You mean there's two dames with a name like that? Yeah, just like there are two heads on a sergeant named Otis Loveloon. Now listen here. Who reported her missing? Just for being a fresh guy, I ain't going to tell you. You ain't going to tell him what? That it says here on the file card that this doctor reported her missing. Who said anything about a doctor? Huh? You sick, Otis? You need a doctor? I ain't sick. Besides, he ain't that kind of doctor. He's a dentist. Who's a dentist? This Dr. Alman. Dr. Percy Alman. 223 Park Avenue. So? What do you mean, so? What about him? What do you mean? What about him? Well, you brought him into the conversation. Dr. Percy Alman. You said 223 Park Avenue. What made you mention him if you don't have anything to say about him? He's the guy who reported this Lottie Watchamacheck missing, you dope. Gee, Diamond, are you dumb? Dr. Percy Alvin's home for decrepit teeth at 223 Park Avenue was a fancy schmancy establishment where bad little molars and the cuspids went in for punishment. I could tell even before I met Alman that he was the kind of real artist who assured the customers there'd be no pain. No pain at all, and there usually wasn't. Until the customers got their bill. The office was a ground floor professional suite that opened directly on the street, and when I pushed open the door and went in, this kind of nice middle-aged guy greeted me with, Yes, I'm uh, looking for Dr. Alman. I'm Dr. Alman. But it's after my office hours, young man, unless it's an emergency. Well, it's, uh, it's about Lottie. Lottie Wirecheck. Lottie? You're from the police. You found her. Well, not yet, no. And I'm not from the police. Not... Who are you? My name is Diamond. I'm a private investigator. Oh. <laughs> you gave me quite a turn for a moment. Well, I'm sorry. Doctor, I'd like you to tell me a few things. What sort of things? Lottie Wirecheck. What's she to you? Well, presently, just a friend. Uh, formerly the best dental assistant I ever had. An extremely nice girl. Yeah, yes, I, uh, I saw her snapshot. A dental assistant, huh? Yeah, lovely, lovely girl. Um, I hated to lose her. But this baseball thing had been burning in her for a long time. Look, Diamond, just how much do you know about all this? Well, I know that Lottie's missing. Maybe in trouble. Well, uh, I do need help. And, and perhaps I'd better tell you everything. I'm game. But I think I should warn you, the information I'm going to give you is dangerous. It may mean your life. Well, I'm uh, still game. Maybe not as much as a few seconds ago, but... Very well. A year or so ago, I had a patient, a man who called himself Dunn, George Dunn. And then you found out that Dunn wasn't Dunn at all, that he had very big feet, and he was a racketeer named Grafton. Yes, you were very clever, Diamond. It was a gentle chart he wanted. He threatened me. I felt that if I ever gave it to him, he'd feel the necessity for for killing me. So I gave the chart to Lottie to keep it. It happened so fast, I barely had time to leap behind the chair. One second, the doctor and I were talking. The next, everything was bedlam and confusion and blood and death and anger. My anger. 
The doctor had caught one smack between the eyes. And I got mad, shooting mad. I charged out of that office, maybe ten seconds behind the killer, just in time to see him get into a car and melt away into the traffic. He headed east, then south, and east again. Then stopped at a crummy-looking building and went in. And that's when smart, shrewd, clever private detective Diamond climbed the drain pipe, tore his pants, looked inside a second-floor window, saw a girl tied to a chair, and, like Lockenbar, broke in to rescue the fair second baseman in distress. Lottie? Look out! Oh, oh this was getting monotonous. The billy caught me on the back of the neck, and while it didn't knock me out, it didn't make me feel like dancing either. The first thing I was aware of when I oriented myself to my new condition was the biggest pair of feet I'd ever seen. And the next thing I saw was the gabardine suit containing in its bright, clean folds the filthiest little murder artist I'd ever seen. So I made like a possum and pretended I was asleep. So, say, Grafton, I told you the shamus followed me. I won him. He's all yours, Joe, I promise, but later. Why later? Why wait? Because I gotta get that dental shot, that's why. Now that you've rubbed off the dentist and that goofy Billy the ball player, that shot's the only thing in the world that can prove Bigfoot Grafton's still alive. So why does that have to hold up Diamond's execution? Because maybe he knows where the Donald Charts hid. And given up on the dame here. She'd have told us long ago if she knew. If Diamond knows, he'll talk. Even if he don't know, he'll talk. And scream, too. Later, Joe. Now put that big sticker back in your pocket. I don't hear you, Grafton. This Diamond made me unhappy, and I don't like to wait. I said put that knife away, Joe. I still don't hear you. All right, Joe. I knew this was the only chance I'd get. They were too busy showing each other their fangs to give me their undivided attention. And so the possum stopped playing possum and made a stab at playing tiger. The act started with a well-aimed kick to what the fight reporters call the midsection. <laughs> and the gabardine suit folded limply and sagged to the floor like it didn't even have a man inside it. And that's when Grafton pulled the gun and that's when I made a grab for his knee. And you guessed it, there was a shot. And then there was a punch that made a mess out of a jawbone. And I'm happy to report that this time it wasn't mine. Oh, you're wonderful. What's your name? Well, honey, my name's Diamond. Diamond? Yes, dear. And believe me, a diamond is a girl's best friend. Hadn't anyone tell you I was a lonely one tell you I used to lie awake and wonder if there could be a someone in the wide world just made for me. Now I see I had to save my love for you. I never gave my love till you. And through my lonely heart, Demanding it, Cupid took a hand in it. I hadn't any warmth till you. Mm. You're so romantic, even with a black eye. Oh. Oh, Ricky, darling, it must have been dreadful. Oh, it, uh, it had its moments, Helen. Yes, I saw that photograph. A second baseman. Well, what's the matter with a second baseman? Well, Ricky, if you were any good, wouldn't you be a first baseman? Honey, uh, honey, I don't think you understand too much about baseball. Teach me. Oh, it takes years, baby, years. Well? Hmm? Well, uh, well baseball's a game that's, uh, that's uh, divided into innings. Nine innings. Any? What's an inning? Maybe I better teach you how to play post office. No, no. Ricky, please. Well, uh, 
Uh, let's see now. An inning is a, a sort of a division, a, a stanza, a, a, a frame. Yeah, that's right, a frame. A frame? An inning's a frame? Yeah, you're digging it. No, I'm not, Ricky, not really. Maybe we'd better forget it. All right, all right. An inning is a frame. That's right, dear. An inning is a frame. Hmm. Ricky, was she nice? Lottie? Mm-hmm. Well, I'll say this for her. She sure had a beautiful inning. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Wirt. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Oh, my goodness, yes. Come right in. My name is Wolf. Well, unofficially, so is mine. Sit down. Thank you. Oh, no, no, my pleasure. You must get a dividend from the nylon companies. Be terrible if there was a shortage. I'm well stocked. Yeah. What can I do for you? Start by calling me Edna. Well, then what? I'd like you to follow my husband. As a detective or a replacement? I think he's been seeing another woman. Why? Have you been running around the house in a diving suit and swim pants? I've always tried to keep myself attractive for my husband, Mr. Diamond. Well, then if your husband is seeing another woman, Mrs. Wolf, it's got to be an optometrist assistant. Well, thank you. I think you and I are going to get along just fine. Well, now that we're all agreed, tell me some more about your husband. What makes you think there's another woman? Usual thing. The way he's been acting. Business appointments every evening. Nothing else? He received a call late this afternoon. I listened in on the extension. It was a woman. She called the house? George was very unhappy about it. Warned her never to do it again. She gave a name? She said, this is Nancy. I must see you here tonight at 8 o'clock. Hmm. She didn't say where here was, did she? No, George seemed to understand probably her apartment. Probably. If he's seeing another woman, I want a divorce, Mr. Diamond. And you need grounds. Yes. A hundred a day in expenses, Mrs. Wolf. Edna. It's still a hundred a day in expenses. Here's 200. Mm. I hope that's enough of a retainer. Oh, that'll keep me interested for quite a while. Now, uh, tell me, what does your husband do? Oh, I, I, I mean his business. He's in steel. How much in? Oh, very much. He's vice president of his company. What does he look like? Here's a picture of him. Hmm. Well, I'll start right away and see what I can find out for you, Mrs. Edna. Yeah. Well, look, after I found out just how unfair your husband's treating you, I might lend you my shoulder to cry on. And I'd just about have to call you Edna then, wouldn't I? By 7 o'clock, I was standing across the street from her house waiting for her wandering husband. By 7.30, a man stepped out on the sidewalk and hailed a cab. I recognized him from the photograph as George Wolfe. And I started the tale following him east across town to an apartment house on 47th Street. By the time I got in the lobby, it was deserted. A list of names on the mailboxes showed the only girl named Nancy in the building was a Nancy Fowler. So I headed for her apartment. Her door was at the far end of the hall, and I was halfway to it when George Wolfe bounded out and ran right into me. 
Let me go. Take your hands off of me. You forgot to close the door. Get out of my way. What's the matter, friend? You look like you ran into a yard full of snakes. Will you get out of my way or must I use force? Well, use all you like, but I think you better go back and close the door. No, no. Yes, yes. Stop it. You can't do this to me. Well, I hope you aren't always this wrong. No, no. Please. Now get in the room. <laughs> oh, swell. No wonder you took off like that. I didn't kill her. I swear I didn't kill her. Nancy Fowler? The... Yes, I guess so. You guess so? Well, this is Miss Fowler's apartment, but... I've never seen Nancy Fowler before in my life. There was the 38 revolver lying next to the dead girl, so I took out my own gun and covered Wolf while I called Lieutenant Levinson of Homicide to get right over. Wolf yelled, screamed, and pleaded, and even offered me a nice fat bribe. But we waited for Fatty Levinson and his squad of New York's finest. He finally arrived, but New York's finest was poorly represented. Hello, Shamus. In trouble again, huh? Walt, did you have to bring Otis? I promised he hasn't used the siren in four days. Who's this guy? George Wolf Caught him running out of the door. Well, Mr. Wolf, what about it? I had nothing to do with it, but I'm not saying any more until I see my lawyer. He was crying all over the place before you got here, Walt. Claimed he got a call from a Nancy Fowler who asked him to come up here. That's the truth, Lieutenant. She said she had something important to tell me. Says he never even heard of Nancy Fowler before the call. That also is the truth. When I came to the apartment, I found her lying just as you see her. How'd you get in the door? She told me she'd leave it open for me to walk right in. Well, it came out the back, just below the shoulder blades, Lieutenant. You own the gun, Mr. Wolf? I refuse to answer any more questions. Okay, take him down to the car, Otis. Come on, you. Rick, just how did you happen to be in this building at this particular time? Well, that was hard for that guy's wife, the tail M. He was supposed to be playing illegal footsies with a female named Nancy. The dead girl? Well, the wife just knew the first name was Nancy. The girl who's supposed to live here is named Nancy. Nancy Fowler. I've never seen her before. Maybe the dead girl is one and the same. Well, I'll get an identification and have the gun checked by ballistics. In the meantime, I'm going to give this apartment a good going over. Mind if I help? Now, what kind of an answer do you expect to that? You will anyway. He was so right. We started going over the apartment room by room. Closets, drawers, everything. In ten minutes, the coroner and the boys from the lab arrived. And in the bedroom, Walt found something. Take a look at this. Ah, a jewelry box. Hey. Pretty expensive. Regal Jewelers. Very classy establishment. Has a card in the box. For my darling love, George. <laughs> and the guy said he never saw her before. If this is his handwriting, he's as good as strapped in the chair. Well, it looked as if my client, Mrs. Wolf, had a killer for a husband. But a couple of small items still worried me. So I left Walt and went downstairs to find the switchboard operator. Oh, are you with the police? I just left them, uh... Tell me, dear, do you keep a list of the calls that are made through the switchboard? Sure, it costs the tenants ten cents a call. May I see the list? Yeah, I guess so. Here, handsome. Gee, nobody's called me that since I had long blonde curls and a gold yo-yo. I looked over the list of telephone calls and found the ones made by Nancy Fowler during the past three or four days. The last call listed from her apartment had been made at 7.45 that evening to a familiar telephone number. The same number Mrs. Wolfe had given me when she left my office earlier. I left for the home of Mrs. Edna Wolfe. Yes? Oh, Mr. Diamond, you shouldn't come here. What if my husband... Your husband's is... spending the night out. What? In a cell, all alone. Oh, you'd better come in. Now, what in the world are you talking about? Well, it looks as if your husband killed a girl this evening. Oh, no. That's the way it looks. Oh, please, sit down, Mr. Diamond. Thanks. I uh, caught him running out of the girl's apartment, forced him back, and found the girl shot to death on the floor. Nancy Fowler? Yes, I think so. It was her apartment. The police are making identification now. Oh, it's just terrible. I wonder why he did it. Were you here in the house at 7.30 this evening? What? No, I was with a friend until about 8.30. Well, a call was made to your house from Nancy Fowler's apartment. She was charged for it, so the call was completed. But she probably talked to George. Your husband swears he didn't know the girl. Claims he got a phone call and she asked him to come right over. That she had something to tell him. He knew her all right. You remember, I told you I overheard them talking. Your uh, husband own a gun? Well, yes, I believe so. Mm. You know what caliber? No. I don't know anything about guns. Uh, a bracelet was found in the dead girl's apartment. The card with it was signed, Love, George. Mm, it looks pretty bad, doesn't it? If it's his handwriting, it does. Well, I guess he deserves it, but... I'll call our lawyer and see what can be done. I'll uh, keep in touch, Mrs. Wolf. I hope you will. Just because the case is finished, it 
Well, there are still a few things that bother me, so I'll just kind of keep looking around until I'm satisfied. You mean you think maybe my husband didn't kill the girl? There's an awful lot of evidence that he did, but uh, there's still a motive to be found. You've got the grounds you wanted, so from here on in, anything I do for you or your husband will be on my own time. Anything you do for my husband, I'll be glad to pay for. Oh, well, now, that's, uh, that's real nice. Hmm. Well, I'll take a run down to the precinct and let you know what the lieutenant's found out. Good night, Mrs. Wolf. Still can't get used to Edna. It'll take a while. Thought you'd be in bed by now, Rick. My landlord short sheeted me. What did you find out, Walt? The dead girl was Nancy Fowler. Mm, figured. And George Wolf did do the killing. His gun? Yeah, we checked the registration. His gun, his fingerprints on it, his handwriting on the note in the jewelry case. What does he say about the bracelet and the note? He bought it all right. We checked. Regal Jewelers. Says it was for his wife. You expect him to say something different? No. What's the motive? We'll find it. Probably another man. Here's the report on the dead girl, Lieutenant. Well, isn't it a little late for you, Otis? Why aren't you out flying around some belfry? He's picking on me again, Lieutenant. Maybe you'd like me to tell him about the time I caught you sleeping in the attic hanging by your toes. Oh, not you too, Lieutenant. Otis, I hear you've been picking up some extra money posing for Charles Adams. I don't have to take this. I know my rights, and I ain't no bad. Hmm. Here's something on the dead girl. She works at the Gilded Cage, a nightclub owned by Eddie Young. Eddie Young. Wow. There's a nice little fella. He'd set fire to his grandmother if he thought it was too cold in the room. We'll have a talk with him tomorrow. Well, I guess I, I better be going. Sure. See you later. Yeah, I could sure use some sleep. Yeah. And, uh, Rick, when you get over to Eddie Young's club, give him my best. Smarty. The gilded cage where Eddie Young ruled as proprietor and keeper for his flock of hard gorillas was only about six blocks away, so I decided to walk it. But like always, I start in one direction and end up getting sidetracked. Keep walking, Diamond. Don't turn around. Uh, you caught me when I'm right in the mood. You turn around, I shoot you. What's the matter? Don't you want me to spot your Tony? Over to that car. Okay. Quit poking. Your muzzle's cold. You drive. I'll get in the back. Oh, I, uh, I forgot my glasses. Can't see three feet without them. Get in. But I have a restricted driver's license. You want it right here? I can wait. Where to? Just start driving and don't turn around. We headed east across town with a gun pointed at my neck. I tried to get a look at the guy in the rear vision mirror, but he was sitting too far to one side. I didn't know where we were headed, but I had a pretty good hunch why we were going there. Turn right. And take it a little slower. I don't want to have to shoot a cop. Well, if we're headed for the river, I've seen it. From the bottom? Don't you think we'd better stop at a bathhouse or something? I know a spot where you can go in, clothes and all. Okay. But if there's anything I hate, it's getting my money wet. Turn right again. We were headed for a cross street. I could only turn right or left. A big warehouse was dead ahead. I eased down on the gas and we picked up speed as we neared the intersection. As I started to make the turn, I stamped down on the gas hard and at the same time threw myself toward the floorboard. His gun went off so close to my ear, I felt like my head had split wide open. Then we hit the building. <laughs> We had hit the building and pushed our way halfway through the brick wall. I was still on the floor and the motor had been shoved through the firewall and was jammed into the front seat where I had been sitting a minute before. My friend with a gun was stretched out over the top of the seat, his legs resting on the horn and his shoulders through the windshield. I sat up, rolled him off the horn. He was very dead. Before a crowd could collect, I climbed out and got to a phone, called Walt. Are you sure you're all right, Rick? Yeah, I can hear things better now. I just said the other guy is dead. Very, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I recognized him, too. Uh, Gus Winkler. Holy cow. You know who he's working for now? No. Eddie Young. Oh, that's it. Well, don't pick Young up, Walt. I, I know a few things I haven't told you about, and 
This almost puts a cinch on it. I, I, I want to talk to Young, and then I'll be down to see you. But if Young tried to have you killed... Oh, if he did, you can't prove it. Not yet, anyway. So sit tight, and when I get there, I'll show you how to catch a killer. <laughs> Uh, you uh, going someplace, chum? Yeah, right through that door, chum. Uh, that's Mr. Young's office. Maybe he don't want to see you. Uh, maybe he don't. He's going to be disappointed. Uh, uh, you you ain't going in there, chum. I see. Everybody gets disappointed sooner or later, chum. Yeah, what... Aren't you in the wrong room? That's what your boy outside thought. I changed his mind. Are you sure you ain't looking for Bellevue, Shamus? You're kind of a mess. One of your boys, Gus Winkler, tried to give me swimming lessons. He can claim his body at the morgue. I don't know what you're talking about. Somebody else who works for you got killed tonight, too. Yeah? Who? Nancy Fowler. What? Oh, come on, Eddie. I couldn't stand it if you started crying. Who killed her? The police are holding a man named George Wolfe. Know him? No, I don't know him, but Nancy's talked about him a couple of times. Hey, boss, that guy just... Forget it, Lou. Well, the boss, he... Forget it, will you? Go on, beat it. Okay. You know, Shamus Lou's a pretty big boy for you to go pushing around. He's liable to stay mad. So Nancy said she knew this George Wolf. That's right. Rich old guy, from the way she talked, she was taking him. Good. Where were you between seven and eight this evening? Right here in this office. I got witnesses. Oh, I'll bet you have. Okay, Eddie, I'll see you around. I left the office knowing how close I was to the whole answer and called Walt at the precinct. I told him to meet me up the block from the gilded cage, and ten minutes later, he pulled the squad car up the curb, and I climbed in. You find out anything? Yeah, but I have to know one thing first. What time was Nancy Fowler killed? Garner's report puts it at 7.30. Well, that ties it. Now, would you mind telling me what it's all about? I'll do better than that, Walt. I'll show you. But we've got to wait until Eddie Young leaves the cafe and goes home. It was around 12.30 and we settled back to wait. And with an impatient cop sitting next to me, it wasn't easy. Around one in the morning, a boy brought Eddie Young's convertible up in front. We watched Eddie climb in. Okay, Walt, tell him. We stayed close, following Eddie Young across town until he pulled up in front of his apartment and turned into the basement garage. Give me five minutes, Walt. Then come on up to Young's apartment. Why can't I go now? Because what I'm about to do isn't quite legal. And I couldn't stand seeing you blush. Hold it, Eddie. Hey, what's going on? One yell and I'll kill you. Uh, look, look. Devin, I'll put away that gun, will you? What do you want? Let's go up to your apartment. But please believe me, Eddie. I'll do something bad if you get out of line. We rode the elevator up to Eddie's eighth floor apartment. I shoved him in the door ahead of me and then made sure there was no one else around to get me into trouble. All right, all right. What do you want? Pick up that phone. Okay, we'll take it easy. Well, who do you want me to call? This number and hurry. I'll tell you what to say. Okay, well, I, I don't get this. Evergreen Street. What's the matter? Don't you like that number, Eddie? I don't even know the number. Come and dial it quick. Okay. And when you get an answer, just say, this is Eddie. Get right over here. I got to see you. And I'll look, Shaman. You look, Eddie. I'm going to hold this barrel right between your eyes so you can see it coming if you make a mistake. I won't make a mistake. Hello? This is Eddie. Yeah, get right over here. I got to see you. I, I can't talk. Goodbye. Okay, now, will you take that gun away? You look a little worried. What have I got to be worried about? I, I don't know who I was talking to. Oh. That should be the law, Eddie. What is this, Diamond? I'm sorry, I can't show you right now. Good night, Eddie. Wait a minute. Don't... Come on in, Walt. You said five minutes. Holy smoke, what happened to him? I just put him to sleep. He'd stay that way for a while. Now, Rick, you've got to tell me what's going on. I told you I'd show you. Now, go on in the kitchen and see if you can find some ketchup. Ketchup? Yeah, and then bring it out here and pour it all over Young. Have you lost your mind? Walt, I want him to make him look like he's bleeding. 
Now go find the ketchup or I'll just have to cut his throat. Walt found the ketchup and under protest poured it over the unconscious Eddie Young. Then I made sure the door was unlocked and we went out in the hall to wait. Please, Rick, what is this? It's the same way Nancy Fowler killing was framed, only she was really killed. Right, elevator. Okay, I'll play along with it. Let's go, Walt. All right, hold it, Miss Wolf. Oh, oh, Mr. Diamond, he's dead, he's dead. His head is all covered with blood. Why did you kill him? Kill him? I didn't kill him. I just got here. Who let you in? He told me the door would be open. I didn't know you knew Eddie Young. Well, I, well, yes, I know him. He's an old friend. Why? This is Lieutenant Levinson, Mrs. Wolf. He's the man who arrested your husband for the murder of Nancy Fowler. <sighs> Lieutenant, I swear I didn't kill Eddie. Looks bad, Mrs. Wolf. I didn't. Why would I want to kill Eddie? So why would your husband want to kill Nancy Fowler? I don't know. What has that got to do with this? You told me you didn't know Nancy Fowler. I didn't. You know Eddie. Nancy worked for Eddie. Well, I didn't know it. I didn't know Eddie that well. You said a girl called your husband and said her name was Nancy. Yes, that's right. You told me you didn't know her last name, and yet when I came over and told you your husband had just killed a girl, you asked me if it was Nancy Fowler. <laughs> That's a lie. You said that Nancy phoned your husband that afternoon. She did, she did. I swear she did. And yet Nancy Fowler's hotel switchboard has no record of a call being made to your phone any time in the afternoon. They made a mistake. But at 7.45, a call was made from Nancy's apartment to your phone number. Then she must have called my husband again. According to the coroner's report, Nancy Fowler was dead at 7.30. Oh, Mrs. Wolf, I can swear your husband didn't go into that building until 8 o'clock. I was following him. (sighs) Doesn't make any difference what Eddie did. Did Eddie kill the girl? Yes. I called my husband. I wanted to get a divorce. And his money at the same time. Eddie knew Nancy, so we decided she'd be the one. She let Eddie in. He made her call my husband. Then he shot her. The gun and the bracelet. You just took them out of your husband's dresser drawer and planted them in Nancy's apartment? Yes. I found the bracelet in the drawer with the gun. I guess my husband was going to surprise me. Uh, Eddie. Eddie is moving. Oh, Eddie. Eddie, darling. What happened? You're hurt. You're bleeding. Bleeding? They didn't until we can call it. Wait a minute, will you? What is this stuff in here? This isn't blood. I'm covered with ketchup. Ketchup? Ketchup? Why, you dirty no good. Uh, uh, uh. Eddie, we've been framed. Framed? They're all yours, Walt. Why... Good night, Mrs. Oh, I guess now is as good a time as any. Good night, Ed. Yes? Helen? Hmm? It's Rick, honey. Oh, isn't that sweet? I was just dreaming. Rick, it's four in the morning. Where are you? Oh, I'm helping Walt close up the gilded cage. Helping Walt close up the what? The gilded cage. Nightclub. I hear music. Hmm. But and his accordion will love you. Are you drinking? Honey, I'm with the police force. <laughs> what was that? Well, that was Walt. He said, Rick. You stood me up this evening. Well, I'm going to make up for it, honey. Listen. Okay, eh? One, two. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle.